report and the clinical review uh, on atrial myxoma. Um, and if you could just please say which part of Australia you are from. Hello, yes, um, um, I'm currently in Western Australia in Perth. So thank you so much for having me. Awesome. Thank you. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you. I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name's Liam Bybo. I'm a surgical registrar working here in Perth uh, in cardiothoracic surgery. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about atrial myxomas. Uh, we have a case report that um, was quite interesting about 12 months ago, uh, and also uh, a clinical review on the topic uh, to discuss the uh, pathophysiology uh, the uh, diagnostic uh, factors, uh, the management, uh, and um, I hope you find it interesting. Thank you. So to start off, um, we had a 41-year-old male who was referred to our service uh, after uh, a syncopal episode while he was at work. He did not suffer from any neurological symptoms. Uh, he had no chest pain, no shortness of breath. The patient did not report any paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or orthopnea. Uh, and he also had no constitutional symptoms. So he had this one fainting episode at work. Uh, thankfully, his, uh, his, the, the doctor at the, at the work site actually uh, referred him to a cardiologist for uh, investigation of the syncope and the first investigative test uh, was uh, a Holter monitor. He was fitting well. His only examination finding was of a systolic murmur. Uh, Transthoracic echocardiogram, however, identified a large round heterogenic mass uh, that was within the left atrium and was attached to the interatrial septum. Uh, and I said, this patient was referred to us uh, for resection of this left atrial tumor. The patient underwent surgical resection of this left atrial mass. Uh, we did it by a midline stenotomy with cardiopulmonary bypass support. Uh, we did bicaval cannulation and a standard aortic cannulation uh, and with the support of cardiopulmonary bypass and a clear surgical field, we were able to uh, do a biatrial approach uh, to this left atrial tumor. So that was done by a left atriotomy, which is via Sondergaard's groove. Uh, and um, this is the left atrial wall posterior to the interatrial groove. And we did it also via a right atriotomy. So we had both atria open. Uh, the tumor and its attachment were identified without any mobilization. We explored the right heart, the right atrial chamber. Uh, and then uh, as you can see in this picture, we re retracted to be able to expose the tumor in the left atrium. The tumor itself was attached to the fossa of alis, uh, which as I'll discuss, is where you find most uh, atrial myxomas and, and that's where typically their attachment is found. We resect the mass and block uh, and the interatrial septum was, prepared, was repaired with a pericardial patch. Uh, this patient is actually a, a scuba diver and so what we did do as well, we ensured that uh, there was no uh, residual, uh, residual atrial septal defect and so we performed a bubble study after cardiopulmonary bypass whilst the patient was still on table. This was to ensure that there was uh, no residual atrial septal defect uh, and no uh, right to left shunt. So the outcome, uh, the patient uh, was discharged day five after their operation uh, with a uh, uneventful inpatient stay. Uh, we prescribed the patient both aspirin and warfarin uh, for six weeks post-operatively. Um, this was to reduce the uh, thromboembolic risk of the uh, pericardial patch uh, repair. At 12 months post-operatively, uh, we repeated a echocardiogram 
and there was no evidence of any recurrence of the left atrial tumour. So a little bit about the epidemiology and the etiology of cardiac myxomas. So these myxomas do occur in all age groups, but more frequently we find uh, they are between the third and sixth decades is when um, patients are diagnosed with these tumors and they present. The incidence is low. It's between um, one and 30 in 100,000. It's the most common cardiac tumor uh, and constitutes 50% of all benign cardiac tumors in adults. It's less common, however, in children and accounting for only 15% of such tumors. The female to male ratio is three to one. So in all cardioembolic strokes, 0.5% are attributable to cardiac myxoma. They usually do occur sporadically, but there are multiple and familial uh, myxomas that can occur as part of familial syndromes in 7% of cases. And the most uh, common, the most talked about in textbooks is the Carney complex. Uh, and that's where patients have cardiac and mucocutaneous myxomas, pigmented lesions, schwannomas, and they have endocrine hyperactivity. So a little bit about the pathophysiology of these tumors. As I've already said, this patient had a left atrial myxoma uh, and these myxomas do usually develop in the atria. The most common is the left atrium with 75% of cases and 15 to 20% occur in the right atrium. Uh, less commonly, they uh, occur in the right and left ventricles, about three and 4% uh, respectively. As I said earlier, most do arise from the interatrial septum and it's at the border of the fossa ovalis, uh, which was the case with our patient. But it can originate from uh, the posterior atrial wall, the anterior atrial wall, and in the appendage as well. They're rarely multilocular. 85% are formed by a pedunculation with a short, broad base. The sessile, sessile forms can also occur. Cardiac myxomas are neoplasms of endocardial origin. The tumor usually projects from the endocardium into the cardiac chamber. They're thought to arise from remnants of subendocardial cells or multipotent mesenchymal cells. So what you find on history and examination with these patients, most patients present with one or more of the triad of embolism, intracardiac obstruction, and constitutional symptoms. And because of these uh, symptoms, this patient, this uh, uh, cardiac myxomas have been described as the great masquerader. In terms of obstruction, and usually these tumors are in the left atrium, it causes mitral valve obstruction. And this uh, manifests with uh, syncopal symptoms, dyspnea, and pulmonary edema from, uh, from cardiac failure. Constitutional symptoms occur in 34% of patients. Uh, these include weight loss, fatigue, un unexplained fever, and anemia. And as you can imagine, uh, there a lot of patients do present with these kind of symptoms. And so um, for cardiac myxomas to uh, present in this way is, is a bit worrying. So you do have to have this differential um, uh, with patients that so you aren't sure what the diagnosis is. Uh, embolic manifestations occur in 30 to 40% of patients. And that's the one, other than the, um, the acute mitral valve obstruction, that's the one that we worry about the most because they can be absolutely devastating for patients. So embol embolic um, manifestations in terms of stroke uh, and focal neurology in patients. For patients that have right atrial cardiac myxomas, pulmonary embolus uh, can be uh, uh, a big problem. Uh, and end organ infarction. So uh, if you get embolization to bowel, uh, to the renal arteries, or critical limb ischemia can occur. Occasionally, 
patients have no symptoms at all. And this is particularly with small tumors. On examination, 50% of cases have a systolic murmur and 15% have a diastolic murmur. And the textbooks also call, uh, talk about a, a cardiac clop, and that's as the tumor is uh, flopping in and out uh, of the uh, left atrium and left ventricle. The ECG in this patient is usually sinus rhythm, uh, but one thing that uh, they do manifest, these patients can present uh, with arrhythmias. So the differential diagnosis for an intracardiac mass, uh, the first and most common would be thrombus, uh, particularly in the left atrium. So as, as we know that um, atrial fibrillation is probably uh, the, the greatest sort of cause of stroke uh, in uh, patients, and, and that's due to uh, thrombus forming in the left atrium and then embolizing. Lipomatous hypertrophy of the interatrial septum uh, is another cause of interatrial mass. Uh, there's other uh, tumors, so lipomas, angiosarcomas, fibromas, paragangliomas, lymphoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, and then metastatic disease. So metastatic tumors to the heart are 20 to 40 times more common than primary cardiac tumors. Uh, so that's very important that although there, you may identify a cardiac tumor, uh, the likelihood is that patient has metastatic disease. Uh, so what are the imaging modalities to be able to diagnose this uh, problem? So transthoracic echocardiogram is the uh, gold standard first uh, initial investigation to be able to diagnose cardiac tumors, uh, in particular atrial myxomas, an ECG and a chest x-ray. They form the basis of your initial investigation. This is followed by a CT scan or an MRI. Uh, and this is to uh, provide better delineation of the intracardiac mass to be able to determine the extent of the tumor and to clarify the extracardiac structures. And this allows for pre-operative planning uh, because as you imagine with these cardiac tumors being able to occur either as a solitary tumor uh, in one of the cardiac chambers or multiple tumors. Preoperative planning is very important to be able to determine where exactly you're going to uh, approach uh, the, the tumor in the heart uh, and uh, how uh, you're going to go about uh, causing the least harm to the patient, particularly if they do have multiple uh, tumors. So uh, by having access to the cardiac chambers uh, with uh, the least uh, invasive and the, the least surgical resection is very important. And so these uh, extra scans do certainly help. So now onto the histology and the macroscopic appearance. So as you can see here is the excised atrial myxoma and it's attached with its stalk um, um, to the fossa ovalis. The surface of the myxoma is smooth in the majority of cases, but can also be friable or villous. Typical stellate or spindle cells, uh, they're abundant in myxoid matrix. That's what you're seeing here in this um, histological slide. And as you can see, there's numerous hemosiderin laden macrophages which are present. Myxomas consist of a myxoid matrix composed of acid mucopolysaccharide rich stroma, polygonal cells with uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm are scattered throughout the matrix. The cells are arranged singly or in small clusters and may be multinuclear, but mitosis are not found. These cells form capillary-like channels that occasionally communicate with the surface of the myxoma. Large blood vessels, arteries and veins are abundant at the base of the myxoma and are derived from the subendocardium. Myxomas often contain cysts and areas of hemorrhage. Foci of extra medullary hematopoiesis are common and calcification with occasional foci of metaplastic bone 
has been observed in about 10% of cases, as well as glandular-like elements. The surface of the tumour is covered partly by polyglonal cells, usually in a single layer, and partly by endothelial cells. Uh, now, in the case of our tumour, uh, talking about the blood supply, uh, in patients that are over 40 years of age, a uh, coronary angiogram is also indicated preoperatively, and that um, determines whether or not the patients also uh, have other procedures done at the same time. Uh, these patients can have uh, acute valve dysfunction that require valve repair or valve replacement. Um, but in terms of um, the blood supply going to the base of these um, cardiac myxomas, well, in our patients, the coronary angiogram did actually identify an aberrant vessel which was directly supplying the cardiac myxoma. So further histology, as you can see here, um, myxoma has round oval polygonal or stellate cells. And again, they're in this loose myxoid matrix um, with the abundant mucopolysaccharides. So what's the follow-up for these patients? In fact, lifelong follow-up is needed as these tumors do recur. Five to 14% Report is a reported recurrence rate. The time to recurrence has been found to range from six months to 6.5 years. Transthoracic echocardiogram is the imaging modality recommended for surveillance following surgical resection for definitive management. There are some factors which are associated with recurrence, and these include incomplete surgical resection. And as you can imagine, uh, the surgical approach and access to these tumours is so very important to be able to uh, fully uh, determine where the tumour is in the atrium. And although these tumours are generally attached with a small stalk, that isn't always the case. Uh, and as well as that, when you do um, pull these tumours out, uh, they can be friable and um, you can cause tumour embolization from um, mechanical disruption of the tumour, which is another factor associated with recurrence. It's very, very rare, but uh, these tumours um, can recur due to transformation of a benign to a malignant lesion and the presence of multiple tumours um, is also another factor uh, which is uh, reflected in recurrent rate, recurrence rates. So the risk of recurrence uh, in cases of familial myxoma is 12% and for complex myxoma is 22%. And in the um, sporadic tumours, which is the most common, the recurrence rate is actually quite low. It's 1% to 3%. Um, but as you understand, the effects and the complications from these tumours can be devastating. And so uh, you don't want to miss uh, recurrence of these tumours. Uh, so generally, um, that's done by a transthoracic echocardiogram. Uh, the first one uh, is generally three to six months after the initial surgical resection. Uh, and then that can be spaced out uh, to 12 monthly uh, thereafter. It's difficult to determine uh, the growth rate of these tumours because generally when they are um, diagnosed and identified, uh, surgical resection is quite quick. And so you generally don't um, get full imaging on these tumours to be able to determine what the growth rate actually is. So in conclusion, although cardiac myxomas are histologically benign, uh, they in fact may be lethal. And that's because of their anatomical location uh, that I sp spoke of. So the acute obstruction of the mitral valve, uh, the embolization uh, to the brain causing um, stroke, uh, embolization to coronary arteries causing acute myocardial infarction. Um, they can mimic every cardiac disease. So 
as I said there, acute myocardial infarction, acute valvular dysfunction, uh, congestive cardiac failure, arrhythmias. Uh, this um, benign tumour can mimic every cardiac disease. But on top of that, uh, they also mimic infective immunologic and malignant processes. So the, um, the presentation of these patients can be very wide and varied. Um, the symptoms do depend on the size of the tumor, its mobility. As you saw in some of the, the images I showed, the mobility is important uh, because although it may be attached to the interatrial septum, a very mobile and large tumour can easily uh, move into the left ventricle and cause acute obstruction. Uh, and of course, uh, the location of the tumour is also. So if it, in these left-sided tumours uh, are where you are going to get um, uh, systemic embolization, um, strokes and organ uh, ischemia, and right-sided tumours, if there is no right to left um, shunt or um, no uh, communication or um, patent foramen ovale, that, then you will get um, pulmonary embolus um, as, the, as the main uh, complication. Now, although I do talk about size um, uh, determining symptoms, um, the size of the myxoma itself does not correlate well with embolic uh, potential. Uh, and although um, these lesions can be very large, they can also, um, these tumors can be quite small. And even though they're small, they do still uh, form thrombus on them in the cardiac chambers. Uh, and then that um, acts as a fo foci uh, to then um, cause um, strokes in these patients. So, when they are diagnosed, um, size is irrelevant. Um, they can um, be just as lethal as the very large tumors. And so um, that's why um, surgical resection is almost performed um, sort of immediately or um, the week of diagnosis at the very least. Uh, as I've stated earlier, echocardiography is the most important means of diagnosis. Um, it's the gold standard. It's um, transthoracic echocardiogram. It's relatively minimally invasive um, and um, more and more places around the world are, are able to have access to ultrasounds uh, to be able to uh, diagnose these tumours. As I said, surgical removal um, should be performed as soon as possible after the diagnosis. Uh, and long-term prognosis in these patients is excellence. Um, so if you're able to um, resect uh, these uh, tumours, um, the risk of cardiac surgery is uh, one of the main risks. And generally in, in a population um, who are relatively fit and well, um, these patients in the third to sixth decades when they do present um, don't necessarily have um, all the other comorbidities that come um, with our normal cardiac patients that have ischemic heart, heart disease, metabolic disease, um, that does increase the risk um, perioperatively. And so um, the risk of cardiac surgery is, is the main risk um, with, with the management. So um, we do know that um, cardiac surgery, um, we do expose patients to, I mean, even the very um, fit and well patients, there is still, you know, half to 1% risk of um, not making it through the operation. There's uh, always the risk of stroke. Uh, the risk, there's a risk of intraoperative uh, myocardial infarction. And the, the list goes on in terms of um, acute kidney injury, pneumonia, um, post-operative arrhythmias, bleeding, uh, infection. Uh, and so, um, that's um, part and parcel with cardiac surgery. But the long-term prognosis is excellent, um, but it is very important that uh, follow-up is established. And so um, with the cardiac unit here, we follow up our own patients um, uh, and um, that's uh, we, we get them in for their, um, their um, surveillance uh, ultrasound to uh, ensure that, um, that they don't recur. 
uh, and if they do recur, that we identify it early. Uh, um, however, of the many um, uh, myxomas that have been resected um, here with our team, um, we um, have only had um, a couple of recurrences and they actually have been um, in patients that do have the carny complex. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for listening. I, I hope you uh, found it interesting. And does anyone have any questions for me at all? Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Liam. Um, it's such a beautiful, comprehensive uh, talk, which I loved because it's, um, it just marries the clinical um, context with the pathological findings. And I thought that was quite um, uh, beautifully done. Um, so literature says that there has been some uh, viral histogenesis associated with the myxomas, in particular the herpes simplex. Um, have you guys come across any of that? I know some of um, the, the people, um, they refute that kind of a histogenesis, but there has been an association. Yeah, it, it is very interesting. Yeah, I, I did... Um... You know, preparing for this, I, I did actually have quite a read into it. It, it is quite interesting that um, there are um, some um, clinicians that do feel that it, that is part of the um, pathogenesis of these tumours uh, and others that disagree. Um, but I guess um, the HSV virus is uh, endemic in um, our populations. It, it's, it's not something that um, I think is going to... Um, well, I, I don't know if there's an answer to be able to reduce the risk for, for patients that have been exposed to, to um, HSV virus um, to reduce their risk of um, a cardiac myxoma. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the floor um, for Dr. Liam before he leaves the platform? Uh, please um, feel free to send your questions um, over the chat uh, group. Um, we are continuously checking those uh, for any questions and um, or rather email them um, if you come up, if you see something that is interesting that you would like to find out more about. But thank you so much, Dr. Liam. Um, next up, I'm going to be introducing our next speaker, Dr. Pallavi um, from India. And uh, welcome, Dr. Pallavi. She'll be giving us a talk on hepatic pathology. Um, solving clinical dilemma, and she'll be discussing two interesting cases with us. Thank you so much, Dr. Palavi, for um, agreeing to speak on the um, conference. Thank you, Dr. Zama. Uh, uh, I am really uh, delighted to be a part of this uh, conference. Can I share my screen? Is it visible? Yes, please. Um, yes, now we can see. And um, you need to do the slide show yeah. now. Thank you. That's it. OK. So can I start now? Yes, please do. Go ahead. OK, thanks. I am Dr. Pallavi from an, an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology, SCB Medical College, Katak, Orissa, that is in India, Eastern India. Uh, recently, uh, my institute celebrated its Platinum Jubilee. So I am bringing you a very interesting case uh, uh, with uh, dealing with hepatic pathology. First of all, I would also like to thank the Emirates Pathology and Digital Pathology Conference for taking, giving me this opportunity to be part of this global program. Well, my topic is hepatic pathology, solving clinical dilemma, an interesting case. A 24 year old male presented with fever right periorbital swelling, left parotid enlargement, and multiple form cutaneous nodules. Besides, the other parameters were unremarkable. So the differential diagnosis the clinician thought were of sarcoidosis, IgG for disease, lymphoma, COX-T. 
tuberculosis and Sjogren's syndrome. The, in, with the initial presentation, the investigations uh, revealed just a uh, mild elevation in AST and ALT, and the ANA and the rheumatic fa factor were negative. The patient was sent to us for FNAC of the skin nodule and from the parotid gland. The skin nodule revealed some epithelioid histiocytes, lymphocytes, few spindle cells. There was no necrosis. So we gave a diagnosis of granulomatous lesion. Uh, we also got a biopsy from the skin nodule, which was showed the lesion to be mostly in the dermis, showing perivascular mononuclear lymphohistiocytic infiltrates. The FNSC of the parotid revealed clusters of benign salivary ductal epithelial cells admixed with lymphocytes and histiocytes and with few polymers. So we gave an impression of nonspecific sialaginitis. Other investigations showed that the mantux was negative, chest X-ray and HRCT were normal, serum calcium again normal, but serum AC was elevated. The treating team's diagnosis still continued to be sarcoidosis, and so they started steroids. There was a dramatic response. The subcutaneous nodules, parotid swelling, and the periorbital swelling resolved within next one month. Then the fever subsided. Again, that the patient went back home, but came back after four months with some symptoms of these. And so the investigations were done. On the first visit, compared to the first visit, the investigations done after four months of return of the patient showed and raised in the CRP. The, there was a lowering of the TLC count from 8,000 to 4,500 to 4,000. The CRP was increased from four months onwards to 18 to 38 in the sixth, third visit of six months duration. Also, the AST and ALT went on increasing. The bone marrow aspiration was done. It was normal. The radiology then after the patient came for the second and the third visit after that is after four months and six months, gradually we saw there was uh, in ultrasound and CCT, we saw there was hepatosplenomegaly and grade two fatty changes. The further investigation, the patient again came back after eight months. The TLC was again lowered coming down to 3,000, the CRP was again raised, and the peripheral smear showed leukopenia, but no abnormal cells. And the AST and ALT were so much raised, and along with ALP and the GGT, alkaline phosphatase and GGT were also raised. However, the viral markers were negative, ACE was elevated. Then the, on eight months, the clinician observed the patient in uh, uh, weekly wise, we saw that the TLC was going on getting low. The CRP was increasing. Even the platelets were decreasing. AST and ALT were raised persistently and alkaline phosphatase was raised. Now the patient was febrile. The follow-up was done uh, after eight months, one week, second week, and third week after the admission of the patient. These were the laboratory parameters. Suspecting sarcoidosis of the liver, the clinician planned for a liver biopsy. And now there was an additional suspicion of HLH hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. So the case was 
again analyzed from, with respect to the different criteria along with a repeat bone marrow aspiration study. So the liver biopsy. Now comes the role of pathologists. What we see here is a linear bit of liver biopsy, which shows bubbly liver, what we call as when there is a lot of fat in the liver. The patient is just a 24 year old man and we don't expect so much of fat in the liver. The grading of fat is done in fatty liver disease. We grade it as five to 33% as grade one, 33 to 66% as grade two, and more than 66% as grade three. This linear bit of tissue shows more than 66% of steatosis and some focal lesions. These are the focal lesions, which are mostly portal and periportal areas. Now these focal lesions show collections of epithelioid histiocytes, some lymphocytes. And so what we call this, the collection of these call, we call it as a granuloma. Moreover, there were bile in the liver. This picture shows canalicular bile plugs. So there is additional cholestasis. So till now we have two findings. One is, is granuloma, another one is cholestasis. Again, this is the macrovesicular steatosis. What we find here is the nuclei push to the periphery showing a swollen hepatocyte this is a macrovesicular steatosis. This is a ballooned hepatocyte and there is lobular inflammation whereby we call it as steatohepatitis. Since the person is non-alcoholic, we give a diagnosis of NASH, that is non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So we have three findings in the liver. One is a granuloma. Second is we uh, found <clears throat> granuloma and then cholestasis. And finally, we find NASH. We did a Masson's trichrome stain for collagen, which shows this typical dense collagenous scar surrounding the granuloma. So liver shows non-caseating granuloma, cholestasis, and steatohepatitis. What are the causes of hepatic granuloma? Okay, this is a list of causes of hepatic granuloma, of which the important ones are tuberculosis, mycobacterial infection, sarcoidosis, cholestatic disorder like primary biliary cirrhosis, and drug-induced liver injury. These are the major causes besides other causes as well. So we went for a ZN stain for this AFP, I said fast basalite, which was negative. So the morphological patterns of liver granulomas can be epithelioid granulomas, which can be again necrotizing and non-necrotizing. We found in our case, it's a non-necrotizing granuloma. And could it be a sarcoid granuloma? Well, sarcoid granulomas, the characteristic features are, it's a, they are diffusely scattered throughout the liver, mostly in the portal, periportal areas. They are well-defined, compact, rounded aggregates, non-caseating, may have multinucleated giant cells, occasional plasma cells and eosinophils. There are lesions which can be said as early, younger, older lesions and older lesions show dense collagenization. So mostly a diagnosis of exclusion. Sarcoidosis is mostly a diagnosis of exclusion. Now coming next, drug-induced liver injury because the patient has been taking so many drugs and also in between the episodes, the patient happened to take some herbal medicines as well. So we have to look for drug-induced liver injury because this also causes granuloma. Now drug-induced liver injury can cause, what are the patterns of injury drugs can cause in the liver are granulomas, cholestasis, and steatosis besides other patterns. 
So the gran in our case, we find granulomas, we find bland cholestasis, and we find steatosis. And there is intake of steroids by the patient. So steroids can cause steatosis, steroids can cause steatohepatitis. Now coming to granulomas, um, a histopathological picture shows left side we see sarcoid granuloma and drug-induced liver injury causing granuloma and a lipogranuloma, which will be the major uh, differential diagnosis in this case. So uh, the features here are sarcoid granulomas are mostly portal and periportal, drug-induced are and lipogranulomas are lobular. There may be the eosinophils are a features of mainly of drug induced liver injury. Sarcoid granulomas are well defined macrogranulomas, and drug induced liver injury, they are ill defined microgranulomas, and in lipogranuloma, they are ill defined macrogranulomas. Now, another differential diagnosis is BBC. Uh, in, uh, uh, in PBC also we find granulomas. So what are the basic differences? Is the granuloma location is PBC is portal based and sarcoidosis can be portal and lobular. Important is bile duct destruction, which is seen in PBC and which is usually absent in sarcoidosis. Granuloma type is poorly formed in PBC. Sarcoidosis is well formed. There are confluent granulomas in sarcoidosis, which are antigeny cells common in sarcoidosis, and anti-mitochondrial antibodies are significantly positive in PVC and negative in sarcoidosis. And systemic diseases, multi-organ involvement is seen in sarcoidosis and absent in PVC. So now we have hepatic granuloma with NASH possibly versus and daily we are keeping it because there's history of drug intake. So the hepatic sarcoidosis typically have uh, non caseating granulomas, evidence of multi-organ involvement, negative staining and culture for AFB and exclusion of liver malignancy and drug induced granulomas. So in our cases, all are relevant and these Criteria are almost fulfilling and we can call it as hepatic sarcoidosis. On the bone marrow aspiration, repeat aspiration showed mildly hypocellular marrow, mildly depressed erythropoiesis and myelopoiesis, no atypical cells, but there were prominence of bland histiocytes, engulfing platelets, cellular debris, erythroblasts and RBCs. So we gave an impression of hemophagocytosis. So the pathological summary is skin nodules showing granuloma, parotid, non-specific cell adenitis, liver biopsies showing granuloma with NASH, bone marrow showing hemophagocytosis. Multiple organ pathology. So now the clinician went ahead with the um, HLH, um, hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis criteria. So they did further investigations and found that the ferritin was very high, 2000, fibrinogen was low and triglycerides were very much elevated. So the criteria for HLH fulfilling were, uh, there was splenomegaly fever, splenomegaly cytopenia, high ferritin, hemophagocytosis on tissue bone marrow aspiration. And so there was hyper, the triglycerides were raised and the fibrinogen level was low. So the criteria were all fulfilled. So the disease courses to start, to start with the patient was just having mild transaminitis, went on to have to respond to some dose of steroids and then again was coming back recurrently with uh, in, uh, in, uh, having more symptoms and again coming back. So the diagnosis of hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis was done. Precipitating factor was a background sarcoidosis. 
Steroids was given in a pulse dose therapy along with other drugs. So after three days of pulse steroid therapy, patient was afibrite, appetite improved. Even the bilirubin, the AST, ALT, and ALP levels were seen lowered significantly. And after three months of treatment, there was atrophy of bilateral chick pad fat. Then there was atrophy of the subcutaneous fat at the site of the abdominal nodules as well. So the take home message is that sarcoidosis can occur in the absence of pulmonary involvement. Liver biopsy not only plays a vital role in the diagnosis of hepatic sarcoidosis, but also gives information as regards to simultaneous presence of other pathological processes, so to say, which was proved in this case that there was also higher grade of NASH. Then hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis can be a complication of sarcoidosis and can be missed easily. So, thank you. Well, Dr. Zama. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, um, Dr. Palavi. Wow, it's such an extensive workup. Um, and um, are the eosinophils helpful at all um, in terms of pointing to a drug-induced liver injury? No. Eosinophils were not significantly raised. And even in the biopsy, there's just hardly one or two eosinophils. There wasn't much of eosinophils. Thank you. Um, anybody with a question for um, Dr. Pallavi um, on such a beautiful um, hepatic pathology? Um, let's keep um, this session interactive and let's engage. If you cannot um, unmute yourself to ask openly, please do feel free to send um, questions via the chat group. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pallavi. Um, Thank you. Next up, um, I'm going to be introducing um, Prof. Mohammed. Um, I know earlier on he was not available. I'm not quite sure if now um, he is available. Um, Prof. Mohammed, if apparently he's offline. Is there a way we can get him online, please? Okay, so we're gonna have uh, Prof. Mohammed um, just after the speaker that I'm going to be introducing just now. Sorry about that. Um, next up is um, Dr. Um, Gerardo from Italy. Um, I didn't want to say the first name, <laughs> but uh, bonjour, <laughs> welcome to the conference and um, I hope you have fun. The floor is yours. Please unmute, unmute, we can't hear a word. Yeah, there you go. Hi Mia, <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh... Can you watch my screen? Okay. Yes, everything is showing for now. I'm, we just need to see the slideshow. Um, oh, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I am happy to be here, greeting from southern Italy. And in this uh, presentation, I will talk about the SARS-CoV-2 and histopathological changes of placentas. Um, the role of electron microscopy in uh, this characterization uh, is my topic uh, in this uh, presentation. So, uh, at the end of December 2019, uh, China's doctor in Wuhan, in the province of Hubei, China, started to report uh, the first cases of an anomalous pulmonary infection, not directly attributable to no infection agent. So, by the start of January 2020, the World Health Organization had confirmed that the etiological agent in the cases of pneumonia was a new strain of coronavirus, denominated SARS-CoV-2. And within just a few months, 
the pandemic still unfolding today had developed. Despite the morphological and genomic resemblance to SARS-CoV-1 and to MERS-CoV, SARS-CoV-2 is much more contagious, although the mortality rate is actually lower. In Italy, for example, the first confirmed cases date back to the end of January 2020, and um, after the first infection that developed in Codogno, Lombardy, many other infection foci emerged, first mainly in northern Italy, in the Lombard provinces of Brescia, Bergamo and Milan, but then spreading all over the peninsula. As regard placental disease in various positive mad pregnant women, only case report or small limited case series were reported in the first months of the pandemic. However, as they passed, more and more cases of placental infection by SARS-CoV-2 were described, and there can be no doubt that with the progressive reduction in age of patient affected the question of placental involvement and of potential maternal transmission, maternal potential transmission, has become an important matter of debate. A study of the current literature seems to show that neonatal transmission is very rare and that there are no specific SARS-CoV-2 histopathological placental modification or changes observed in adverse perinatal outcomes, nor is there any evident greater risk of spontaneous abortion, preeclampsia, preterm delivery or stillbirth. However, few large case series have yet been reported owing to the obvious technical instrumental difficulties. Since, uh, since the first published paper in literature, there have also been bitter comparison and different view between the various researchers as regard the correct interpretation of viral particle also, and especially in electron microscopy. For example, Susanna Varga et al., in their paper supported the possibility that this viral particle isolated from the kidneys of a patient with severe COVID-19 uh, were SARS-CoV-2, while in the following month, Cinza Goldsmith and all denied this interpretation, considering the part is a particle as invagination raw endoplasmic reticulum. In this file, we too have tried to make a contribution and bring our experience from Southern Italy, University of Bari Aldo Moro. The, uh, there are other study, for example, a study of Hosier et al. that in September 2020 presented the case of a previously healthy. And 35 years old that um, uh, presented symptoms of the 20 weeks of gestation. The author in this paper described the presence of perivillus fibris deposition with the sign of chronic histiocytic intervellosities and supported their findings by immunohistochemistry with anti SARS CoV 2 spike protein antibody and electron microscopic findings. In this field, there are many other studies in a few months that uh, try to demonstrate the relationship between SARS CoV 2 infection of placenta in positive mother and electron microscopic findings. The, uh, these images uh, from the paper of Hosier, uh, Cinzia Goldsmith et al. are very beautiful and uh, demonstrate the show the presence of viral particle variants in microvillus of syncytiotrophoblastic of placental mother. But there is uh, there are very 
uh, many debates about the correct interpretation in uh, both in electron microscopy and in immunohistochemistry. The, our paper, the, the, our study, was made of 18 tree placentas from AG1 pregnant mothers, followed at the gynecological and obstetric operative unit from September 2020 to January 2021, identified through electron clinical records. All the human who presented during the labor and the delivery underwent testing with the gene expert experts SARS-CoV-2 real-time PCR checking. Positivity to the SARS-CoV-2 test was an independent criterion for the histopathological analysis of the placentas. Among the positive SARS-CoV-2 group, 12 cases were excluded because they were related to unavoidable abortion due to mater maternal pathologies, which occurred in the second trimester of the pregnancy, and to endothelial fetal death unrelated to SARS-CoV-2 positive. So, the final sample of our studies were included 71 placentas. Controls about the control, so the SARS-CoV-2 group was compared with a control group of 142 placentas selected from a historical archive. archive. And in this field, uh, we uh, evaluated the Amsterdam criteria for the histopathological diagnosis of placental. Um, so, early maternal malperfusion, late maternal malperfusion, fetal malperfusion, placental infection and or inflammation, the latest of a known origin and the light maturation of the VA. Indeed, uh, the, uh, there are two uh, other parameters that uh, uh, were also evaluated, uh, so in, in, uh, intravenous and choreogenic hemorrhage that uh, were out from the Amsterdam criteria in uh, control groups and in the SARS-CoV-2 mother positive group. So, in accordance with the matching, uh, there were no significant difference in maternal and gestational age between the two groups. Um, um, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, slide is uh, very clear. And uh, maternal disease were equally distributed in the two groups. PROMs were significantly less prevalent in the cases than the controls, as were UGR and oligodramnios. There were no differences for polydramnios. HAPGAR score and 1 minute and 5 minutes were not significant difference. Regard the histopathological future, the main placental weight in grams was not significantly different uh, between the SARS-CoV group and the control groups. No difference in the percentage of maternal malperfusion, vascular malperfusion, were observed in between the two groups. Whereas the difference with regard to fetal vascular malperfusion were significant, um, like it, it, it shows in this, in this slide. The same applied for decidual arteriopathy and perivillous fibrin deposition and fetal vessel thrombin. In contrast, a lower percentage of villus hypervascularization was observed in the SARS-CoV-2 positive group compared to controls. Indeed, no significant difference in the percentual of terminal villus hyperplasia and chorioamnionitis were observed between the two groups. So, this, uh, is, uh, there are the uh, picture, the uh, our picture of example of SARS-CoV-2 positive mother. In figure one, there is a, a picture, there is a parenchyma of COVID-19 positive mother placenta, where uh, there are terminal chorionic villi with poor vascular component, distal hypoplasia of the villi in uh, patient pathology, with increased syncytial nodes. 
Some villi show a deposition of fibrin, eosinophilic fibrin, in the intervillar space with the progressive reduction of the villi. This um, normally is a sign, direct sign, of immunological problem or immunological issue or immunological response of the mother to uh, placenta. In FIGAR2, there is a amniocorionic membranes, an example of amniocorionic membranes, characterized by the presence of maternal neutrophilic, neutrophilic granulocytes that infiltrated the subamniotic chorion and that is very characteristic in the uh, SARS CoV 2 positive mother groups. Um, so, in FIGAR3, there is the basal deciduitis with a lethal trophoblastic component, superficial implant, and with few inflammatory cells. This is a picture in hematoxylineosine, and there is a, a, a very uh, important element, feature uh, of the deciduitis in this group. In FIGAR5, there is a histological section of the main villus. The artery has a thickened muscular wall, marked intimal fibrous thickening, probable organization of arterial thrombus, clear reduction of the lumen of the wall of the vessels, and recent thrombosis of the residual lumen. These uh, the, 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 are these are the um, original FIGAR of immunohistochemistry reaction investigation with, uh, performed with anti SARS CoV 2 S1 glycoprotein monoclonal antibody. In figure 6, in FIGAR 6, uh, there is a section set up for immunohistochemistry investigation using this antibody. Note the widespread involvement of brown colored syncytiotrophoblast. This is very more specific for the S1 spike portion of glycoprotein of SARS CoV 2. In FIGAR 7, there is a detail of the previous images where there is the we note the positivity expressed by the trophoblast, a very intense positivity is observed, observed in situ trophoblast, but also in the in isocytes, because the, our study and other studies demonstrated that chronic isocytic intervillocytes is a uh, recurrent, more recurrent in placental of SARS CoV 2 positive mothers. So, in FIGAR 9, uh, sorry, there is a detail of a small vessel um, of a bilius characterized by the expression of a spike glycoprotein antigen in endothelial cells degenerate, degenerated during thrombosis. These images is very characteristic and clear for the um, su for, uh, to support the um, storm, the cytokine storms and the hyper thrombotic storm in in uh, during COVID nineteen in patient. So this is uh, the images of electron microscopy our images published in uh, where uh, we observed. Uh, uh, the Sicizio trophoblast cytoplasm, in addition a uh, microvillary projection, the cell has numerous secretory vacuolis, mitochondria, and electron dense lysosomes, in a strong magnification of a spherical particle, with spe there is specular electron dense projection next to a strongly electron dense lysosomal formation. So there, is, there are a variance and lysosome. This is a lysosome, this is a disease variance. In these images, after the publish, publication of our, um, of our paper, uh, there are many debates uh, about the correct interpretation of this particle. And uh, there is a, a very, very uh, scientific soundings about this problem in literature. Uh, always uh, our group uh, described another case uh, in uh, May 2020 um, about a code 
of the deposited women uh, also publicly women pregnant and 13 weeks uh, with the four days of amenorrhea with a bicorial biamniotic twin pregnancy. So the particularity of of the death and birth of the and viable fetus, so in the birth of the second fetus with a severe uh, problem, um, problem of uh, asphyxia and GCS peripartum, and if after a few minutes we, uh, we conduct morphological, immunophenotypic, and electron microscopy and real time PCR investigation in order to confirm the presence of SARS-CoV-2 in placenta of positive matter and uh, this is um, the, the picture of the first chorionic disc uh, where there is uh, very large areas of intervallus fibrinus deposition figure one with the presence of perivillar isocytis minor recent in are of the first placenta and amniochorionic membranes were completely normal. So, in the, um, in the immunohistochemistry, uh, the, the reaction uh, show, was st uh, show strongly um, positivity of syncytiotrophoblastic cells for SARS-CoV-2 S1 antibody and uh, also in cytis described in a previous hematoxylineosin picture. So, um, the electron microscopy showed sign of a circular formation with a 100 or 120 nanometers diameter with peripheral electron densities peak, which are likely viral particles in the cytoplasm of the perivillary isocytes. This future with the positivity of immunohistochemistry were much suggestive to real to true SARS-CoV-2 infection. The second uh, chorionic disc uh, in addiction uh, is uh, characterized by uh, the large area of intervillus fibrinus deposition and the presence of numerous perivillary isocytes. And, uh, um, also, in this case, immunostaining for anti SARS CoV 2 glycoprotein S1 was strongly positive in syncytiotrophoblastic in isocytes modern cells. So, currently, uh, we have a work in progress that is under review that compares the histopathological characteristic of placenta of SARS CoV 2 positive mother with the severity of symptoms essentially differentiating women into two groups, a group of patients with male symptom moderate and a group of patients with severe symptoms related to COVID-19, to recurring, recurring hospitalization for resuscitation. The paper is being written and the result look very promising. For conclusion, uh, our study uh, conducted on a large number of placentas show that in cases of SARS-CoV-2 positive pregnant, pregnant women without transmission of the disease to the fetus, the placentas are largely unaffected by the inflammatory process. However, there are some more frequent characteristics in the placentas of infected women, in particular maternal thrombosis and deciduous, increased intervillus fibrin, and in rare cases, fetal thrombosis. The immunohistochemical investigation demonstrated positivity for the anti SARS CoV 2 spike glycoprotein antibody, both among maternal cells, including inflammatory intervillary cells, and in the trophoblast, and rarely in the endothelium. The ultrastructural investigation electro with electron microscopy demonstrated both the suffering of fetal endothelia and the presence of a particle attributable to SARS-CoV-2 in the trophoblast in conjunction with its degeneration. As the pandemic continues, this study 
will become more urgent for clarifying the possible mechanism and immunopathological mechanism of the maternal fetal transmission of the viruses. So, the final conclusion and the take-home message is the relationship between SARS-CoV-2 placenta and the risk of vertical transmission is very intriguing, important and needs further study and confirmation. It is essential to distinguish between SARS-CoV-2 placental infection, vertical transmission and fetus positivity because there, there are two or three different stages of the pathology. Although it is does not diagnose on its own, electron microscopy is important in assisting and confirming the presence of variants along with confirmation by immunohistochemistry, molecular hybridization in situ, or real-time PCR. Thank you very much. A warm greetings from southern Italy, from Bari, and uh, good, uh, good, uh, buona, good, 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 uh, good, eh, buon proseguimento dei lavori, l'ho detto in italian. <ride> thank you, thank you so much, eh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Um, yes, yes, it's correct. <ride> Gerardo, it's yeah. correct. Uh, uh, yes, um, well done, well done on your paper. Uh, it's quite insightful, it's quite uh, informative. Thank you very much. Um, did you guys see, I don't remember if I heard you mention uh, the CHI, the chronic histocytic intervelocytis, in your findings yes. on morphology? Yes. You did? Yes, there, is, okay. there are many present in the, the new paper that uh, is now under review. Um, there is a, a statistically significant difference between the mother with severe COVID-19 disease uh, respect to mother with mild or asymptomatic um, uh, disease. And this is very important because seems, it seems in last months that uh, intervillocytis modern uh, isocytis uh, is a very uh, sensible and specific future to um, uh, understand the gravity of a positive mother and uh, this future is very interesting and intriguing. So and do, do you guys uh, have um, do you guys have omicron variants? Uh, yes in the, this in the, in the in this paper that uh, I presented is uh, not Omicron, but uh, is uh, um, they have, have uh, uh, the first or the second variant of SARS-CoV-2 because uh, um, the period, uh, the time period is uh, between uh, um, September 2020 and January 2021. In uh, the last paper that now is uh, uh, still under review, uh, the mother with uh, um, some mother with uh, lieve, uh, mild asymptomatic COVID-19 uh, disease uh, is uh, with the Omicron variant of SARS-CoV-2, and there is uh, there are very um, question uh, important question that uh, we uh, also we do not understand uh, about the intervillocytis, isocytis, okay. and the Omicron variant of SARS-CoV-2. So uh, the, there are need to uh, study this aspect of uh, pregnant women and uh, how Omicron variant affect the placental parenchyma of these uh, pregnant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Are there any questions from the floor for um, our Italian Doctor, sorry for my elementary English. <laughs> I tried to do my best. <laughs> I actually like it. Don't worry. Thank any you questions? Very much. Doesn't look like we have any. Uh, thank you so much. We are going to thank be uh, doing um, or introducing the next speaker, um, Dr. Maheswari from uh, India and she will be discussing um, the subject entitled significance of uh, um, IgG4 staining in plasma cells in um, IBD. The floor is yours, thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Zama.
you can um, st start sharing your talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me a minute. Sorry, I'm not able to share. Just, uh, just give me a minute. No worries. Are you winning talk? Uh, yeah, yeah. Two minutes. Uh, hi, Dr. Maheshwari. If you want us to share your presentation, we will do that. Yeah, I'm almost done. I've got it. Are you able to see now? Yes, you can do the slideshow now. You, uh, yeah, sorry for the inconvenience cost. No so, problem. Yeah, my presentation is about the uh, significance of uh, tissue IgG2 positive plasma cells in uh, inflammatory bubble disease. And I'm Dr. Maheshwari, as already uh, as already as introduced, uh, being Dr. Zimma. And uh, my co-authors are Dr. Vamshi Desar and uh, Dr. Shivanit. So introduction, inflammatory bowel disease are a group of chronic intestinal disorders that are characterized into two main subtypes, that is the Crohn's disease and uh, ulcerative colitis. So uh, ulcerative colitis is limited to the colon with uh, superficial mucosal inflammation that extends uh, proximally in a contiguous manner, leading to ulceration, severe bleeding, toxic colon, and fulminant colitis. Whereas the Crohn's disease can affect any part of the digestive tract in a non contiguous manner, and it is characterized by transmural inflammation, which can lead to complications such as fibrotic strictures, fistulas, and abscesses. So, although the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease is not clear, it is acknowledged to the dysfunction of intestinal immune homeostasis characterized by continuous and or remittent inflammation. And there is evidence that T lymphocytes are involved in IBD, but the role of uh, B cells remain unclear. So excessive of uh, B cell derived plasmacytic infiltration in the intestinal laminal propria, which is characteristic of IBD, inflammatory bowel disease. IgG4, which accounts for a small proportion of all IgG uh, isotypes, it is used to be commonly ignored by all. But however, its role in various autoimmune disorders has now become a research focus and along with the identification and prevalence of IgG4-related disease. So IgG4-related uh, disease uh, is a multi-organ inflammatory condition which is characterized by an excessive infiltration of IgG4-positive plasma cells. And it can affect any tissues like the pancreas, biliary tract, liver, and retroperitoneum of the digestive tract. So in this study, we concluded that the colonic biopsies with increased number of IgG for positive plasma cells might be restricted to the ulcerative colitis, which comes, uh, comes in hand with the uh, autoimmune disorder and IgG for related disease. And it can be used as a biomarker in differentiating the ulcerative colitis from the Crohn's disease. So... Methodology, 140 patients were selected with clinical symptoms of inflammatory bubble disease. Uh, the patient came with bloody diarrhea and weight loss, and it was confirmed by endoscopy. They were included. 
my study st uh, period started from Jan 2018 to June 2020. So this is like a retrospective study. And the male to female ratio was 1 is to 0 0.62. And uh, colonic biopsies were performed for histopathology and uh, one or four cases were diagnosed to have Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, immunohistochemical stain for IgG4 positive plasma cells was done for the remaining 36 cases with indeterminate histopathology. So the biopsy specimens were formalin fixed, paraffin embedded for histopathological as well as the immunostaining for IgG4 infiltration. And C-reactive protein and ESR levels were also done prior and post treatment. So these are my results, uh, results which show the demographic data, total number of uh, 134 cases and out of which the Crohn's disease cases, a uh, minimum age affected was 14 and a maximum was 58 years and ulcerative colitis, 15 years was the minimum age and 57 years was the maximum. So the males were most commonly affected with the male-female ratio of one, uh, one is to point, uh, six two. Ulcerative colitis, uh, again, the males were most commonly affected with the ratio of one is to point five. And Crohn's disease, uh, males were most commonly affected with the ratio of one is to point six seven. So histopathological criteria for diagnosis of IBD. So ulcerative colitis most commonly presents uh, like uh, under four uh, parameters, it can be, uh, the criteria can be like uh, categorized. So mucosal architecture, the mucosal architecture will show distortion of the uh, mucosa as well as cryptitis can be seen and cryptapsis with mucus depletion, which is most common finding in ulcerative colitis patient and predominantly plasma cell infiltration which is limited to the mucosa are seen and lamina propria if uh, the patient is untreated or they are unresponsive to therapy some uh, eosinophils can also be noted along with the uh, neutrophils and leukocytes so and along with the plasma cells and whereas the Crohn's disease, they will uh, show irregular villous architecture. So some medias will be uh, normal and some medias you can see like uh, ulcerated or distorted architecture of the mucosa. And focal cryptotropy and mucus depletion, which is not as pronounced as the, uh, as the ulcerative colitis, but you can't see the cryptapsis, which is like uh, uh, finding in ulcerative colitis in Crohn's disease. So chronic inflammatory cells can be seen like uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltration and sometimes granuloma can also be present in Crohn's disease. So uh, there's, there's another category like indeterminate colitis or IgG4 colitis. Uh, this uh, diagnosis was given uh, because the uh, patient can't be diagnosed as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease based on uh, insufficient clinical radiological as well as uh, endoscopical data. And uh, whereas the histopathology also, uh, also showed like uh, both features of uh, ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease. So these are the two images which shows the features of ulcerative colitis. Uh, here you can see the clip distortion uh, in the mucosal epithelium and uh, crypt apsis also can be seen. You can, in the second image, you can see a clear picture where there is uh, infiltration of the neutrophils within the lumen of the, uh, within the lumen. And uh, there are mucus depletion also, as you can see in the 40X uh, um, uh, image. And uh, the mucus are, uh, mucus are depleted and you can well appreciate in the second picture. So this is a uh, another view of like under 40x objective. Uh, you can see the crypt abscess. Uh, a nice human you can see in, in within that some neutrophils are there. So this uh, this is a classic feature of uh, ulcerative colitis. And uh, this is a uh, cryptitis where you can see the uh, infiltrate. I mean the uh, inflammatory cells uh, which are uh, present outside the uh, lumen tubular structures. So this is a uh, image showing uh, you know, Crohn's disease case where there is a uh, crypt distortion can be seen, but it's like uh, some areas is normal and some areas you can see. And uh, the mucus is also not depleted as you see in the ulcerative colitis case. And this is a 10x objective view uh, E and uh, F is the 40x objective. So indeterminate colitis, as you can see, the mucus is not depleted and there is abundant of uh, 
lymphoplasmacytic infiltration so you can't put them under category of uh, crohn's disease and there was not uh, much of uh, uh, attenuation of the epithelium and uh, uh, so this uh, this category we have call it as indeterminate colitis or otherwise it could be an igg4 related colitis so this is other uh, two images which are showing indeterminate colitis where you can see the grip distortion uh, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, but the mucus is not depleted as seen in the ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. And uh, this also you can see cryptitis showing here in, uh, in the both images. And this is a cut section. So IHC staining for IgG4 was done for ulcerative colitis, which showed like more than 10 cells per high high power field and this is a criteria we use to call it as a positive for uh, IHC staining and it is uh, more than 10 cells uh, were seen in ulcerative colitis cases. So uh, this is a scanner uh, view of uh, how a slide will look like under uh, scanner uh, like forex and uh, this is an image which uh, shows more than 10 cells of uh, high GT for positive cells uh, in uh, high power field, so which is in favor of ulcerative colitis. So IHC staining of uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, these, uh, these also images shows more than uh, 10 cells per high power field. And uh, this is another image which shows the abscess also in between. And you can see the positive cells around them. So Crohn's disease cases, they showed like uh, less than 10 cells per high power field. And as you can see in the first and swell in the second and which there is no much of uh, positive plasma cells in them. So we have, uh, <clears throat> so if it is less than 10 cells per high field, uh, power field, we have termed it as negative and it's more in favor of Crohn's disease. So uh, in indeterminate colitis, uh, there were like uh, 17 cases out of that, which were like nine cases who, uh, endoscopy features uh, favored towards uh, uh, ulcerative colitis, but uh, IHC staining showed uh, very less than 10 power uh, uh, IgG4 positive plasma cells in them. So we termed it, them as IgG4 colitis. As you can see, you can see here also, there are less than 10 per cells. And this is a case of, uh, uh, it was diagnosed as ulcerative colitis on endoscopy. So tissue IgG4 immunohistochemistry biopsies from the patients with ulcerative colitis, they showed significantly higher numbers of uh, tissue uh, IgG4 plasma cells than those with Crohn's disease. So 13 cases, 36 cases of ulcerative colitis, they showed positive like uh, more than 10 cells per high power field and uh, uh, six cases of, uh, that is 16% of Crohn's disease with uh, less than 10 cells per high power field. And 17 cases, like 47% uh, of uh, indeterminate colitis or IgG4 colitis. So this is how, this is a chart showing the distribution of cases wherein uh, we took like 134 cases out of that 98 were uh, confirmed with uh, endoscopy as well as histopathological features favoring ulcerative colitis and uh, Crohn's disease. Whereas the 36 cases, they were like histopathology when endoscopy showed ulcerative colitis, histopathology was negative for them. I mean, uh, the features were not favoring ulcerative colitis. So we had to do like for uh, 36 cases, we have done the IgG4 positive uh, plasma cell tissue infiltration to confirm the diagnosis. Out of which 13 cases, uh, they went in favor of ulcerative colitis and six cases went in favor of trans disease and 17 cases out of which nine which showed uh, features of uh, ulcerative colitis on endoscopy, they showed less than 10 uh, cells per high power field in uh, IHC and, uh, 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 and eight cases who showed features of uh, Crohn's disease in, on endoscopy, they showed for more than 10 cells per high uh, tissue IgG4 positive cells in uh, I, uh, IHC marker. So discussion, this study investigated a neglected area of uh, inflammatory bowel disease, which is the use of tissue-based biomarkers to distinguish colitis from the Crohn's disease. We demonstrated here that cases of ulcerative colitis showed significantly higher numbers of IgG4 
due to Prendergast disease. Many studies they confirm that these leukocytes are critical events in the presences of inflammatory bowel disease. Every subset of T cells, including the T helper one, two, and seventeen, and regulatory T cells, has been reported to play a role in the pathogenesis of inflammatory bowel disease. So, in contrast, the role of the B cell lineage in the pathogenesis of uh, inflammatory uh, bowel disease has been overlooked. Uh, the role of B cells in the pathogenesis of IBD they remain unclear. This is a reason it has been overlooked. So many lymphocytes, which are differentiates, uh, differentiates into plasma cells with the production of various antibodies. And these antibodies were strongly involved in humoral immunity and may contribute to allergy and other autoimmune disorders. So excess of uh, plasmacytic infiltration in the intestinal lamnopropria is a marked pathology characteristic of inflammatory bowel disease, suggesting a potential pathogenic involvement of the B cell lineage in inflammatory bowel disease. So IgG4 plus uh, B cells, they play either a pathogenic or a protective role. So high levels of mucosal IgG4 are detected in a small sub uh, subset of patients with ulcerative colitis. Uh, tissue infiltration of IgG4 plasma cells could decrease along with the decline in disease activity after the treatment. So the above observ observations imply that IgG4 plasma B, uh, B cells may be involved in the immune response in the subset of IBD that is ulcerative colitis. So histopathological examination revealed cryptitis, crypt uh, distortion, crypt abscess with mucus depletion more pronounced in ulcerative colitis than Crohn's disease. And patients uh, diagnosed with non-specific colitis exhibited intact epithelial lining with uh, inflammatory cell infiltration, predominantly lymphocytes in the lamina propria. And patients with ulcerative colitis had a higher mucus and IgG4 counts than the Crohn's disease. These differences resulted from an excessive infiltration of plasma cells, particularly IgG4 expressing plasma cells in the inflamed intestinal mucosa in a subset of patients with ulcerative colitis. A major drawback of this study is I feel that uh, serum IgG4 uh, levels has to be done in the remaining 17 patients which we termed as indeterminate or uh, IgG4 colitis. Uh, but the previous studies of uh, literature showed that uh, serum IgG4 and uh, serum IgG4 uh, uh, ratio was helpful in differentiating uh, ulcerative colitis from Crohn's. So, conclusion, uh, IgG4 plasma cells uh, differentiated ulcerative colitis from the Crohn's disease and patients with positive endoscopy, negative on histopathology and negative for ulcerative colitis and positive for Crohn's disease, that is uh, the patient who had uh, ulcerative colitis features of an endoscopy and negative for a high HC marker and uh, positive for Crohn's disease, they were categorized as uh, IgG4-related colitis or IgG4-systemic-related disease. These patients with ulcerative colitis had severe and extensive lesions and uh, high levels of mucosal IgG4. They decreased after treatment with uh, glucocorticoids or other uh, immunosuppressants. Um, so basically, the uh, as I told, the drawback is uh, we could have done the serum IgG4 uh, level to further confirm whether it is really, uh, IgG4 related disease or uh, it's just in determinate virus. So these are the references to my, uh, and, uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, thank you my uh, author for lending me a hand. Thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Misari. Um, very eye-opening and um, I don't know if there are any questions. Um, <clears throat> for uh, Dr. Mahesari, anybody would like to ask her a question? Dr. Maheshwari, hello. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, just I wanted to know, where, when did you choose to do the biopsies? Because ulcerative colitis, as you know, there are phases. Chronic phase, mild, moderate, phase. severe, like active and quasi yeah. various. So, yeah. when did you choose to do the biopsies? Uh, it was actually done during the active stages and uh, it was confirmed by endoscopy. So, before and uh, the patient was also, uh, after the biopsy has confirmed, the patient has underwent treatment. And after that, also, they have uh, followed up the patient with the patient is responding to treatment. So, uh, 
we have Any done like that mementos biopsies follow up biopsies uh follow up biopsies we have done for uh, quite a few number of patients which uh, they showed like uh, uh, responding to treatment and uh, um they were responding to treatment and the c reactive protein and e Mm, hello. Uh, we seem to be losing. Yeah. She's back now. Your screen froze, Dr. Maheshwari. Yeah, uh, there's a question. Is there any other examination that is important uh, besides the IgG4 examination to determine, uh, differentiate between IBD types? Uh, Ma'am, like histopathology, as I already told you, the the uh, crypt abscess was more common in ulcerative colitis and uh, cryptitis and everything was more pronounced in ulcerative colitis so that part is okay fine that part is fine yeah just wanted to know which phase uh, you selected the, your cases is yeah. it in that phase or yeah it was in the active phase ma'am so because igg4 plasma cells when do we expect more yeah so it will be in the active stage yes ma'am okay very nice presentation good Thank good, good. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Um, so um, we are going to be swiftly going to our next speaker and where I come from. They say you must not stand between a man and his lunch. So I won't be long. Uh, we're going to be swiftly moving to our um, last speaker just before lunch and she'll be doing a workshop and um, uh, welcome, uh, Lydia. Um, the platform is yours. Uh, hello. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. We can hear you. You can hear. I'm trying yes. to share my screen. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, perfect. Now we need to see you. Slide. Do you see it? Yes. Okay. Next is slideshow. Yes. Um, so I'd like to present myself and to say good afternoon to everybody. My name is Lydia Gaminuk. I'm heading the clinical trial group at Attila uh, Medical Laboratory. I'm not a laboratory physician, I'm a clinical physician. And I would like to present um, this presentation uh, about challenges, approaches, and laboratory solutions in Ukraine. Um, um, can I just interrupt? Um, apologies yes. for that. Um, if you could just show us the slideshow, um, give us a, a bigger screen. I'm trying. <sighs> It's still not, Do you see? Uh, maybe just continue um, if you're unable to, to do so. I see a big screen. I... I'm sure that's I... fine. You can just continue. That's okay. okay. So our lab was found in 1998. And we were among the first who started to develop high quality diagnostics in, uh, in Ukraine. And we've been doing it for already 24 years. We've been chosen by physicians as, uh, thanks to the high quality, uh, accurate and precise results. And we appreciate very much this recognition. We always rely on basic component, on four basic components, international quality standards, medical expertise and the best technologies. And by the way, our expertise, good production base and established relationships with world leading manufacturers allowed us to be among the first in Ukraine who launched uh, COVID testing in 2020. And um, actually DILA currently is one of the most certified labs in Ukraine. I can, cannot, uh, cannot move to another slide, no? 
up here. Um, some facts about Dila. Uh, there are more than 2,000 employees currently. We hire about 100 new employees monthly. About 300, uh, about 30 percent of employees are with us for the last 10 years. We have about, or even more than 10,000 tests uh, in our portfolio. Um, we have an operating contact center that takes calls from patients and consults physicians uh, regarding uh, test selection, results interpretation, and. Um, this contact center is out, not outsourced, but uh, our staff employees work there and we monitor the quality of their work and trying to improve their work. Um, we have um, more than 1.5 million of clients who come to DILA annually on a regular basis. Uh, this is just to show that quality is our everything and because we realize that a life-changing decision uh, about patient's diagnosis and further treatment can be made based on our lab results. So our quality management system is certified by uh, own auditing companies and we were the first in Ukraine to be certified and accredited uh, according to ISO 9001, ISO 15189. <clears throat> and um, this is just to say that we are constantly on the lookout following the innovations and market demands and choosing the best uh, solutions for high quality diagnostics. Just some slides to share uh, the impact of the COVID-19, what has changed uh, for our company. You can see the figures yourself. I will just only tell you that the biggest danger in moments of turbulence is not the turbulence itself, but um, to act according to yesterday's logic, as Peter Drucker said in 1980. So this situation with COVID uh, strengthened and accelerated us. And despite panic, lockdown, despite complete stop of public transportation, we managed to provide business contingency, launch PCR testing. Uh, we were the first lab in Ukraine that launched PCR tests. Um, and we increased our capacities. And uh, uh, by the fact that COVID has shifted focus in 2020, we also managed to keep an eye and pay attention to other directions of laboratory diagnostics. <clears throat> um, also, we took part in national seroprevalence study for SARS-CoV-2 IgG neutralizing antibodies. Um, this study took place when vaccination rate in Ukraine was very low. And uh, its data were used by the Minister of Health uh, for planning of quarantine measures. So 6,400 uh, serum samples were tested. And another study for um, prevalence of hepatitis markers is currently also planned uh, with the use of the same serum aliquots. And this study is um, carried out in cooperation also with the Public Health Center of the Ministry of Health of Ukraine and with the um, World Health Organization. <clears throat> but as I said, um, um, COVID made us think bigger, think faster and think deeper. And it, as you can see on this slide, um, this, uh, these are the data from National Cancer Register. 140,000 of new cases of cancer were registered, and only 76% um, of uh, newly diagnosed patients verified with histology. So, um, this is due to insufficient attention to pathomorphology, lack of specialized laboratories. Uh, and analyze data for 2020, 2021, but we can assume that due to COVID, this percentage will be even lower uh, because a lot of patients 
a lot of clinics were closed, patients didn't have access to them. There were problems with public transmission. So we think we um, percent of cancer diagnosed at uh, late. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so COVID has changed the model, but hasn't stopped technological development. And for the last two years, we- um, to Lydia, sorry. Uh, your slides are not moving. So could you please uh, put it in a presentation mode and then you can just move it easily. Do you see what, I don't know what you see now. Can you see, uh, yes, this one. You were mm -hmm. on second slide. I think the first one. The first one, you, you need the first one or which one? No, you need to keep it on this presentation mode. That icon is there. Can you see minus button? Down bottom of your screen? Uh, yes. Okay, just... Uh, Okay, present it like that only. But uh, keep moving your slides. What do, which slide do you see now? Now it's number seven. Oh, okay, so number eight? Yes. Right? Yes. Number nine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, and did you see it well? No. Sorry. They say you must press F5. Can you see F5? F5? Yes, I, but it's F5 that's for uh, the loudness for the speaker. Can you see? Reader? Sorry for that. to do no yes the uh, left one I go on first one do you see slide number nine uh, do you want us to share your presentation I think so. Hello. Oh, I think because um, maybe if we could just share the presentation, that would be great. Can you hear me now? Do you see it? Yes, they're, they're showing you the because. Hello. <clears throat> Hi, Lydia, you can continue. It's fine now. Hello. Lydia, can you please continue with your talk? She's on the phone. No, Gaminyuk. I should not see tea or что случилось. I don't know if it, if anybody is able to phone her. 
and tell her we are waiting for her. Yes, we are connecting with her, but uh, she's not responding. Lydia, can you hear us? Irene, are you there? No, I don't hear and I don't see it. I'm telling them that they don't hear and they don't see it. Hello. Yes, please continue. We can hear you. Um, should we not maybe go, are we on slide seven? Where was she? Was she on slide seven before? Do you hear me now? Yes, Lydia. Can you yes. please come back? Uh, Lydia, are you there? I didn't do Irene, could you please ask her? Yes, I'm trying. Sorry, one minute. Maybe they don't write that I was going to press F5. They said to press F5. Okay, I'm trying to press F5. Мне еще раз нажать F5. Do you hear me now? Yes. Ah, finally. Ah, uh, and you see the screen. Now we can't hear you. You can't hear me. Oh, yes. It's great. Now here. Do you hear me? And you see the screen. Yeah. Yes, Lydia, we are we are patiently waiting for you to continue. Well, okay, but I don't know what happened. I already asked the AT uh, to help me. Um, uh, cannot move to another to another slide. Okay, which number do you want us to move to? Um, I think. Um, Slide nine. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, despite this COVID situation, uh, we started uh, to think on uh, development of other laboratory directions, uh, other directions for laboratory diagnosis, uh, which is passing morphology, uh, cytogenetics. Uh, molecular genetic analysis on cohematology laboratory. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Uh, yes, uh, all uh, our seven laboratories, laboratory units um, are united into a common hub. It, um, um, those units are located at two lab facilities, uh, which are not so far from one another. It accelerates availability of test results, allows fast and seamless cooperation um, of lab physicians from different laboratory, laboratory units uh, to get an expert consultation for a patient. And hence, customer can get accurate, precise results within fast turnaround time. And it makes, um, it helps to make a correct decision for, on the tactics of patient management. Next slide, please. Um, so main principles and approaches to diagnostics for in basal morphology in, 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 uh, is to the use of modern actual assays, high quality personnel, state of the art technologies, quality standards and international protocols and cross-functional approach for diagnosis, for example, um, to diagnose melanoma, we need to combine histology, immune histochemistry, and molecular diagnostics by performing breath mutation. Uh, to diagnose um, uh, hematological malignancies, we sometimes need to combine histology, immune histochemistry, flow cytometry, cytogenetics, uh, molecular diagnostics, and so on. And I would like to um, 
stress out that close cooperation of lab pathologists and clinical physicians who refer to patients is crucially important because pathologists can advise on um, extra tests to clarify the diagnosis. Um, sometimes uh, pathologists can advise on correct sampling techniques to obtain a proper specimen for testing. And sometimes um, we can find characteristic feature for local population, which can be of scientific interest and can be taken into consideration by healthcare authorities um, for patient management considerations. Next slide, please. Here, I'd like to share some results of their study we conducted as an example to illustrate the letters statement. We conducted this study uh, on the prevalence of uh, highly oncogenic um, human papillomavirus genotypes among women in Ukraine and uh, its correlation with um, pop test results. Next slide, please. And as a result of our analysis, we found that uh, mono infection occurs in 63% of uh, patients with mild intraepithelial neoplasia. But the severity of intraepithelial neoplasia increases, the proportion of mono infections increases, reaching 74 and 90% for CIN1 and CIN2 respectively. Also an interesting uh, pattern was found um, the more severe the degree of epithelial damage, the smaller is the spectrum of um, highly oncogenic genotypes. For example, in intraepithelial lesions of mild degree CN1, we recorded more than 11 varieties of genotypes. In moderate uh, to up to 10 genotypes, and in severe intraepithelial lesions, CN3, only three genotypes were found. But regardless of the severity of intraepithelial neoplasia, the largest proportion accrued on genotypes. It composed 24% in CN1, um, sent in. Uh, the second and third places were shared by uh, genotypes 31 and 33, and in severe intraepithelial lesion, uh, three genotypes were crystallized. Those are 16, 31, and 18. And in 90% of cases, those three genotypes were presented as mono infection, and only in 10% in various combinations. So we can assume that in Ukraine, genotypes 16, 31, 33, 18 were, um, are associated with intraepithelial neoplasia of variant severity, which means that women infected with these genotypes are, are at risk for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and require close monitoring. Uh, next slide. <coughs> Next slide, please. Uh, so the main directions of our pathology is uh, obstetrics, gynecology, mammalogy, urology, gastroenterology, endocrinology, oncohematology, and dermatology. And um, the use of uh, histology, um, histochemistry, cytology, molecular diagnostics, and genetics should be all um, used in combination when necessary. Uh, next slide. So yeah, we use CAP protocols, ICD classifications, normal classification, and it's easy to um, establish a di diagnose and manage treatment based on our reports because methods we use allow to realize approaches recommended by NCCN and S more. Uh, next slide. Um, this slide illustrates how we use the IHC panel uh, for 
breast cancer subtyping. It's one of our routine and most frequently demanded assays. Um, based on uh, the subtype, oncologists prescribe treatment um, for a patient. As you know, for luminal uh, types, it's anti-hormonal uh, treatment and or uh, chemotherapy or aromatase inhibitors uh, for HER2 type. Herceptin is successfully um, prescribed. For triple negative, it's usually aggressive therapy by itself or with pembrolizumab. Next slide, please. Um, in oncohematology, uh, we use uh, immune phenotyping, cytomorphology, fish, molecular diagnostics, histology, of course. Next slide. Uh, cytogenetics, it's, of course, karyotyping and fish studies for prenatal, postnatal uh, diagnosis, and also for oncohematology. Uh, there are about 30 uh, laboratory tests on equipment of Carl Zeiss and Metasystems and um, uh, Cytovision that we use. Uh, next slide. Uh, of course, for in molecular genetic analysis laboratory, they identify infectious agents, but from, for in oncology, they identify mutations that differentiate cancer types, the GFR, uh, RAF, LK1, HER2 nail. Next slide. Um, this, just to show that um, next step uh, in oncohematology is always taken after the thorough analysis of the previous one. And this clinical case illustrates the synergy of um, different lab technologies for establishing correct diagnosis and prescribing treatment. Um, so here's the case, uh, bone marrow aspirate came from a patient with suspect acute leukemia, cytomorphology and immune phenotyping were performed first. And according to the results, uh, acute myeloma leukemia M3 type was highly likely. So we ordered a PML RAR mutation by PCR. Uh, this mutation was detected. AML M3 type was confirmed. And proper treatment um, with azacitidine was prescribed to a patient. Actually, we are currently expecting and the uh, sample from this patient to check uh, response to therapy, uh, to check MRD level, and to assess um, the progression of the disease. So this is it. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. Um, sorry about the... Welcome. I'm sorry for technical troubles. No worries. Um, we didn't anticipate it. Um, sorry about that. Take a break for lunch. Okay. Um, I don't see anything from the chat group and no one is unmuting to ask anything. So at this stage, we are going to take a um, short break and we'll be back at um, 13.40 p.m. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.
Uh, welcome back. Uh, uh, namaskar, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening as the time zones vary. We are from throughout the globe. So now we start. I am Dr. Pallavi Bhuyan, uh, Assistant Professor, Department of Pathology, um, SCB Medical College in uh, Eastern India. I welcome you all, and I also express my gratitude to and privilege to be to chair the sessions. This uh, the next following sessions. So we start with our next speaker, uh, Mr. Lan Hyun. Are you there? Yes, Mr. Lan. Yeah, unmute yourself. Sorry, I can't hear. I can't hear you. Can you hear now? Can you hear, Mr. Liu Lan? Can you hear now, Mr. Lan? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. Thank you. Uh, should I share my screen? Yeah. Please share your screen. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. Uh, so hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. And thank you for having me uh, here today to present my uh, case study. Um, my name is Lon Huynh, and I am a medical student at uh, Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine in South Georgia um, from the United States. And today I'll be presenting a case of urothelial carcinoma arising within a bladder diverticulum secondary to benign prostatic hyperplasia. And uh, at the end of the, uh, the case presenting, I will be discussing um, uh, what we know about the condition and the treatments uh, based on the literature. So let me zoom in here. Okay. So about the case, this case is about a 75 year old male cadaver that is uh, that has a history of bladder cancer. So uh, the body was donated to our medical school for um, medical uh, education purposes. And upon dissection, we uh, we saw a like a a nodule, a big nodule on top of the um, the bladder, and we thought it was a tumor. However, when we uh, dissected uh, the bladder. And we look from the inside, there's like um, like a neck and hole right here. Uh, and it's a, apparently it is the bladder diverticulum. And we found two of them actually, one here and the other one's here. Uh, so the big one is measured about three centimeter cube. And this uh, small one is about two centimeter cube. Um, uh, we also found the prostate down here is to be enlarged as well. Uh, it's about eight and five centimeter cube. And looking at the post, um, the bladder wall, especially the um, posterior bladder wall, uh, it is um, thickened and trapeculated. However, we don't find any masses in the bladder. Um, this can be. Um, we don't know the history of the patient. Uh, if he has a resection or chemotherapy. So we don't know any of that. We just know uh, the patient has um, bladder cancer. So interestingly, um, the literature has, um, has studied that show that um, if a patient has bladder cancer and also had um, bladder diverticulum, there's a high chance that the tumor will be inside the bladder diverticulum. So 
uh, we are curious and take a look inside. Uh, so this is um, this that particular that we um, dissected. And from the look inside, um, there, there's no masses of tumor. Um, and you can also see the, uh, the, the wall of the diverticulum here. So we, um, so we took a biopsy of the bladder wall and also the wall of the diverticulum and also um, biopsy of the lung, kidney, liver, prostate, inguinal, lymph nodes um, to check for any uh, metathesis. And there was no metathesis found. Um, the only tumor or cells that we found is within the diverticulum wall and not, um, not in the main, main bladder. So this picture is the uh, histology of the uh, bladder diverticulum wall. Uh, we show high grade papillary urothelial carcinoma within the bladder diverticulum. Uh, there is lamina propria invasion. Uh, it has show um, disorganized tumor cells with marked pleomorphism, hyperchromatic nuclei, and increased nuclear uh, cytoplasm ratio. And then we also um, took a picture of the uh, bladder wall and compare it with the diverticulum wall. Um, and you can see that in the, uh, the main bladder wall, there is a thick layer of muscularis propria. This is in, in between the lamina propria and the perivesical fat. However, in the uh, bladder diverticulum, there is no muscular, um, uh, muscularis propria um, layer here. It's just the lamina propria and the perivesical fat. And this is important uh, point that we'll talk about later um, that contribute to the uh, pathology of the um, cancer. Down here, this picture is of the prostate. Um, it show hyperplastic nodules composed of markedly prolifer proliferated glandular epithelia encircled by fibromuscular tissues. So this is indicative of benign prostatic hyperplasia. So now let's talk about we know about um, bladder diverticulum and what's the clinical manifestation, what's the treatment. Um, so bladder diverticulum is um, an outpouching of the uh, uh, bladder wall. Um, there are two types of bladder diverticulum. One is uh, congenital and the other one is acquired. Most of the bladder diverticulum is acquired and that happens uh, later in life. Uh, and it's more common in male over age of 50. So, um, which make up 95% of the patients with um, bladder diverticulum. Uh, there, uh, this strongest portion is commonly due to um, underlying causes uh, such as bladder outlet obstruction or benign plastic um, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So the, they reported that uh, bladder diverticulum in patients with um, uh, BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia is about 48%, which is a lot. Um, the neoplasm arising in bladder diverticulum is, is quite rare. It's about um, an option of uh, diverticular. And it, uh, it's made up 1% of all urinary bladder cancer. In the most common, most common type of malignancy within the bladder diverticulum is urothelial carcinoma, which is 78%, um, and uh, followed by squamous cell carcinoma, which is 17%. Um, the deficiency uh, 
or lack of muscularity propria we talk about. Um, it's, it make it impossible to empty the urine completely from the diverticulum because of the weak muscle wall. Uh, so the chronic irritation of urine spaces inside the diverticulum, it results in chronic infection and inflammation, uh, causing uh, UTI, um, stones, and worse, um, malignancy. So in patients with bladder diverticulum, the muco they have mucosal inflammation, uh, ulceration, dysplasia, or metaplasia. So interestingly, uh, research has shown that, uh, like I said, the neoplasm developed in a patient with bladder diverticulum. Mostly, the um, mostly the new neoplasm would be inside uh, within the diverticulum. And the clinical, um, for the clinical, uh, most bladder diverticulum is asymptomatic, so um, it often go under that undiagnosed. However, for patients who have tumor in the diverticulum, uh, about 87.5% of them uh, develop painless hemorrhagia, which is the most common symptom. And the prognosis is, um, is thought to be worse than uh, a regular bladder tumor. However, um, there's a limited research evidence out there to study the prognosis. And one research study far is show that they have the similar prognosis with the um, normal uh, bladder tumor, um, which is about, uh, which has a, a five year survival rate of about 71%. Uh, it is thought that prognosis and long term outcome is uh, best predicted by a histological grade, uh, where the higher grades and larger tumor size are associated with higher progression. A higher rate of recurrence and leading to worse prognosis. So the diagnostic modalities is similar to that of a, a regular bladder cancer. So there is urine cytology, cystoscopy, um, imaging such as CT scan, MRI um, is used to diagnose um, bladder diverticular cancer. Uh, cystoscopy um, is the best, uh, is the gold standard because you can take the biopsy of the tumor and you can uh, stage the cancer. Uh, however, in diverticulum, uh, in some diverticulum have uh, very narrow openings, so you can't really have the, uh, the stethoscope uh, get inside there to take the biopsy. And also because the, um, the lack of the muscle in the in the wall, it can increase the risk of perforation when you take the biopsy. So, uh, cystoscopy is becoming less reliable in detecting intradiverticular and also can um, increase the risk of perforation. So, other other uh, modalities uh, such as CT scan and transvesical and transrectal ultrasound have been proven to be uh, beneficial in confirming diagnosis in these, um, in these cases where the diverticula has narrow openings. So treatment, um, the modality for surgical treatment, it varies from conservative transurethral dissection to a more aggressive, such as radical cystectomy. So for a long time, this, um, the gold standard of treatment for urothelial carcinoma within the bladder diverticulum is radical cystectomy, uh, which show a better rate of survival. However, it increased morbidity and lower quality of life. Um, therefore, um, some more conservative approaches is more preferred, such as the partial cystectomy, 
uh, laparoscopic diabetic colectomy, uh, transurethral uh, resection of tumor. Uh, they are more favorable. However, they carry a risk of um, progression and recurrence. So is it very important? Um, uh, some other researchers have, uh, have pointed out that it's very important um, that uh, we need to have a clinical stage uh, for this um, cancer uh, because it's the factor in determining whether uh, more conservative or a aggressive type approaches is, is um, good for the patient. So according to Gleichening et al, um, for lower stage tumors such as uh, TA or T1, it can be treated with conservative measures such as um, the transurethral resection of tumor followed by um, intravesical chemotherapy and screening cystoscopy. Whereas high stage tumors such as T3 uh, will warrant a more radical method. So overall, um, due to the rarity of um, rarity and absence of early symptoms, uh, intradiverticular urothelial carcinoma is frequently goes under undiagnosed. So we re um, recommend that men with a history of benign prostatic hyperplasia um, to have uh, extensive follow-up um, in order to um, able to detect early symptoms and complications such as bladder diverticulum or um, subsequent bladder cancer. And regarding to the treatment, a clinical judgment must be used to weigh the risk versus benefits of the different uh, treatment modality. So um, for future uh, references, uh, we need a larger scale perspective. Multi-center studies are required to um, generate a more high level evidence to guide the future recommendation for this rare condition. Uh, in particularly uh, determining, the, uh, in order to determining um, the true prevalence of, of, the, of the condition. Um, will help clarify the need for regular surveillance in these patients. Also, uh, more research uh, is needed to evaluate the um, efficacy of different um, surgical modalities as compared to um, the radical cystectomy, uh, which is more um, a morbid procedure. And then lastly, further studies um, on the prognosis uh, will help inform the patient and the physician uh, on the decision on treatment choices and post-op um, surveillance strategies. So that's it, is, that's my presentation. Thank you to my co-authors, uh, Z-Quad, Brandon Stevens, and my um, uh, professor, uh, Dr. Shiv Diman and Dr. Savita Aria. And thank you for listening. Well, that was a nice case, as very nicely elaborated by Mr. Lan, that how a bladder diverticula lacks the muscularis layer, thereby uh, there is a loss of contractility of the bladder, resulting in urine stasis, chronic inflammation followed by, we know all tumors, inflammation can give rise to dysplasia and tumor. Very nicely described, very nice case. Anyone having questions, please unmute and you are welcome to ask questions or you can type in the chat box. Any questions for him? You presented well within time, Mr. Lan. Thank you. Right. Thank well, you. so we don't seem to have any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Lan. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Now we move on to our next speaker.
Mr. Uh, Dr. Sorry, uh, next speaker is Dr. Ma Dr. Shreya Smalapati, who is going to speak on a curious case of a man walking comfortably into the OPD with a hemoglobin of 1.9 grams. But welcome, Doctor. Uh, yeah. Yes. So. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, yes, you are visible and audible both. You can Thanks. start your presentation, share your screen. Yes, ma'am. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, visible. Please continue. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Shreyas. I'm a junior resident in the Department of General Medicine in Rajarajeshwari Medical College in Bangalore, Southern India. Today, I'll be presenting a case, a curious case of a man walking comfortably into the OPD with a hemoglobin of 1.9 gram per deciliter. Introduction. Anemia is a major killer in India. Lowest recorded hemoglobin is 0.6 gram per deciliter observed in anesthetized patient who survived. We describe a case of anemia with hemoglobin of 1.9 gram per deciliter who walked comfortably into the medicine OPD complaining of breathlessness of only upon walking a distance of 500 meters. The case report, 38 year old male, a non-alcoholic and not a smoker, a known hypertensive since five years on triple antihypertensive medications. He presented with exertional breathlessness and easy fatigability since one month. He also gives a history of a road traffic accident two years ago, with significant bleeding from the left leg requiring two pins of PRBC transfusion. The examination revealed a severe pallor with platinichia or flat or spoon-shaped nails. Tachycardia was noted, no overt signs of heart failure were there. Systemic examination was unremarkable. There was no significant family history. The workup. A complete blood count revealed a hemoglobin of 1.9 gram per deciliter. The red cell indices showed a microcytic hypochromic picture. The peripheral smear study confirms the same with the pencil-shaped cells and teardrop cells in a background of microcytic hypochromic RBCs. The reticulocyte count was 0.5% with which we derived the reticulocyte production index, which came up to 0.1%. The serum iron studies were done, which showed serum iron of 17 microgram per deciliter, total iron binding capacity of 283 microgram per deciliter, a transference saturation of just 6%, a ferritin level of 20 microgram per liter, confirming an iron deficiency anemia. Vitamin B12 and vitamin D were also found to be low, and the stool for occult blood was positive, which prompted us to find the source. And hence, we performed an upper GI endoscopy, which turned out to be a normal study. Whereas the colonoscopy revealed a circumferential growth in the proximal transverse colon, which upon histopathological examination showed a moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. Here's a picture, an ulceroproliferative friable growth in the proximal transverse colon. The HE stain section studied from colonic biopsy bit shows an infiltrating malignant neoplasm. So the HE report read moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma colon. An infiltrating malignant neoplasm noted, composed of tumor cells arranged in glands, tubules, and complex branching pattern. Individual tumor cells are pleomorphic with a moderate amount of cytoplasm, high NC ratio hyperchromatic to vesicular nucleus with prominent nucleoli. 
Further workup, a CECT abdomen and pelvis revealed the above features of a polypoidal mass in the hepatic flexure of the colon. Mesentric and retroperitoneal lymph nodes were also noted. Three to four hypodense lesions in the liver were noted, which are likely metastasis. And bilateral main renal artery stenosis was noted, which caused bilateral small kidneys. We went ahead with a more extensive renal workup, which showed a serum creatinine of two milligram per deciliter, a urine protein creatinine ratio of 0.65, and a nil urine albumin in urine routine. An estimated GFR of 41 ml per minute for 1.73 meters square, and a normal liver function test and electrolytes were noted. Uh, HRCT thorax was also done, which revealed a fibrosis with bronchiolectasis, consolidation and a few nodules in the left lower lobe, suspecting an infective etiology for which sputum studies were done, but it turned out normal. A 2D echo scan was done, which also suggested an ischemic heart disease with an ejection fraction of 40 to 45%. The result, the patient was diagnosed with severe iron deficiency anemia, secondary to chronic blood loss from an adenocarcinomatous colon, with an additional anemia of chronic kidney disease and an anemia of chronic heart failure as well. He also had a superadded lower respiratory tract infection and an ischemic heart disease. So uh, the patient was transfused with five units of PRBC correction of vitamin B12 and vitamin D levels were undertaken. Systemic antibiotics were given for the lower respiratory tract infection with other supportive measures. Antihypertensives were optimized and the patient was planned for a surgical resection of the carcinomatous lesion with subsequent chemotherapy. So the uh, surgery was performed and uh, we had a right hemicolectomy specimen which upon histopathological examination revealed an ulcero-infiltrative tumor me measuring six into two into two centimeter upon gross examination. Uh, and it grossly appears to infiltrate the submucosa, muscularis, subserosal fat, and serosa. Microscopically, it was diagnosed to be an adenocarcinoma, not otherwise specified, with extensive necrosis. Tumor shows infiltration into submucosa, muscularis, and subserosal fat. Lymphovascular tumor emboli are not identified. 15 lymph nodes, which were isolated, showed reactive lymphoid hyperplasia and granulomas. The impression was given as an adenocarcinoma grade 2 of the right hemicolectomy specimen. Pathological stage of T3N0. Immunohistochemistry for mismatch repair proteins was done. MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2 showed intact nuclear expression. Thus, there was no loss of nuclear expression of MMR proteins. So there's a low probability of microsatellite instability high. And so Lynch syndrome is unlikely. So the take home message, chronic gastrointestinal bleed is the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in general population. Lesions causing chronic bleeding more frequently located in the upper digestive tract than in the lower. A positive fecal occult blood correlates highly with a neoplastic lesion. Let's have a brief note on colorectal cancer. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cause of cancer-related deaths after lung cancer. Five-year survival rate of 55% noted. The most lethal GI malignant diseases in the, world, in the Western world are the colorectal cancers. And it's preventable and is highly curable if detected early. So what causes colorectal cancer? It's not known exactly what causes colorectal cancer, but there are risk factors that increase chances for colorectal cancer. Some risk factors cannot be changed, such as the age, pers personal and family history. Some risk factors can be changed or eliminated, like tobacco use, obesity, and inactivity. So what are some of the personal and family risk factors? Age. More than 90% of colorectal cancer is found in people aged 50 and over. But in our case, the person was just 38 years old. Family history, whether if the cancer is present in the mother, father, brother, sister, or a child. 
of colorectal cancer or adenomatous polyps or adenomas. A personal history of colorectal cancer it can lead to secondaries. Adenomatous polyps or adenomas, ovarian or endometrial cancer before age 50, inflammatory bowel disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's colitis can also predispose to colorectal cancer. So here's a pictorial representation of the pathophysiology. So a normal mucosa upon hyperproliferation and DNA hypomethylation turns into an adenoma, which upon oncogene mutations gets severe dysplasia, which further leads to cancer. This is called the adenoma carcinoma sequence. The other risk factors are smoking, diets high in fat, obesity in premenopausal women. So what are the signs and symptoms for colorectal cancer? Early stages of colorectal cancer may have no signs or symptoms. If signs and symptoms are present, they may include bleeding from the rectum or blood in the stool. Marked change in bowel habits, abdominal mass, abdominal cramps, or pain. Iron deficiency anemia that is not due to other causes is one of the common symptoms. A brief note on hereditary polyposis syndromes. All have this in common, multiple intestinal polyps, extra intestinal manifestations. Familial adenomatous polyposis, one to 2% of colon cancer patients have this. A point mutation of the ABC gene on chromosome five band Q21 is noted. Polyps found throughout the GI tract, but most in colon. Symptoms manifest by ages 16 to 50. Cancer will develop in all by age 50. Gardner's syndrome, it's a variant of familial adenoma adenomatous polyposis. Colonic and extracolonic manifestations are frequent. Periampillary lesions, urinal lesions, and gastric polyps. Ocular, cutaneous, skeletal lesions are there. Desmoids, hepatoblastomas, thyroid cancer, and Turcot syndrome is also noted. Coming to hereditary non polyposis syndromes, Lynch 1 and 2 are the examples. It occurs five times more frequently than familial polyposis. 1 to 5% of colon cancers have. Lynch. Lynch 1 is just a limited colon, whereas Lynch 2 also involves endometrium, ovary, stomach, small bowel, biliary, pancreas, ureter, and renal pelvis. 85% lifetime risk of colon cancer, more right-sided cancers, earlier within 45 years and lower stage, better survival, but 20% risk of metachronous and synchronous lesions. The treatment is a surgical resection is the only curative treatment. Likelihood of cure is greater when disease is detected at an early stage. Early detection and screening is of pivotal importance. Radiotherapy reduces the number of local recurrences and rectal cancers, but its use in colon cancer is not routine due to sensitivity of bowel to radiation. Here are my references, and thank you for your patient listening. Uh, that was a very elaborate uh, presentation by Dr. Shreyas. Yes, any uh, male patient, particularly male patient with uh, uh, microcytic hypochromic anemia, uh, we really think of the GI tract as the culprit uh, in the first place. You very nicely presented your case with such extension of the literature, review of the literature as well. Okay. Any questions, any questions, uh, please unmute yourself and ask, or you can type in the chat box. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you. Very good presentation on colon cancer. I happen to be a 25-year survivor of stage 3C colon cancer. I had uh, no symptoms. I had, well, I had blood and stool that triggered colonoscopy. I had no... Uh, risk factors for colon cancer. There was no evidence of cancer in my family history. Uh, I ended up using a low dose long-term chemotherapy. And it was a non-toxic level of 5-fluorouracil that's now called metronomic chemotherapy. But uh, I, I, uh, I can certainly appreciate 
you're working on a case with uh, colon cancer. It's a very big problem in the Western world as well as your area. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Michael, for asking this question. And thanks, Dr. Shreyas, for answering, presenting such a nice case. OK, so now, thank you, Dr. Shreyas. We now move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Dr. Ishra. Uh, she is now going to tell us about some red rearrangements in salivary, uh, salivary gland tumors, especially the intraductal carcinomas. Well, Dr. Uh, uh, Ishra, uh, you can uh, share your screen and start your presentation with a brief introduction of yourself because we are all from different parts of the world. Okay. Uh, yeah, just one second, I'm trying to share my screen. Do you see my screen now? Yeah, we, we can see your screen. Okay. A uh, little more clarity there is, I think it is looking. Is it, clear? Is it clear for all the participants? It's a little bit out of focus. Yeah, it's a little bit out of focus. Um, just one second. It's legible, however. Yeah, it is. It is, of course, legible. You can. You can. You can start, ma'am. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Uh, is my videos working? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Man. Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you for having me here. I am Isra Lakluk and I am an assistant professor at Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, University of Wisconsin-Madison. My talk today about clinical feature of red tree arranged salivary gland carcinoma emphasizing intraductal carcinoma. Salivary gland carcinoma is considered one of the more challenging areas of diagnostic surgical pathology, given the rarity of salivary gland carcinoma, most surgical pathologists encounter them infrequently in the daily practice. The dramatic overlap of histomorphology and immunohistochemical profile between some entities create a risk for misclassification. Uh, Nowadays, using molecular testing to identify fusion transcripts in salivary gland carcinoma can improve diagnostic accuracy and the selection of appropriate therapy. For the illustration, this slide demonstrates HNE's image of three cases with red fusion that show similar morphology but different diagnosis. I will begin my talk with uh, two really interesting and challenging cases that I encountered them um, in, my, uh, um, in my practice. And the bulk of my talk will be focused on the morphologic feature of red rearranged salivary gland carcinoma, especially intraductal carcinoma in the literature, 
clinical feature of it rearranged salivary gland carcinoma in our study. And I will conclude by demonstrating a practical diagnostic approach to make a right diagnosis uh, for those rare um, carcinomas. So the first case is a 96 years old woman who presented with painless palpable mass behind her left ear, which has been presented for sometimes around like nine months. And when she has the image, um, she, there was a heterogeneous enhancing 2.2 centimeter mass with her left parotid gland, and there is no associated lymph node enlargement. The cytology shows uniform oncocytic cells with round nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and the background with abundant colloid-like material, and the case was finalized as low-grade neoplastic lesion. And the patient underwent restriction, and this is like a low, low power view of the um, a lesion um, resected, completely resected with a rim of normal thyroid, uh, normal parotid gland tissue in the periphery, um, showed like uni, unilocular cystic lesion with a segment of solid component, a rim of uh, salivary gland tissue and uh, fatty tissue. The tumor is uh, well circumscribed and surrounded by thick fibrous capsule. There is a focal area of microinvasion within the capsule, but there is no destructive, a destructive or infiltrative growth pattern. So high power view for this lesion shows that the lesional cells were cuboidal with abundant eosinophilic uh, cytoplasm, uh, prominent nucleoli, um, occasional prominent nucleoli with homogeneous chromatin. Interestingly, we note those like flat myoepithelial cells surrounding those cysts and ducts. We perform like our differential were including oncocytoma, secretory carcinoma, and intraductal carcinoma. We did immunostain and this tumor cells were positive for S100 and mammoglobin. SUX10 was positive. P63 were, was negative in the luminal cells and only highlighting the myoepithelial cells, those the one that's surrounding the ducts and tubules. We described this pattern of invagination of myoepithelial, which is different from the, out, the, the limitation for the outer uh, uh, layer of myoepithelium since it's included in the, within the solid area as myoepithelial invagination. So um, from the other, from, we exclude oncocytoma, secretory carcinoma, and we call this lesion intraductal carcinoma, and we send it for next generation sequencing to confirm the diagnosis. And we, we make sure that we are not um, missing um, unusual morphology for secretory carcinoma. The case number two, a 61 years old man who presented with painless palpable mass behind the right ear, who presented for six months, and the imaging shows a heterogeneous uh, enhancing three centimeter mass within the right parotid gland and no lymph node enlargement. The surgical resection shows um, three centimeter with circumscribed mass with the um, uh, was like cystic and liquidated and filled with motor oil-like fluid. Frozen section was performed for this lesion and was called Worthen-like tumor with focal solid um, area. And as we see here from the low power view, we have um, uh, something resembling a Worthen tumor with adjacent salivary gland tissue. Uh, the me, um, at this power, we can appreciate the tumor, uh, the oncocytic epithelium overlying the lymphoid stroma. Uh, however, there is some complexity which not as which is unusual to be uh, recognized when, with Worthen tumor. So, uh, and uh, other area of the tumor shows some nests, creepiform uh, pattern with glandular formation with associated intraluminal colloid-like secretion. So for this case, our differential diagnosis was eosinophilic mucoepidermoid carcinoma, Worthen tumor, and secretory carcinoma. 
the immune stain shows the tumor cells were positive for S100 and mam globin. Saxton also was positive, and P63 was only positive for the outer outer cells of myoepithelial cells that are rimming the tumor nests, and the luminal cells were negative for P63. And this is high power uh, view showing the rim of myoepithelial cells via negative um, luminal cells uh, for P63. So um, we exclude all the, um, uh, we, we, exclude, we should exclude all the three differential diagnoses and include introductal carcinoma for this case. However, this case was signed out as a secretory carcinoma and sent for next generation sequencing. So both case shows the same translocation of NCOA4 red, um, which is um, which is um, which which was correct for the first case for the diagnosis for introductory carcinoma, and was not fit for the diagnosis for um, secretory carcinoma for the next case. So go. Uh, we are. Go, I'm going over like red, uh, red, uh, red fusion in other malignancies. So most of the salivary gland carcinoma, most like it's very common to have uh, some salivary gland carcinoma with the specific gene rearrangement. However, the red um, uh, fusion in salivary gland carcinoma is very rare. NCOA4 and ETB6 are the most reported fusion partnered with red fusion. Red fusion kinase occur nearly in one fourth of papillary thyroid carcinoma and about 2% in lung adenocarcinoma. So, and why it's important to recognize the red derivative malignancy in any organs, having the novel treatment for those uh, molecular signatures, it's, um, it's important to identify the patient with those translocation or rearrangement for the appropriate treatment, especially with the selective red inhibitors. So to summarize our findings in the two cases, we have low-grade salivary gland carcinoma with NCOA4 red gene fusion. This tumor has a dual-cell population, luminal epithelial and basal myoepithelial cells. The luminal epithelials are positive for S100, mammoglobin, and saxton, negative for P63 and androgen receptor. The basal cell or like basal cell or myoepithelial cell were positive for P63 and other myoepithelial marker. So this immune profile, this the immune profile and molecular profile fit for the introductal carcinoma with intercalated duct uh, duct type differentiation. So going over the red, how much do we know about red rearrangement rearrangement in the salivary gland carcinoma? So retrie arranged salivary gland carcinoma is not defined yet in the WHO book in 2017. And the retrie arranged salivary gland carcinoma were first documented in 2018 in two different entity, including secretory carcinoma and introductal carcinoma. So in, two, uh, in the two, in WHO uh, book 2017, introductal carcinoma was an updated designation of a lesion, which previously called low-grade cripriform cyst adenocarcinoma or low-grade salivary gland duct carcinoma or salivary gland carcinoma in situ, specifically with apocrine feature, which um, without any reported uh, recurrent molecular signature. Introductal carcinoma, as reported in the WHO book, uh, considered very indolent tumor with no reported aggressive behavior. In contrast, the secretory carcinoma is described as an, a new entity with a specific signature of ETV6 in track tree fusion. Secretory carcinoma shows microcystic and tubular pattern with desmoblastic stroma, intraluminal colloid-like secretion, uh, there is no association with lymphoid rich stroma, and the most frequent reported uh, translocation is ETP6 in track 3 fusion. Uh, this tumor usually positive for S100, MAM globin, and SUX10, negative for P63 and other myoepithelial marker. Secretory carcinoma 
can associate it with aggressive behavior that including recurrence and metastasis and death. So going over the literature and how uh, they define those introductal carcinoma and translocations, in 2018, a study reported 14 pure introductal carcinoma with red fusion has the typ typical differentiation of introductal car uh, intracalated duct feature with S100 positive, androgen receptor negative. Seven of, seven of those 14 cases has red rearrangement. While apocrine uh, introductal carcinoma with apocrine differentiation will have androgen positive, androgen receptor positivity and S100 negative. In 2018 also, Skolova has reported um, a 70, seven out of 17 introductal carcinoma with red fusion were originally diagnosed as secretory carcinoma. And this is there is the possibility of undercalling or underdiagnosed or of those like introductal carcinoma as a, uh, and uh, misclassified them as secretory carcinoma. I'm also reporting the same pattern of um, the NCOA for red, uh, for introductal carcinoma, intercalated duct differentiation, while mixed introductal carcinoma with intercalated duct differentiation and epocrine differentiation has another um, red, uh, rearrangement with TR, TRIM27 red with focal epocrine differentiation. So, um, and uh, we use the term of introductal carcinoma as uh, to, to consider this tumor as an in situ or indolent tumor. But in 2019, Skolova also reported uh, a novel finding of introductal carcinoma with, red, with NCOA for red fusion uh, with advanced disease uh, invasion um, to adjacent structure and lymph node metastasis. The following, uh, uh, during the last year, um, another study was uh, demonstrated by Justin Bishop um, to, to study the myoepithelial component for the introductal carcinoma with intracalated duct differentiation to assess if those myoepithelial cells as, are like benign component or are part of the tumor. So, and in his study shows that like in the red fusion was um, harbored in the post ductal and myoepithelial cells, which is which is um, which make the the case for this tumor as biphasic salivary gland tumor, like pleomorphic adenoma, including the luminal and myoepithelial cells as a part of the tumor, with uh, both having the red translocation. Um. As they describe the apocrine introductal carcinoma, intercalated type int uh, ductal carcinoma, also there is another one, another uh, subtype of introductal carcinoma with onco with pure oncocytic differentiation. This subtype of introductal carcinoma harbor usually harbor TRM thirty three red fusion and BRAF uh, V six hundred mutation. So uh, red rearranged salivary gland carcinoma, the clinical feature that we find in our uh, study. So this study was published in August 2011. And this study was performed in collaboration um, um, while I was at MGH um, as a fellow. So in this study, we compared the clinical, uh, clinical pathological features on the clinical behavior of uh, NCOA for red fusion introductal carcinoma to ETB6 red fusion uh, secretory carcinoma. And we report the long term outcome of those two carcinomas. So, this is a descriptive study. We retrieved all the cases with a uh, red translocation between 2014 2019. We reviewed all the slides. We run, um, we report the molecular finding and uh, any. Uh, fish um, by 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 uh, next generation sequencing or fish, and we did the survival analysis. Our result of total 22, um, 220, uh, uh, 28 case, 16 case was subject for um, uh, next generation sequencing. 
um, 15 of those have uh, retfusion. And NCOA4 was the most frequent translocation associated with RIT translocation. So we have the NCOA4 RIT and ATV6 RIT. So, um, and 60% of endoductal carcinoma were originally diagnosed as secretory carcinoma. And one case of secretory carcinoma was diagnosed as pleomorphic adenocarcinoma and we reclassified as uh, adenocarcinoma in OS. Um, for symptoms duration, there was a significant difference between introductal carcinoma and secretory carcinoma. Usually secretory carcinoma present with short um, uh, symptoms duration, like just limited for weeks, while introductal carcinoma, they usually present for several months for se uh, or several years. Um, one case of um, uh, secretory carcinoma presented with uh, distal, distant metastasis, it, although it's not as statistically significant, but it's, it's, it's almost significant with 0 0.005. Uh, interestingly, in two cases of our introductal carcinoma were presented with facial nerve involvement at the time of presentation. Um, uh, one of the case was inoperable and other case was um, clinically and microscopically with uh, facial nerve inv uh, involvement. Uh, there is no difference of receiving uh, adjuvant therapy between both cases, especially with um, the cases with uh, uh, perineural uh, invasion and facial nerve involvement. So for the histological feature, um, uh, cystic and multinodular growth pattern were more dominant in the introductal carcinoma and no infiltrative growth pattern reported in introductal carcinoma while the secretory carcinoma shows only infiltrative growth pattern. Um, lymphoid richest trauma only reported in the introductal carcinoma, but it's not reported in secretory carcinoma. So adverse histological uh, feature, including um, invasion, necrosis, and uh, dysmoplastic reaction, um, was only reported in um, reported in all cases of um, um, secretory carcinoma, but only reported in forty percent of um, introductal carcinoma. So some cases shows unusual histology, like this case. One of the our cases shows nodular ill-defined um, uh, border tumor associated with um, uh, lymphoid stroma and uh, focal uh, mucinous differentiation. This case shows like diffuse mammoglobin positivity is 100 positivity with intact P63 um, glands. So one case shows also like perineural invasion and loss of myoepithelial cells. Um, this is the disease-free survival shows that like all Are we uh, are we connected? Uh, the technical people could please Dr. Ishra. Dr. Ishra, can you hear Dr. Ishra? Please unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. So Please. where I, I was stopped? Yeah, you no, know, no, just now only, just now, not, not much oh. before. Please continue. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm still sharing or I'm not sharing my screen? No, no, the screen sharing is stopped. Yeah. Okay, just one second.
Please continue. We can see your screen. Okay. So the Kaplan Meyer, um, uh, the Kaplan Meyer case uh, shows um, a difference in the recurrence, an adverse event, recurrence, and uh, cancer-related death. There is uh, no cases of um, um, recurrence reported with the intraductal carcinoma, while two cases has multiple recurrence in the secretory carcinoma and one cancer-related death. Okay. So one case has a recurrence at 18 months, the second recurrence at 18 months, and the third recurrence, the second recurrence for other case was at 11 months. So the conclusion for our study was the rate rearranged. Um, um, Introductal carcinoma shows histological and immunohistochemical profile overlaps uh, with uh, secretory carcinoma, including the low grade feature, low grade morphology, luminal formation, and microcystic growth pattern. Co expression of S100, SUX10, and MAM globin, then, and those findings is high likely to lead to misdiagnosis. So although those two cases shows very similar histology and immunohistochemical profile, but they are clinical and um, uh, the clinical and long-term outcome are different. So not only sequ uh, secretory carcinoma, but only long-standing intraductal carcinoma can have adverse adverse event, including local uh, invasion and facial nerve involvement. And uh, the only way to distinguish between those entity, if the histomorphology is not um, clear, it's performing the uh, molecular testing. Mm -hmm. So to summarize the literature, the, the final definition for the introductory carcinoma in the salivary gland, uh, um, in the salivary gland, based on the literature, um, there is a there is four different type of introductal carcinoma in the salivary gland based on the different cell differentiation, intracalated duct type, which is uh, S100 positive, mammoglobin positive, and SUX10 positive, androgen receptor negative, and they usually harbor the NCOA4 rate translocation. Epocrine uh, introductal carcinoma will be S100 negative and androgen positive, no genetic or no specific genetic alteration related to uh, red fusion. Mixed intercalated duct and apocrine will have those mixed feature between uh, S100 and apocrine uh, and androgen receptor differentiation um, and usually uh, have uh, red translocation. Oncocytic type in introductal carcinoma, they are S100 positive and androgen receptor negative and they harbor the TRIM33 rate and also BRAF V600. And there is no invasion associated with those oncocytic intracalated intraductal carcinoma. Also, we proposed um, uh, an algorithmic approach to, to try to, tri to triage those cases to help um, um, mapping those cases to reach the right diagnosis especially when we have low-grade cytomorphology using S100, SUX10, and mammoglobin and the androgen receptor positivity versus negativity to triage the cases if it's necessary to do, to perform um, um, red fish or next-generation sequencing to differentiate between introductal carcinoma versus secretory carcinoma to, to put the patient in the appropriate risk management for the right diagnosis. So, and for, final, for the final um, slide for this uh, talk, um, the first picture, um, it's an uh, introductory carcinoma, and the second picture for the second case, it's secretory carcinoma, and the third also is introductory carcinoma. 
So they have very similar, it's almost exactly similar histology, but the, the molecular profile for their, those cases are different. So, um, so this is just like a very, very uh, important in, in, very, in, in cases with advanced disease, it's, it's very important to recognize those subtypes to classify the patient with the correct diagnosis. I would like to, the, to thank um, the e, um, Hedanic uh, Pathology team at MGH uh, for this opportunity to be part of this great study. Those are the references and, um, and thank you and, I, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm available to answer any questions. Uh, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, uh, any questions from the floor? Any questions to her? That was a really good work. Uh, morphology is a challenge to the pathologist. And with this mixture of findings, uh, we have to be again more cautious. Any questions? Any questions to Dr. Ishra? Okay, thank you, Dr. Ishra. Uh, so we now move on to the next speaker. I now welcome Dr. Isabella from Ecuador, who is now going to present a rare case of a liposarcoma, a differentiated liposarcoma. So welcome, Dr. Ish so you may please uh, share your screen. Good morning, well, good afternoon, everybody here in Ecuador. It's still morning, mm -hmm. 10 a.m. So may, can you tell me if you can see my... I, uh, we are, well, this is a poster. poster. We can see a poster. Okay, yeah, it's the poster. So I'm going to use this. Uh, please introduce yourself a little bit because we are far away. Yeah. And then you can start with your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, my name is Isabel Bisuete. I'm um, in my last year of uh, the postgrade of uh, pathology in Ecuador, in Latin America. Um, I'm so glad to be here and to have the opportunity to present this very interesting case that I had the opportunity to, to study and review the last year in one of the hospitals where I have to do my studies. This hospital is uh, San Francisco de Quito, which is the capital of Ecuador. So thank you very much and I hope you like it as I did. So uh, for, um, for the beginning, I, I would like to say something about the background. You know that liposarcoma is the most common subtype of soft tissue tumor accounting for around 20 to 35% of all the adult uh, sub-tissue sarcomas. However, the incidence of this de-differentiated liposarcoma is less than 0 0.1 per 1 million people each year. In Ecuador, my native country, and where the present case was reviewed and studied, no cases of retroperitoneal uh, sarcomas have been reported in the tumor Registry of the National Institute of Statistics and Censuses, INIC. On the website of the Society of, uh, for the Fight Against Cancer of Ecuador, SOLCA, in the period of 2005 to 2008, a total of 19 cases, uh, eight in men and 11 in women, were reported uh, diagnosed as malignant tumors of the peritoneum and retroperitoneum, but there was no specific uh, diagnosis. The 2020 World Health Organization classification of tumors of soft tissue and bone recognizes five major liposarcoma subtypes, which are divided in three groups. Um, the first group is, is the well-differentiated lipo liposarcoma, slash a typical lipomatous uh, tumor. And the high grade of this entity is the de-differentiated liposarcoma. The second uh, group is the myxoid uh, liposarcoma and the high grade myxoid liposarcoma 
which was called also the round cell tumor, and we don't do it anymore. It's just high-grade myxoid liposarcoma. And the third group is the pleomorphic liposarcoma. Um, especially the first group, the well-differentiated liposarcoma and the de-differentiated liposarcoma are entities that um, represent clinical and pathological or has um, some agreements, some are, 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 are in the same group because of their cytological and molecular characteristics. Um, both entities have um, high level amplifications of the murine double minute two, which is MDM2, and the cycling dependent kinase four, CDK4, uh, which are the cycle onco oncogenes. Um, at, at least 90% of the patients that develop the, these de-differentiated liposarcoma um, present them uh, the novel, but at 10% is because of a recurrence of a well-differentiated liposarcoma. So with this introduction, I would like to present this case um, of a female patient, 39 years old, uh, with no important antecedents, she used to work as a house cleaner. A consultation for diffuse abdominal pain from mild to moderate, which started one year ago and worsened in the last month. It was accompanied with nausea and vomiting with hyperexia and constipation. There was no fever. The function of the kidneys were normal as well as the electrolytes. The CT scan revealed a mass of approximately 95 centimeters that was displaced in the left kidney. And at first was uh, believed that this tumor originated in the left adrenal gland. This mass uh, didn't absorb the contrast. In subsequent studies, it was ruled out that this mass didn't depend uh, on the ovary either. Uh, during the surgery, uh, the findings were of a giant retroperitoneal mass with defined edges, lobulated, occupying the left pararenal and perirenal space, as well as the left vascular space. There was serous peritoneal fluid too. There was no cleavage plane with a kidney, and the patient had no other history of another mass in, in extremities, neither other side of her body. So in the macroscopy, we received this mass uh, together with the left kidney, and they together weighted uh, five kilograms. The mass uh, measured 32 per 22 per 11 centimeters. It was uh, completely encapsulated. Uh, as you can see here, it's the shadow of the, of the kidney. It was multi-loved too. The external surface was smooth, brown, and had some purplish areas, as you can see. It was reluctant with permanent vasculature too. It was found uh, surrounding the kidney, but um, it didn't infiltrate it. And on, su on successive sections, a um, serious flu fluid fl flowed in an approximate volume of 15 millimeters. And the surface, uh, as you can see here, was heterogeneous uh, with some areas of um, adipose tissue. And it was interspersed with mycote and necrotic areas. Um, the necrosis was about 30 to 14%. So in the microscope, we were able to see a mesenchymal lesion with several components uh, in which um, hypercellular areas were highly pleomorphic, composed of some uh, spindle-shaped cells. Um, we also could see lipoblasts, pleomorphic lipoblasts, which are rarely, uh, rarely seen in, these, in this tumor. 
and they are not um, required for its diagnosis. Uh, we also saw some rhabdoid um, shaped cells and uh, it, all of this was in a myxoid uh, background. So here we had the question about, uh, the, is this a well differentiated, sorry, is, is this, uh, or was this a de-differentiated de liposarcoma or a pleomorphic liposarcoma? Because you know that these pleomorphic lipoblasts are typical of this pleomorphic liposarcoma. But um, in some areas of this mass, we were able to see the well-differentiated liposarcoma areas with atypic atypical spindle cells and its transition to this de-differentiated liposarcoma. And you also know that um, this pleomorphic liposarcoma is common in extremities and the patient had no registry of this. It was just this mass in the retroperitoneum. Additionally, in other areas of the of the tumor, uh, we saw uh, some bone tissue without atypia and as areas of metaplastic bone, which it's, um, we can find it in this tumor too. Also, we had extensive areas of necrosis and hemorrhage and the mitotic activity was three to five mitosis in their high power field. And about the immunohistochemistry, in Ecuador, we are not able to have all the stains that we wish, but uh, we could um, do bimenting, which was strong and diffusely positive. We also um, did desmin, uh, which was positive in scattered rhabdomyoblasts. Uh, while caldesmon S100 and pancreatin AE1, AE3 were negative. So um, this is the, the case that I wanted to share with you. I hope that you like it as well as I did. And it really was pretty interesting for my study here in, in Ecuador in my, in my post grade. And I don't know if you have or anyone has any questions. So. Well, that was a nice presentation, uh, uh, Dr. Isabelle. Uh, I now call upon uh, anyone who wishes to ask her question. Yes, anyone? If you are unable to ask, then you may please type it in the chat box for me to read it out to her. Okay, uh, I don't see any questions. Oh, thank you, Dr. Isabel. That was a nice presentation and also within thank time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank so you. now we move on to our next speaker. That's a keynote uh, speech and presenter is Dr. Anil Parwani. Again, we'll see about digital pathology and AI tools. Dr. Anil, the platform. Oh, good morning. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So it is. The Do we get started? Yeah, yes. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Yes. Too many windows are open, so hopefully. Give me a minute. We wish to know about you, Dr. Anil. Yes, I will do that in a second. Can you see my screen? Sure, yeah, I can. Yeah, we can see your screen. Make it full screen, please. How about now? Uh, right, yeah, we got it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for 
to the conference organizers for inviting me. Thank you, Pallavi, for uh, moderating this session. So my name is Anil Parwani. I'm a pathologist at The Ohio State University, and I'm also the director of digital pathology. So today I'd like to speak to you about the impact on patient care when you start using these tools such as digital pathology, such as AI. You know, we, we, I was listening to all the lectures this morning and all the different interesting cases and the positive impact of pathology diagnosis on these patients, you know, to get the right diagnosis. So how do we take it a step further? So I come from Columbus, Ohio. I work at the Ohio State University. And there is a beautiful picture of the downtown uh, Columbus. And this is my university where I work. You can see the campus here. It's really cold outside right now. It was snowing yesterday. And uh, this is the hospital which, where I work, the medical center and the cancer center is right next to it. So my office is right here. So what I want to do is talk to you about digital pathology, how have we implemented it? How can it help us? Um, how can digital pathology help us by to improve patient care? You know, what if you look at pathology today, what are the challenges that we face? What are the barriers that we face? What are the new technologies that are now available to pathologists? And how do we adopt these tools and technology to improve our workflows, improve our efficiencies and patient care. This was never more true than during the pandemic. So we have pathology is transforming. That should be an M here. And there are challenges and there are, but there are a lot of opportunities. So we are at crossroads in pathology. We can continue to do nothing and stay put, or we can look at the disruption that's ahead of us and slowly add these tools to our workflow. So as a pathologist, we review qualitatively each cancer care case. We, it requires a more efficient throughput system. It also has, we need an increased or better ability to communicate inside and outside the institutions. Several of us present at tumor boards, at clinical conferences, at meetings, at conferences, but when you specifically for patient care, what you see microscopically, we should be able to assimilate it into a great diagnosis, which is the correct diagnosis, and share it with colleagues inside and outside. Sometimes we have to send those cases out for consultation. So let's, um, and when you look at cancer care, it's also becoming more and more complex, right? So this all promotes multidisciplinary collaborations. So when you look at your pathology grossly, and when you start taking information from that specimen, take sections of it, make microscopic slides, and ultimately look at images, the reports that we are generating today in 2022 are much more complex. There, are, there is new knowledge, there are new discoveries. We know more about cancers than ever before. So how can digital pathology help us create better reports? How can digital pathology help us assimilate this knowledge and apply new tools and analyses on these images that are generated from the glass slides? So we have, if you look at the data that as we as pathologists put out, into our reports. A lot of this data is coming from pathology reports directly. Some of it is coming from clinical notes. Some of it is coming from radiology. But ultimately, as pathologists, we are contributing a lot of data to the electronic medical record. What about in terms of knowledge, right? This is the tumors of the nervous system, second edition. And this is the fourth edition. So you can see already the number of pages have increased. So I cannot even see what the 22 edition will be like, how many pages. More importantly, the knowledge here is not just based on morphology, it's based on molecular, it's based on genomics. With new tools like AI, some of these tools, some of these analysis, some of these tests will help further classify these tumors, will lead to more discoveries. So the digital pathology, is already making a positive impact on patient care. So 
patients are demanding more information, right? So if you're a patient, you are more empowered now. You have patient portals with information. They want to know, what do I have? How bad is it? Will I die from it? What are my treatment options? What comes next? So all these are things that we have to really, really um, be aware of as pathologists, because it's not just the clinical teams that are getting your diagnosis. They're going out to the, to the, to the patients more frequently, more easily. So as a pathologist, you're facing more pressure to give a better diagnosis, a faster diagnosis of better quality. And digital pathology has all the ingredients to allow these things to happen more efficiently. So we have new tools. So we, for digital pathology, we have, once the glass slide is digitized, you can start to use whole slide imaging, which converts a glass slide into a, an entire digital image. You have genomics tools, you have image analysis, quantitative image analysis. Yesterday, you heard Dr. Bowie talk about some of these tools, artificial intelligence, and it's not, some of these are not unique to pathology. It's also radiology. So digital pathology is turning out to be an enabling tool for pathologists workflow, education, and research. And multiple studies have demonstrated the ease of deploying these tools, if we can overcome the barriers, ability to integrate it with your workflow, use quality assurance, improve quality assurance of your images and your diagnosis, improve education and training opportunities for you, your trainees, your residents, your fellows, and even your phys physicians, physician colleagues, and definitely more opportunities for research, which once a glass slide is made, that's the end of the life cycle, right? You have the glass slide, you make a diagnosis, maybe use it for research, but you cannot go beyond that. But once a slide, that glass slide is digitized, you can do all of these things plus more. So it's already just by showing you some of these examples, you can see the tremendous impact this is already having on patient care and pathologist workflow. So what are the value drivers? So once the slides are digitized and you have a digital workflow, you can now share this image readily you know, if I want to show a rare case of sarcoma to a soft tissue expert in China or in Dubai or in the UK, I can just press a button and it enables that high quality image to be rapidly shared and reviewed with colleagues. We can expand, if you're a pathologist who has uh, expertise in dermatopathology, you can share your knowledge with other pathologists and offer consultation, offer opportunities for them to show you cases easily. You know, yesterday I had a case of uh, renal cell carcinoma and I wanted to share it with a colleague because it was very unusual. And because of pandemic, my colleague was not available and was confined to home. But with this technology, I was able to press a button and share it with my colleague. So you can think of countless number of ways this can improve patient care. Obviously, if you are a pathologist, you're not just going to look at an image in, uh, as by itself. You want to be able to look at the radiology of it. You want to be able to look at the clinical nodes. So it's important for these images from pathology to be interoperable across electronic medical records. So you need to work on IT solutions so to enhance this continuity of care. And then finally, when these slides, glass slides are digitized, you're creating a warehouse of data, which is enabling all this research in machine learning and AI tools. So we, in the last five years, I've seen more and more scientists, machine learning scientists get into pathology space, start building algorithms, start writing code, which will enable us to um, provide these tools to pathologists. So again, Ultimately, the ultimate goal is to improve patient care. So why is pathology ready for a disruption, right? So what does digital pathology offer that class size do not? Digital pathology offers opportunities for increased productivity. 
improving information management and workflow distribution, integration of data from multiple sources, not just pathology. Ultimately, if I can share that case easily, I can uh, do better quality assurance on this, improve patient safety, improve my quality of my diagnosis and my um, ability to also be available as an expert to colleagues who might need my expertise, rapid second reviews, easier access to subspecialists. If you're a hospital, you want to increase your revenues. Digital pathology offers those opportunities by creating a virtual consultation network and also bundling pathology with radiology and oncology and creating opportunities to of pull through revenues. You also have an opportunity to save costs. So if you if you cannot, um, if you have a lab with multiple hospital systems and you're serving them, instead of building a lab in every hospital, you can consolidate. You can use digital scanners to digitize that workflow. So the overall cost of moving glass slides is reduced or it is almost gone. And then once you have built that robust data warehouse, you have created opportunities for innovations. So all these are things that are not possible as much with glass slides. So how are pathologists, how do pathologists feel about that? You know, so if I asked, uh, if I asked pathologists in this audience, are you ready to give up your microscopes? Are you, are you comfortable with digital slides? Can you see what you need to see? Do you trust digital pathology systems? So pathologists are getting more and more comfortable. They are coming around. More pathologists, even in my institute, are now signing out digitally. They are not afraid to give up their microscopes. There are limitations like special stains, polarizations, crystals, which become challenging to view on digital images, but there are ways to work around that. There are regulatory hurdles, but now, especially during COVID, we had some relaxation of those regulatory hurdles. And now we have scanners which are approved for digital pathology. What are the financial gains, right? So if you ask the hospital administrators, why do they want to spend money in it? So I think the bottom line is maybe you will not Hospital may not make a tremendous amount of money just by digitizing slides, but if they improve patient care, if they reduce errors, they improve the quality of the diagnosis coming from pathology departments within their hospital, they will, this will lead to improved quality of uh, the diagnosis. So for, we saw this more and more, uh, particularly during COVID where you know, during the pandemic, several pathologists were sick or they, they didn't want to, they were afraid to come to the hospital. They were confined to their homes. They could not move around as easily, especially like in April, May of 2020, we saw them turning to digital pathology. We saw them reaching out and start signing out digitally. So in terms of workflow, right? So how does a lab get ready for digital pathology? If you look at the workflow in labs across the world, it's highly variable. And there are steps which have a range of complexity. So it's not easily amenable to automation. Some of those tasks can be automated, but many of them cannot. Other steps are very algorithm driven, such as following a checklist, assembling a case. Many of these step, manual steps require skilled technicians like gross examination of specimens. So a lot of these tasks cannot be easily automated, but there are things which can be automated. Once you start thinking about that workflow and looking at the end result is a digital image, you can backtrack and start making changes in your lab. And that's exactly what we did when we started a few years ago. If you look at the state of the whole slide imaging industry, it's now we have automated high speed, high resolution whole slide imaging systems, some of which can you can load up to 1000 slides at a time and you can walk away. They can read barcodes and they can achieve a spatial sampling, which is really resolution of 
0.2 up to 0.25 microns per pixel which means that you can use that resolution that special sampling to look at more nuclear details to look at nucleoli and even more than one nucleoli look at the chromatin pattern so it's really um, in the last 20 years or so whole slide imaging and the scanners and the quality of diagnosis have continued to improve so the goal is we should be able to if you were if you are a lab and you want to buy a scanner you have an lis you have a you want to use an image analysis system not one company can build everything right so we should be able to just like radiology is to a certain extent now be able to use open platforms so multiple types of scanners with different image formats can be viewed on your monitor and you should be able to get tools from different companies, vendors, researchers, your own university, and start using these tools in the context of the patient. So there is a need to create open platforms. So two scanners have been approved. I expect some other scanners will be approved in, the, in 2022. So that has led to improvement of adoption as well, right? So more adoption, the cost, of scanners is about the same or maybe gone down, but the overall to make an image from an HNE slide overall because of the infrastructure needs and the storage and everything else has started to go down. Image quality is continuing to improve. So in that context, you know, when you look at the monitor that you're looking at, can you see signet ring cells in this image? Can you see plasma cells? Can you see mass cells? So a number of such studies have been done over the years and have looked at the image quality. Is the image quality inferior to a glass slide review? So in some features, there have been limitations found, but in most features, in most diagnosis, image quality is of clinical grade. So ultimately, as a pathologist, how does it lead to improvement of patient care? When the slides are digitized, you can discuss it with clinical teams, patients, families, so the knowledge, the diagnosis is rapidly transmitted. You can discuss it at conferences and your workflow, if you're a solo pathologist, you're able to be connected now virtually to a network of pathologists, a network of virtual expertise, which is, hard to do in a glass slide world. And ultimately, I think what is going to drive adoption even more, what is, even, what is going to improve patient care even more is the ability to access AI tools for prognosis, treatment, predictions, companion diagnostics. So we used to talk about this uh, five, 10 years ago, but now this is a reality, right? So. So this is our timeline. We started in this space at Ohio State in 2016 and beyond 2021. And we started with just a few scanners and we started digitizing our slides. We are now almost five years into this space now where we first started scanning slides in 2017. We bought our first scanners in 2016, but now 2021, most pathologists are using digital slides. And we are starting to now look at do machine learning tools. We're starting to look into image analysis. We're starting to use AI tools. So this is becoming a reality now. So when we were planning to do this, again, a lot of these manual steps had to be looked back when we were trying to go digital, right? So all the, from point of accessioning to sign out in an anatomical pathology workflow had to be reviewed in that context. So again, going back to the point that I'm trying to make is we can do everything that we could do with class slides, but much more now. So overall, the impact on patient care is enormous, right? So many of these manual steps can be automated now. So this is what we have been doing. So this is the space where we started installing our scanners and we started going back into the archives. We started to digitize these glass slides and we wanted to go back several years. So, this, so that we have the database that we need 
for research and AI development, but we also were able to provide concrete examples of where this will help patient care. So this is this is what we had to do. Where now we could see any image on any monitor, or as long as there was internet and VPN, and you had the firewall issues worked out, you could be have, gain access to this database virtually anywhere. We also looked into different types of scanners, not just big scanners for scanning large number of sites. So this is an example of a small scanner which can be used for frozen sections or interoperative diagnoses. So this is so once we started to do this, one of the limitation was that this lab was not, you know, this lab was not in the histology area. So slides had to be moved. It would take time for the glass slides to become, you know, to start getting loaded in the scanner. So we started building a new lab which was a histology lab, which was consolidated. So it was serving more than one hospital. And we started to create opportunities to add scanners at the end of this workflow. We started to also add small scanners to hospitals where there was only one pathologist. So we can connect with those pathologists, share cases with them, for them to share cases with us. So this is the new lab, which was built right before COVID. Um, and we moved our scanners there in close proximity to the glass slides. So we, for the first time, we started to see complete digital workflow where tissue goes into the pathology lab and images are coming out as outputs, right? So the other challenge is, how do you distribute these images to pathologists? If you just should send them links to images, without the link to patient information, then that information would be useless for them, right? So we started to use these for controls. We started to send a daily control to pathologists. We started to send them immunohistochemistry controls. And we started to build connectivity with the lab information system. So within the lab information system, you know, which plays a central role in the lab, we started to build interfaces for all these different aspects of digital pathology workflow. So ultimately our goal was to have the images linked to the lab information system, which was linked to the electronic medical record, and also be able to use AI tools on these images, right? So these are this, this is just a generic example of a workflow. But this was one of the first interface that we built where as soon as a case is accession in the LIS, it sent an order to the image management system and created a link to that image for the pathologist to review. So we then moved in 2019, moved to a new lab information system, which looked like this. So here you can see the link to the image as this eye icon and when I clicked on this launch case images, I can not only see everything about the patient, the lab reports, the information about the specimen, the, the different types of things that are needed in the report. So I could construct my report and I can see everything about the patient. The, and, and, and click on that link and I was able to see the h and &E slides for the case, not just for that, one slide, but the entire case, all the slides. And if I wanted to order immunostains, I could see that as well. So the pathologists were now able to see the image in the context of the patient. They were able to collaborate. They were able to teach. They were able to, so certainly what used to be, used to take a longer time, which was to share cases, it became instantaneous. What used to take a long time, which was to look at prior cases, so patients' prior biopsies was suddenly becoming instantaneous. So you could measure things more easily, annotate things more easily. So if you were interested in this region in the biopsy, you could measure it much more easily. You can link that information, and you can also see all the immunostains simultaneously side by side. So this was a huge 
benefit for patient care. Um, so scan slides were instantaneously available. There was no need to wait for them for delivery or bouldering or so before the slides were even available to the pathologist, they were already available digitally. The glass slides did not need to be delivered anymore if the pathologist didn't want them. So you were able to consult easily with colleagues, send them emails, send them information, request information, and even teach. It really, really important during the pandemic. So these are some of the benefits that we've already realized and several other institutes who have gone digital have witnessed similar improvements, improved workflows, direct interface to the lab information system, sharing cases with consultants and clinicians more easily, tumor boards, flagging cases, controls are instantaneously available. So digital slides improve turnaround time by automatically distributing that workload, going directly from the cover slip to the proper pathologist and have instantaneous access to these images and trial cases. Going to tumor board, so we have multiple conferences where we present digitally now. We've created research IRB sets now for different types of cancers. We can do consults more easily with colleagues around the world, not just within, within our institute. And we can now have access to daily interesting cases. So all the slides which are digitally available, they're now tagged to the patient. They are tagged to the diagnoses. So you can start to look at, you can see the patient is already multiplying. So we saw a dip during COVID where the slides, the number of slides went down. But even during this time, even during this time, we were able to see no, dif no big differences in terms of patient care. Pathologists had flexibility from working from remote locations in staffing. We didn't have to be in person face to face because we could do this on a monitor. Digital images were available prior to receipts of physical slides. There were days when pathologists were not coming to the hospital. And now, especially now, during the Omicron um, surge, we have several pathologists who are out because they were exposed or they had a kid who was exposed. But we've still been able to continue our clinical workflow because we have it digitally available, right? So once these are incorporated. There are some challenges with digital images. We have, because more pathologists were doing it, sometimes they were working from home. Internet connectivity is an issue. Potential need to, you have to buy new hardware, potentially new monitors. Some stains are harder to interpret in a digital format. For example, H. pylori, acid bacilli. Some stains are harder to interpret. For example, Congo Road, Congo Red. Um, and it, there is a downside to reduce personal interaction, right? So we, we've discovered that pathologists are also, you know, they want to meet other pathologists. So completely shut off during pandemic was not a good thing. So we soon opened it up. We soon allowed the flexibility for, for pathologists to work from home, but also work in the hospital. So what can you do, right? So we've talked about easy, easily sharing images, but once you have slides digitized, you can identify features like mitoses, you can quantify nuclei, you can synthesize this information, not just in the context of the pathology data, but other data, molecular data. So it's really opening up a lot of opportunities. Again, think about the integration of all these different devices and the uh, whole slide imaging scanners and the ability to directly have access to all the information. So once, so this is an example of a tool we are starting to use for breast cancer, so breast panel. So this is his estrogen receptor. So if I ask the pathologist in this audience, um, on these nuclei, you know, tell me how many of these are negative? How many of them are one plus? How many of them are two plus? How many of them are three plus? 
And I can guarantee you, each pathologist will have a different answer. And it's going to be an approximation. It might be even a range. It's 15 to 30 percent, one plus, whatever. And so, and plus, it'll take time. So, how does digital pathology improve patient care in this context? Which is something pathologists are doing manually. Most pathologists are doing this manually, right? If I told you that your answer, your if it's accurate, will dictate which drug this patient will get or not, and you and if you're wrong, even by 10%, the patient might get a different drug or a different treatment, then why wouldn't you want to get a tool like this, which allows you to be objective, which allows you to be more accurate and more efficient. So as a pathologist, one of the challenges we have in pathology is overworked pathologist, burnt out pathologist. We have more work than we can possibly do, right? If I ask the pathologist in the audience, what are some of the challenges for you? They will say, oh, I, my workload is too much. You know, I'm asked, I've been asked to do things in this same time and maybe 20% more. So wouldn't you want to, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to have access to tools like this, which allow you to do the tasks that would take, normally take you 20 minutes in under a minute, right? So that's really, one of the most powerful impacts on patient care, which most pathologists don't really appreciate it because this doesn't really, is, this, isn't, this is not really dictated by the quality of the HNE slide. This analysis can be done by itself. So you don't need to buy expensive high throughput big scanners. You can buy a small scanner and only digitize the slides that you need for this analysis. So that's one way for smaller labs with limited budget, go and get into the space for improving patient care. You might even consider if you have resource limited setting and you have five labs in one city, you might want to pool your resources and buy one small scanner for all the five labs where every breast cancer, ER, PR, is quantitatively analyzed by software. And again, this is, doesn't have to be the world's most expensive software. There are many types of software available which are freeware, which are open source. Those can be used, those can be validated. So again, just an example of how digital pathology and AI can positively impact patient care, right? So, so again, very easy to use these type of tools now if the slide is digitized. If it's not digitized, you cannot use this tool, right? And digitization doesn't mean necessarily also mean scanned images. You can also use a camera on your microscope and start using these types of tools um, allow, that allow you to not only analyze one immunostain, but more than one immunostain. You can overlay these tumors on top of each other. You can do research on tissue microarrays. You can set it up for automatic tumor detection or automatic counting of nuclei. So all these are possibilities. You can also start to think about how do we create opportunities for patients who are in places where they don't have access to subspecialists. How do we allow that accessibility to occur? So the digital pathology is a perfect way to do this. So this is an example of a consultation portal where anyone can log in and create a request for a consultant. Um, and there are several types of such tools available. You can also chat with the referring patients, chat with the coordinators. So, so when you look at this whole slide image, you have not only case information, but you also have access to the dashboard where you can see all your cases. You have access to different magnifications. You have access to camera, you have access to annotation tools. And one of the things I mentioned to you when I showed you those three monitors is you have access to 
build interfaces with AI tools. So if, let's say you're working with a company which has a new tool to count mitoses. So you can start to bring similar tools into your environment to allow you to do that. So you can see the image quality is, is incredible. So I, when I did this 15 years ago, the limitations used to be the interconnectivity, the internet, if the images were pixelated, it took a long time to load. But today we have cloud computing. We have all these powerful infrastructure setups which allows you to rapidly share images for consultation, do processing on the cloud. So it's really something which wasn't possible 15 years ago, even though the scanners were probably good enough at that time. So another example, you can see cases from all different types of scanners, not just A scanner, B scanner, or C scanner. So you can also program the computer to um, show you cases in different orders, different priorities. So on top of that, so let's say when you look at your work list as a pathologist, now we have tools that will allow pathologists to have pre-screening of their cases. So this is an example of a tool where pathologists can look at their work list, see their patients, and see that some of them may, and so these are all uh, different types of cases, right? Kidney, prostate, all these are, uh, so if you look at the prostate case, for example, this patient's prostate case has already been screened by the computer. And it's, there are six parts, prostate right apex to left base. So the computer has said, part one, right apex is likely malignant. There are other tags. This is, there is an IXC slide available for this case. This is probably out of focus. So all these are tools that will allow improvement of patient care because it will help the pathologist to, and provide them with a decision support tool. So they can see the, go into this slide individually, pull up the image and the computer will not only show them the case, but it'll also show them a heat map of where they think the cancer is. So again, I'm not saying every pathologist will use these tools, but what I'm saying is in the future, if you have digital slides, you'll be able to deploy such tools. You might need a tool not for prostate cancer, but for breast cancer or for colon cancer or for kidney allograft analysis or doing liver fibrosis analysis. There will be multiple applications coming to your workstation in the future. Some of them are already here. Just like when you look at your smartphone, you know, when I still remember when I first got my phone, there were a handful of applications and you had to buy them on your phone. Some of them came with the phone. But today, there are probably billions of apps on your available to you on your smartphone something which we take for granted. In the future, such tools will become commonplace for pathologists. You will go to an app store for pathology and buy these apps or rank these apps or collaborate with companies and build these apps. So again, going back to this, how is it helping patient care? All of these aspects, particularly building AI tools is already allowing this to happen. So when you think about pathology data, especially from the anatomical pathology, a lot of manual stuff, but a lot of information in slides, images, requisitions, blocks, images from an autopsy, images from electron microscopy, from different imaging modalities. So pathology is very heavy in image use. When you think about these, uh, uh, gigapixel whole slide images, all these images really digital pathology allows you to man manage this information, share these images, and then apply artificial intelligence on it. So 
in the future, your office may have multiple types of monitors, multiple types of information coming to you. If you're a breast pathologist, you might use a quantitative image analysis software. If you're a molecular pathologist and a breast pathologist, you might also do next-gen sequencing. So pathology information for pathologists to make an accurate and timely diagnosis is much more enhanced if the information is digitally available. So it's not just digital pathology. In the future, there will be no digital pathology. It'll all be pathology. But pathology will be digitized, not just images, but all the information around it, the molecular, molecular information as well. So where does it bring us? So if you look at our journey, we started in January 2017. We got the space. But today, we have pathologists. Like, this is an email from one of our GI pathologists. I want to share something exciting. The first picture is an H&E with IHC proven tumor focus, which I missed. The second picture is the same area where AI was able to locate the tumor. So this was missed. This is an IHC, which was received the next day. But pathologists pressed a button and was able to use AI to detect that tumor, which they missed prospectively. Again, this is the power of this technology. So we started in October 21, I mean, 2017. And in October 21, we are able to do things like this from which we could not do is on glass slides. We could not even imagine. So that is the positive impact on patient care. So overall, all these are advantages, right? Subspecialty consultation, biomarker testing, second opinion, covering pathologist, high quality patient diagnosis, and high quality data, which will continue to improve patient care by creating opportunities for research, AI and machine learning development, and creating assets, which are going to keep increasing as you look at efforts around the world. So pathology is transforming. We have opportunities. We do have challenges, but we also have many, many opportunities. And some of these opportunities come specifically from deploying these tools, deploying these tools for better patient care. We are, so new tools like digital pathology, image analysis, and deep learning are here. And transforming pathology and allowing pathologists to integrate this information with their lab information system, with their electronic medical records, and not just view pathology images in the context of that class slide, which was digitized, but also see it in the context of radiology, cardiology, nephrology, neuropathology. All these are fields which are interconnected with the specialist, not just pathologists, but radiologist. So when the slide is digitized, we're speaking a common language. With pathologists, we're speaking the common language with other clinical teams. And when you're making a diagnosis and you're counting cells, nuclei, mitoses, microorganisms, you're not doing it by guessing or estimating or being subjective. You are being accurate, objective, and you are able to have something which is reproducible. So if you are in Beijing and you use these tools, you're able to not only do this in real time, you're able to go beyond that. So especially during the pandemic, we saw, saw a big adoption jump for digital workflow. So our journey has continued in digital pathology and I've seen many other institutes, many other labs around the world starting to use more with digital pathology to help them with their practices, to help them with their workflows and their quality of their diagnosis. So overall, it has a positive impact on patient care. So the first uh, product for AI was approved in the United States in November of 2021. So this is PAGE, which received the first ever FDA approved approval for AI product in digital pathology for to aid as an aid in the primary diagnosis of prostate cancer. So if I do a search 
in uh, for digital pathology, I have so many results, right? 246 times. When I search for computational pathology, the number goes to three, three fourths. But when I do AI, you can still see a lot of different search results in Google. So with this, I'm going to stop and uh, I want to thank you all for your attention and I'll be glad to answer any questions. So thank you so much for inviting me and sharing, uh, allowing me to share my experience in digital pathology and how it improves patient care. Thank you so much. Well, that was a you know, very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Anil, I just want to know one thing. How could you detect that small foci of tumor? The case you showed towards the near last, how could you detect that small foci of tumor? Yeah, so the, so the what the pathologist did, we have a tool which allows you to use deep learning. So it takes that image and the pixels that are, you know, if you look at it, image, it's made up of pixels, millions and millions of pixels, gigapixels, right? So what the computer is doing is looking for changes in the pattern of those pixels. So, you know, lymphocytes, 10 lymphocytes have a specific pattern. So computer is comparing these pixel by pixel and it comes across this focus, which doesn't match a lymphocyte. It doesn't match the texture, it doesn't match the color, and it calls it out. And as you train the computer with specific examples of metastatic cancer, it gets even better. When, you, when the computer sees more and more examples, it gets even more and more better for this. So that's how they were able to see it. So we can see this in h and &E stain slides also. Like this, in was, this, this was only h and &E slide. There was right. no so immunostain. Immunostain came the next day. Uh, that's... Uh, that's AI applied, though we saw the key, key counts uh, in the AI, so that is okay. But this also in HE only, we can uh, pick up those foci. Yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah, okay. so today we have tools which will allow not on, not going into immunosuppressive, but on h &E slide alone, yeah. see how much stroma is there, how much cancer is there, how much necrosis is there. If you, if you use a drug, what are the changes because of that drug to the to that H and &E image? So okay. it's really powerful. It's really powerful. We will not get there and use this power unless we start exploring digital pathology as a way to practice pathology. Well, any questions from anyone, any of the participants? Uh, I can't see any questions. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Anil, for a very nice presentation. Thank you for updating us with the latest things. Um, so we now move on to our next speaker, Dr. Alina from USA. Well, she is now going to present us very interesting dermatology, I guess. It's a dermatological presentation. Game changers in dermatopathology. Okay, welcome, Dr. Dr. Alina. Please can share with me. Can you hear? I am sharing my screen. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am. We can see. We can hear. Okay, I'm trying. Uh, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Sorry. I, I really want to thank everyone for inviting me and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Just uh, let me get to the beginning of this presentation. Sorry, not the best way I'm getting back to the beginning so okay so it's 
Now for something a little bit uh, different uh, than Dr. Parwani was uh, discussing, I'm going to be uh, giving you kind of some practical new things, game changers in dermatopathology. pathology. And um, I've been in practice, uh, I'm a dermatologist, triple board certified in dermatology, dermatopathology and immunodermatology now for um, 22 years. And um, the majority of my practice was at the Mayo Clinic and I recently moved to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. I have no relevant disclosures. And with these new updates in dermatopathology, uh, these game changers, it's gonna help see uh, or bring your practice up to date and see what kind of impact these changes could have on your practice. I spend a lot of my time diagnosing and discussing the management of melanocytic lesions, particularly dysplastic atypical nevi. And I don't know how many of you um, struggle with this, but the biggest question that's been asked in the past couple of years is when you have a dysplastic uh, nevus with positive margins, the question that's been raised is that should this be re-excised or not re-excised? And this is something that has changed over the course of my career. When I finished my training in the 1990s, I came out thinking that uh, these atypical dysplastic nevi that had mild and moderate atypia should be re-excised with two millimeter margins and if they were severely atypical, then they should be managed similar to melanoma in situ and re-excised with uh, five millimeter margins. But thinking about dysplastic nevi has evolved during the course of my career. The Pigmented Lesions Subcommittee published a consensus statement in JAMA Dermatology in 2015 and uh, they said that if you have a dysplastic nevus with mild atypy and positive margins, then this lesion does not need to be re-excised. You can just monitor the biopsy site for repigmentation. If, however, you have a severely dysplastic nevus with positive margins, then that should be re-excised with five millimeter margins. And they suggested that if you have a moderately dysplastic nevus with positive margins, then perhaps that also does not need to be excised, but can also be monitored for repigmentation. But more data was needed. So a few years later, in 2018 in JAMA Dermatology, they um, published uh, this research. It was um, a multi-center retrospective uh, cohort study from nine US academic sites, looking at the outcomes and risk for the development of sub subsequent cutaneous melanoma from moderately dysplastic nevi, nevi that had positive uh, margins. Uh, the patients were uh, over the age of 18, they, had, uh, they looked at 467 biopsies from 438 patients. The mean follow-up time was about seven years. All of them had at least a three-year follow-up period. And what they found was that no biopsy site melanomas developed in uh, these sites. However, 100 of the patients or almost 23% developed a cutaneous melanoma at a separate site. And they had pretty good concordance uh, amongst the uh, dermatopathologists at the academic institutions. Uh, there was only disagreement in uh, 
uh, five of uh, the cases that they did a central review on. Uh, two of the cases were downgraded from moderate to mild atypia, and three were upgraded to, to uh, severely atypical and one to melanoma in situ. So what are the implications of this? Um, this means that probably uh, patients who have mild to moderate dysplastic nevi and a positive margin may not need to have a re-excision and they can just be followed up and uh, regularly looking for repigmentation at the biopsy sites. And they should have full skin exams because uh, those patients that had developed melanoma at a different site, the patients that had a higher risk of developing melanoma had two or more dysplastic nevi someplace else. And, um, at one, uh, and um, particularly if they had moderately dysplastic nevus, they were at a higher risk of developing melanoma elsewhere on their body. But there's a caveat to this, and that's that as a dermatopathologist, we need to have an adequate biopsy. Sometimes we can't make a clear, we cannot assess the atypia well if we have a partial or an incisional biopsy of a larger lesion. So the recommendations are that, and I try to educate the clinicians about this, is that if you have a suspicious lesion and you're worried that this could be something that is severely atypical or melanoma, do not do a partial biopsy of the lesion. Try to do an excisional biopsy with one to three millimeter margins so that we have a good specimen to look at. And I can go on forever on that, but, uh, uh, and, but we're gonna move on to, um, other things that are new in derm path, and that is um, another immunohistochemical stain. There are immunohistochemical stains for the mismatch repair proteins that can help us um, uh, see if a patient could potentially have Muir Torre syndrome. And the way that I've utilized this in um, my practice is that if I render a diagnosis uh, histologically of a sebaceous adenoma, sebaceous carcinoma, and sometimes a reticulated acanthoma with sebaceous differentiation, uh, and I want you to notice that I didn't say seb sebacioma or sebaceous epithelioma, and that's because when we published a large uh, study of all of our sebaceous lesions and uh, the results of the mis mismatch repair staining in um, it, the institution-wide Mayo Clinic. So that's all the sites where we looked at all the sebaceous neoplasms from Mayo Clinic Rochester, um, Florida, and Arizona. We found that the cases that were previously diagnosed as a sebaceous or sebaceous epithelioma, we would now reclassify as sebaceous carcinoma. So we put in this comment this sebaceous neoplasm may be associated with Muir-Torre syndrome, a variant of hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, HNPCC. If clinically indicated and the patient and patient consent is obtained, immunohistochemical stains and or microsatellite instability testing can be performed to further evaluate for defective DNA mismatch repair, a marker for HNPCC. And this whole comment was vetted by um, uh, the medical legal department. And basically it's just that you don't, the appropriate use criteria for this immunohistochemical stain is that it's not a reflex test. So when you have one of these sebaceous neoplasms, you're not just gonna automatically order these IHC stains. You're gonna go back to the clinician who will then discuss it with the patient and then come back to you and request the stains. And when the American Society of Dermatopathologists were surveyed, the majority of the survey respondents, over 90%, said that this is how they also um, recommended the test be ordered. And here's an example of um, a patient who had Muir-Torre syndrome. This was a sebaceous adenoma. 
Here you can see normal expression of MLH1, and here you can see loss of the nuclear immunoreactivity to MSH2, as well as MSH6, which is the most common pattern seen with these stains. Uh, the next most common pattern is the loss of MSH6, followed by PMS2 and MLH1 and uh, PMS2. And so usually when uh, the clinician gets these results, they will refer the patient to medical genetics uh, for further evaluation. Now there is a new melanocytic stain. I don't know how many of you have heard about this stain. It is the PRAM. I don't know how many of you are in the PRAM train or the PRAM bandwagon. It stands for preferentially expressed antigen and melanoma. It was isolated in patients who had metastatic melanoma. Now this is a very tricky stain positive stain should be interpreted if you see strong four plus diffuse nuclear positivity. There are pitfalls to the interpretation. For example, if it is a weak stain, it should be considered negative. You can't use it with the H&E alone you need another melanocytic marker, such as a melan-A and or a SOX-10. It doesn't uh, detect desmoplastic melanoma very well. 14% of benign nevi can be positive and 15% of solar lentigenes can be positive. Some epithelial neoplasms can also be positive and some unequivocal melanomas can have a negative PRAM staining. Where I like to use it is if I have an H&E &E and I've done a melanin, and a SOX10, I'm still trying to decide in this borderline lesion, is it severely dysplastic um, nevus versus melanoma? I use it if I am concerned that I might miss a nevoid melanoma. I use it uh, to help me make sure that it, this isn't a nodal nevus um, because the metastasis can be positive for PRAM and the nodal nevus can be negative if the primary tumor is positive for PRAM. And it may be helpful if I can't tell if the reexcision is uh, adequate on chronic sun damaged skin. So here is what I'm talking about. So here on the left is um, the melanin stain, and here's the pram stain. And this is what you like to see, and that is that the you can tell that this is melanoma in situ with both the melanin and the pram stain. The melanin is also picking up a benign dermal nevus, which is pram negative. But here I'm going to show you here's a benign dermal nevus that's pram positive, and here is um, melanoma that's SOX10 positive, but it was pram negative. So don't jump on this train quite yet. So don't, if you don't, if you haven't adopted the stain, uh, I would say uh, no worries because the jury is still out on uh, how useful this can be sometimes. I don't know how many of you have used the Merkel cell polyoma virus IHC stain, but here is a Merkel cell carcinoma and 80% uh, of Merkel cell carcinomas will stain with the Merkel cell polyoma virus. Uh, it's a nuclear stain and it's associated with a better prognosis. So that's why it can be useful. Some people also will use a P63 and if that's positive, it's thought to have a negative uh, prognosis. And the final IHC stain that I'm gonna talk about is the BAP1 and um, this uh, helps us uh, diagnose BAP1 uh, inactivated melanocytic tumor, BAPOMA, named after uh, the, Dr. Wiesner, Wiesner's nevus. And this can be tricky to identify clinically because it doesn't look like a melanocytic lesion. It's a melanotic, a skin colored dome shaped papule. And even histologically, um, you could miss that this is a melanocytic lesion. So you, 
So you always have to think about this. Um, if you see these epithelioid uh, cells in a sea of uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and um, there's loss of nuclear BAP1 expression in the epithelial cells, but sometimes people can mistake this for a histiocytic lesion or even an inflammatory lesion. And these are associated with a uh, BRAFT uh, mutation, and there's an association with uh, uveal melanoma. So what's new in DermPath? Well, really, the routine histology still reigns as king. The best special stain is really getting deeper levels initially. And knowing um, how useful the immuno stains are and being um, not indiscriminately ordering a bunch of immuno stains that just run up a big bill for a patient. So realizing which ones you need, when you need them to improve your diagnostic uh, capabilities and potentially uh, guide therapy. But always uh, I try to take into consideration healthcare costs because patients don't wanna get a big bill and that is a big consideration. So we are definitely in the molecular era in derm path and uh, molecular testing is useful for ambiguous and indeterminate lesions. For example, a uh, deep penetrating nevus, which can look worrisome uh, clinically because of uh, how darkly pigmented it is. It does arise in younger patients on the head and neck, upper extremities and trunk. It can sometimes look concerning histologically as well. The wedge-shaped architecture is pretty characteristic of it, but these heavily pigmented melanocytes and melanophages can sometimes be concerning because it's difficult to assess the nuclear atypia in this case. And sometimes I have to bleach the sections, but these can sometimes be atypical and there is an ind this intermediate or indeterminate risk that um, of uh, rare progression to melanoma in these cases. But molecular testing has been very helpful because instead of um, the BRAF mutation that you see in a common nevus, uh, deep penetrating nevi are characterized by mutations in beta catenin and MAP kinase. In atypical DPNs, if they have, um, if they are developing melanoma, when you do the molecular testing, you're gonna see increased chromosomal aberrations that you would see in a melanoma, such as loss of the uh, CD um, NK2A, TERP promoter mutations, point mutations. So that's when it can be very helpful. Molecular testing is also helpful in atypical spits nevi atypical spitz tumor and if you're worried that this is a spitzoid melanoma. Now Sophie Spitz was a brilliant pathologist who um, over 70 years ago raised the questions that we still ask of these lesions. And that is, uh, is a spitz nevis benign? And if it doesn't have atypia or mitoses, it is benign. Do you need to re-excise it? Well, usually it's nice if uh, some, somebody's worried that this is a spitz nevus, that they have um, taken this out um, uh, um, completely and not done a partial biopsy. But if it goes to the margins, it's split. Half of the pediatric dermatologists I know will not re-excise and half will re-excise. If it is an atypical spitz nevus or atypical spitz tumor, then definitely uh, re-excision with conservative margins is important. But the patient's a kid, it's not melanoma. Yes, uh, spitzoid melanomas are very common in kids. 
if the patient's an adult, it's not a spitz nevis, um, probably not. It's more likely to have some atypia, some atyp so it would be an atypical nevus or atypical spitz tumor. Spitz nevi turn into melanoma, probably not. They probably started out as a spitzoid melanoma. Molecular studies are definitely helpful um, to distinguish between atypical spitz nevus, atypical spitz tumor, spitzoid melanoma, and if the sentinel lymph node biopsy is positive or if it's melanoma, usually these are associated with a good prognosis. So this is how I categorize spitz nevus. It's not that they evolve from spitz nevus to spitzoid melanoma, but I use these categories when I'm diagnosing um, spitzoid neoplasms. It's either gonna be a benign spitz nevus, an atypical spitz nevus, severely atypical spitz nevus, atypical spitz tumor, severely atypical spitz tumor, or a spitzoid melanoma. And I will use molecular studies on the, anything, if I suspect that it could be a melanoma or it uh, has uh, severe atypia and mitosis, something that's in this spectrum. And I'll either do the fish for melanoma, a CGH or next gen sequencing, and I will choose one of these based on the type of specimen that I have received. And uh, I, I factor in cost because sometimes I can get the next gen sequencing covered by a company that performs it. And so, uh, whereas um, I can't do that for the FISH or the CGH. So this is our current paradigm for looking at atypical spitz neoplasms in the molecular era. And that's in contrast to melanomas and the majority of them, 95% are associated with the chromosomal aberration, like the loss of CDNK2A or TERP promoter mut mutations or other point mutations, spitz uh, neoplasms, about 50% of them are associated with chimeric fusion proteins and no, no TERP promoter mutations. And kinase fusions, most of them are indolent in these spitz neoplasms. And they've provided a framework for better understanding of spitz tumor development because these fusion proteins are detected along the entire spectrum of spitz neoplasms from benign to malignant. So they're thought to represent an early oncogenic event. The other thing that has been useful with the use of next-gen sequencing and molecular testing in these um, lesions is that we are better able to correlate the clinical pathologic findings with the genomic findings. Such, here's an example. So the atypical spitz tumor that has an ALK fusion tends to look like an exophytic polypoid lesion with fusiform or plexiform nests. Not only are we able to kind of correlate the histologic uh, features with uh, the genomic findings, but um, this may help us uh, with prognosis as well as uh, therapeutic targets in the future. So in summary, I think molecular testing is appropriate um, when a diagnosis of melanoma is in question, especially if you are worried that something is melanoma, but it doesn't meet the conventional criteria for melanoma. It's an ambiguous or indeterminate melanocytic neoplasm, such as an atypical spitz neoplasm, a melanocytic tumor of uncertain malignant potential, or an atypical deep penetrating nevus. Um, the molecular testing assists in diagnosis, prognosis, and potentially treatment. But you do have to, again, consider uh, the cost like you do when uh, you're ordering a lot of uh, immunohistochemical stains for the patients. So it needs to be used uh, appropriately and wisely. There's another aspect to molecular, the molecular era, and that's we now have prognostic molecular tests for melanoma and uh, cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinomas. And this stems from the fact that when a clinician has a patient with an invasive melanoma, the first question that's raised is, um, 
the physician and the clinician want to know, is this going to be a high-risk melanoma? And there is prognostic uncertainty in melanoma. The gold standard to date has been sentinel lymph node uh, biopsies. And um, there are some patients with thinner melanomas that have a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy that then wound up with metastatic disease later on. So uh, now we have gene expression testing to identify high risk on a molecular level. And the value of a prognostic test is to help with staging accuracy and management of patients who uh, could receive more frequent follow-up, imaging adjuvant therapy, and maybe uh, potentially in the future enrollment in clinical trials, which they otherwise couldn't because they have a thinner melanoma. I had the great fortune of um, working with uh, Dr. Mavis for the past eight years, uh, and we worked on a test to identify patients with a low risk of sentinel lymph node metastasis that could forego um, a sentinel lymph node biopsy. We looked at all the clinical and pathologic variables, and the only ones of significant were the age and the Breslow depth. And then we looked at 108 different genes and only eight were significant. And these genes are involved in angiogenesis and cell adhesion. And so we now have this test, it's called the CPGEP test or Merlin assay that can be performed on um, uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue and it's a RNA based PCR test. It has been, uh, validated in thousands of patients in the United States and in Europe. There's two risk stratifications, low risk, which would be that the risk of sentinel lymph node metastasis is less than 5% and the patient can forgo a sentinel lymph node biopsy or high risk. And um, patients who have um, T1 melanoma, 80, about 80% do not need to undergo a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And patients who have T2 melanoma, about 40% do not need to undergo a sentinel lymph node biopsy. This is not a test that you would use in patients who have T3 disease. Um, again, it's performed consistently through all the validation studies in the United States and Europe, and they are ongoing. Every patient who uh, was part of the study, had to also have a sentinel lymph node biopsy. So that's why we have excellent follow-up and the follow-up goes back for um, years, as long as the Mayo Clinic database has existed. We've also compared this uh, test to the um, Australian um, Melanoma Institute of Australia nomogram, and it performs um, a little bit better than the, than the nomogram in terms of uh, prognosis. And this is how we would use the test. Here's a patient who is 62, has a melanoma on the scalp, has um, a Breslow thickness of 0.9 millimeters. Uh, there are two mitoses. This is a T1B lesion. Um, we run the test. Five days later, the patient gets a result that it's low risk. So highly unlikely to have a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy, saving him any uh, morbidity and cost from having um, the sentinel lymph node biopsy, which was performed and we get the results uh, three weeks later that it is negative. So where are we with this CPGEP uh, test, which is a new test um, and it can potentially reduce sentinel lymph node uh, biopsies at a rate of 80% for T1 and 42% in T2 patients. Independent validation studies in Europe and the United States show a consistent performance of this model. There's ongoing validation studies both in Europe and the United States, and there's uh, ongoing prospective uh, clinical trials um, throughout various centers in the United States. And we're specifically also looking at patients that have a negative sentinel lymph node biopsy, but have a high risk a CPGEP test to see if th these are patients that need more frequent surveillance um, 
ultrasounds and could benefit from adjuvant therapy. And these, this is all the literature published on this test so far. There's also a 40 GEP profile test to predict metastatic risk in localized high-risk cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas to see if um, these are squamous cell carcinomas that can metastasize and may be also benefit from further intervention and surveillance. This study was a prospectus study published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology looking at uh, 586 cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas from 23 independent centers. This test is also done on formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. And the, uh, the gene expression profile was developed using a discovery cohort and validated in a separate independent cohort. And the 40 genes, um, they uh, narrowed them down from 150 genes using um, deep learning. And uh, this is a test that should be considered in high-risk cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas in any patient that has one or more of these high-risk features, tumor size greater than two centimeters, depth greater than four millimeters, or in the subcutaneous fat, moderately or poorly uh, differentiated SCC with perineural invasion, a recurrent tumor, particularly if the patient is immunocompromised and the lesion is at a site of prior radiation or chronic inflammation. And there's three uh, risk stratifications, low risk, high risk, and highest risk. And um, the three-year metastasis-free survival rates go down from 90% to uh, 44%, depending on their risk. This is something uh, that's also new and is on everyone's mind, uh, COVID-19-associated dermatologic manifestations. This. Uh, was published in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology in uh, late 2020. Uh, it's from the International Registry of 716 patients from 31 countries. And I'm gonna make it relevant to what you would see uh, histopathologically. So, um, because many of these things wouldn't get biopsied, but most of the cutaneous uh, manifestations presented simultaneously to or after other COVID-19 symptoms, but 12% occurred before other COVID-19 signs. So keep that in mind. Most common reaction was like a viral exanthem, morbilliform, urticarial. Um, there were also a few that had vesicular or pagulosquamous lesions, but the lesions that were studied most on histopathology was um, the most, uh, benign lesion, which is um, the perniosis presentation. And although it's COVID toes, it could also be COVID hands. So this occurred in younger patients, predominantly on the feet, but can also occur on the hands. Uh, patients were symptomatic um, with pain, burning, or pruritus. There was no prior history of perniosis. It occurred later in the course of the disease. The, these patients did not have um, uh, COVID symptoms and many did not test positive for COVID. It had a pretty benign presentation lasting anywhere from a week to uh, four weeks. And clinically it looked like perniosis, histologically it looked identical to perniosis, which is a lymphocytic vasculitis. You can see superficial and deep perivascular and periadnexal lymphocytic inflammation. It's not really a true vasculitis and there is necrosis of the overlying epidermis and separation along the subepidermal uh, junction as a re result of the necrosis. The least common but the most concerning presentation was acral rediform purpura looking like uh, ready, your rediform purpura livido reticularis. This often was asymptomatic as well. Uh, it tended to occur in older patients on the extremities and buttocks after other COVID-19 symptoms. These patients were in the hospital. Majority of them had ARDS and there was a 10% mortality associated with them because 
uh, the same process that was going on the skin was going on elsewhere. Um, these patients had findings that looked like a systemic hypercoagulable state with an elevated D-dimer and um, the biopsy looked like an occlusive vasculopathy. You can see uh, posse inflammatory intraluminal occlusion by fibrin within uh, the vessels, not much surrounding inflammation, producing these changes, which look like DIC. Uh, Dr. Magro's group um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering detected spike glycoprotein and membrane protein expressed within the endothelial cells, but the viral RNA in the endothelium was negative in these cases that she wrote up. More recently, um, clinical pathologic correlation of the cutaneous uh, COVID-19 vaccine reactions were published. It was a registry-based study, also in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology. Keep in mind that 58 out of 803 cases of COVID-19 cutaneous vaccine reactions um, were performed. So only 58 out of, out of a 803 cases had a biopsy. The most common reaction pattern was uh, coined vaccine-related eruption of papules and plaques, which really looked like an eczematous uh, dermatitis or papulosquamous eruption. It showed spongiosis um, with occasionally interface dermatitis, dermal edema, and a mixed dermal infiltrate with eosinophils overlapping with the next most common reaction, which was a dermal hypersensitivity reaction, which could either present as uh, a delayed uh, local um, reaction, uh, a local injection site reaction, urticarial eruptions, or a morbilliform eruption. Another eruption that was common was um, BP-like eruption, and many of the patients had positive immunofluorescence testing or a lichen planus-like eruption that mimicked lichen planus-like drug reaction with eosinophils in the dermal infiltrate. There were patients that developed a neutrophilic dermatosis, which was sweets-like, leukocytoclastic vasculitis. There were um, patients that developed perniosis, chillblains, uh, cosmetic filler reactions, which is a type of delayed uh, hypersensitivity reaction, and flares of existing conditions such as uh, zoster, uh, herpes simplex, rosacea, as well as um, single reports of Stevens-Johnson syndrome, erythema multiforme, granulomatous dermatitis that looked like GA or interstitial granulomatous dermatitis, a tattoo sarcoidal reaction, and new onset psoriasis. And believe it or not, I've seen at least uh, a patient who had every one of these uh, findings post-COVID. In addition to COVID, um, we are using a lot more immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy for, to treat cancer. These are your um, CTLA-4, PD-1, PDL-1 inhibitors, and they give you a wide range of cutaneous reactions um, that look like a textbook of derm path. So it's really important to think about uh, whether or not a patient is on one of these treatments in order to be able to diagnose uh, these patients accurately and intervene, um, because sometimes um, on requisition forms, you may not get the history that the patient is on one of these uh, treatments. So these patients can also get a morbilliform and urticarial eruption, eczematous dermatitis, a psoriasiform dermatitis, a neutrophilic dermatosis, sarcoidal granulomatous dermatitis and interface dermatitis. They can present as having an immunobullous disorder, Grover's vasculitis, paniculitis, alopecia areata, acneiform folliculitis, vitiligo-like leukoderma, radiation-associated dermatitis, and sclerodermoid reactions. And when patients first started going on these drugs, the only thing that I remember hearing was that they were developing uh, lesions of, uh, that looked like a KAs, squamous cell carcinoma, squamous papillomas, and eruptive uh, pyogenic granulomas. So 
usually if I um, diagnose this, um, um, I will discuss these patients with the hematologist oncologist to uh, figure out what is the best way to manage uh, these patients so that they conti can continue taking their medication. Because usually if they have one of these um, reactions, uh, the treatment has been beneficial to treat their underlying malignancy. And finally, I'm gonna end with um, uh, what everybody has been talking about, and that is uh, the digital era and how it relates to dermatopathology, which has been slower to adopt uh, AI. The majority of studies that use AI in dermpath have been based on whether a diagnosis or feature is present or absence. And AI has been useful and works well in very common entities. So algorithms uh, have been trained to recognize BCC, dermal levi, and seborrheic keratoses at an accuracy of greater than 99%. I wouldn't want to tell the next study to uh, our surgeons, but AI can support intraoperative consultation during, during most surgery. And a recent study also demonstrated sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 94% for the detection of BCCs in most slides. But as I said, that in derm path um, compared to other um, pathologies, subspecialty areas and other areas in medicine like radiology, AI is uh, in a more early stage of development. Although at Mayo, we have uh, digitized all the slides and they are on the electronic medical record and many of the dermatopathologists uh, do remote uh, readout and teaching. I look forward to being able to use more AI in my practice because I do think that it will help uh, triage cases, uh, decreasing turnaround time, helping me prioritize uh, workload and workflow efficiency, trying to um, identify the more challenging cases that may need further testing or consultation. AI is being evaluated for its potential to help in the classification of melanocytic neoplasms, reducing inter-rater discordance in the interpretation of these lesions. But that's one of the barriers to AI in their path. Another one is the lack of digital data because of high cost and disruptive changes in workflow that prevent large laboratories from converting to a digital workflow. And then the performance of AI depends on validity of data sets. And typically the concordance rate amongst dermatopathologists is poor for these atypical melanocytic lesions. Um, a lot of the ones that I talked about and distinguishing uh, between them and melanoma. And so the training data sets need to be concordant. We also have a lot of different uh, nuanced conditions that require CPC to arrive at the final diagnosis. Uh, so therefore the classification of the myriad of diagnoses in dermatopathology and thinking like a dermatopathologist is, um, may not be a re reality right now, but I look forward to um, helping me have a more efficient um, practice in the future. And so I'd like to summarize, we talked about dysplastic nevi and uh, that you don't need to re-excise mild or moderately atypical nevi, just severely uh, atypical nevi, but the caveat is that you have to have a really good biopsy specimen, not an incisional specimen of a partial lesion that may not be representative of the entire specimen. I talked about IHC stains to aid in the diagnosis of near Tourette syndrome to help prognosticate Merkel cell carcinoma, a new melanocytic marker, um, PRAM and uh, BAP1, the molecular age and derm path, including some prog new prognostic CPGEP tests in malignant melanoma and squamous cell carcinoma, COVID-19, um, both the cutaneous manifestations of the infection as well as to the vaccines, cutaneous toxicities to checkpoint inhibitors and digital uh, dermatopathology. And I thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. This is uh, my uh, lovely uh, family, um, my husband and uh, three children. One is an aspiring ballerina and the other one, a hockey player. And I can't forget my dog, Rosie.
that was very interesting uh, dr alina yeah, yeah the spectrum of uh, dermatological lesions in covid patients in vaccinated patients that was a uh, quite interesting and of course the rest of the things yes uh, an updated system it was all very very interesting uh, i welcome anyone for questions if you are unable to unmute please type it in the chat box any questions for dr alina okay dr alina we are also looking forward to working with ai as you are also expecting ai to assist us thank you dr alina for a wonderful presentation thank uh, you we, we now move on to our next speaker dr michael uh, the will give us a keynote speech on breast cancer and the perioperative window dr michael the stage is yours sir Thank you. No, that's not it. Please share your. I am trying to. Sorry. Yes, sir. Ah. <sighs> Hi, Dr. Elitsky. Can you uh, see green button? Share screen. Bottom of your Don't screen. Don't see a green button. Just a second. So can you maximize your screen? I do not see a green button. Looking for it. Oh, there's the green button. And the paper I want to show is. <sighs> okay. Can yes, you see sir. if. Uh, please make it full screen, sir. And how do I do this? Is that better? Right, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry for the confusion here. Uh, yeah, I am uh, Michael Retsky. I'm an associate professor at University College London, and I'm going to be discussing breast cancer and a perioperative window. This project was funded by NIH and Coleman Foundation. Uh, there's one more conflict of interest potential that I have to list. There was a patent uh, pending that was just submitted last week. A, a book was published by Thomas Kuhn in 1962. This uh, was uh, the structure of scientific revolutions. And just a second, let me get microphone set up. Okay, this should be a little quieter. Uh, this, this book caused a lot of controversial issues. He talked about science having four phases. There was a pre-paradigm phase, normal science, crisis, and then a scientific revolution. He said uh, when a project is new, when science is new, the researchers could not totally agree on what were the methods and what were the uh, theories and uh, what's going on. And they kept doing things. And uh, after a while, they got to the point where there was some consensus among the scientists. They, just, they agreed on how to conduct science in this field, uh, how, what were the theories, 
and textbooks were written. This is now called normal science. It could go on for a very long time, but occasionally in a normal science project, data are presented that are not explainable by the normal science. These are anomalous data, and this can cause a crisis uh, if you can't explain it. This can go one of two ways. It can go back to science if someone could uh, make a small reinterpretation of normal science and the anomaly will just be absorbed into normal science. Uh, but sometimes this can go on for a very long time in the, in the crisis phase and it never does get back to normal science. And Kuhn called this a scientific revolution or a paradigm shift. Uh, my colleague uh, Romano Demichelli and I edited a book published in 2017 on perioperative inflammation as a triggering origin of metastasis development. Uh, this was uh, published under, was advertised on the front page of the New York Times uh, right after the presidential election. Seeing your name on the front page of the New York Times is something that doesn't happen every day. The foreword to this book was written by Robert Weinberg, who a very well-known cancer biologist. And he had two uh, comments that I am going to briefly mention that he said that if this is demonstrated definitively, leads to the notion that this is likely to be accepted reluctantly by many in the clinical oncology community, that Primary tumor resection does not provide an undiluted benefit to the breast cancer patient regarding long-term survival. And then Weinberg went on to say, this is likely to profoundly influence future surgical oncology and post-surgical treatment protocols. This project started a long time ago. I can tell you when, it was 1993. I was attending a breast cancer conference in Europe. I don't even know what city it was. And out in the hallway outside the lecture hall, I saw a poster presented by Romano Demichelli from Milan National Cancer Institute. And these were data I had never seen before. I had recently made a, a career change from experimental physics research to cancer research. But I was pretty much aware of what was going on in the world of oncology. And uh, I saw these data presented by Demi Kelly it showed bimodal relapse pattern. This was a very well-known database from Milan, 1,173 patients treated by mastectomy only. This was well before the time of conventional adjuvant chemotherapy routinely used. And I'll just describe this in a short form. You'll see a lot more about this Milan data later on. There was a sharp peak at about a year and a half and then a minimum at about four years. And then it started up again with a broad shallow peak at 60, 70 months with a long tail extending to over 15 years. This has now been identified in over 21 databases from US, Europe, and Asia. There are more than 21, but I stopped counting at that point. Okay, these are Demi Kelly's data in relapse hazard format for the Milan data for the postmenopausal patients in the Milan data. What you see here is there's a sharp peak at about 18 months, a minimum of about 48 months, and then it started up with a shallow peak, 60, 70 months. There is a, a, a smaller peak at about 100 months. We don't know if that's noise or it could be important. Uh, relapse hazard is the probability of entering a period of time, three months in this case, entering that time with uh, no relapses and undergoing a relapse in that point. So 0 0.03 means that 3% of the patients that enter this window, the three month window, undergo a relapse. Now these are the same data, but for the premenopausal patients in the Milan data, and it's pretty much the same, except that first peak seems to show some structure. There was a 10-month, a sharp 10-month peak, 
and a 30 month peak. And then you still see that 50, 60 month peak. And then that noise at about 100 months. These are the same patients, but presented in the more familiar disease free survival format. Bonadonna Valagusa et al. Bon Bonadonna was the, he died a few years ago. He was the person who first used multiple drugs in adjuvant chemotherapy or breast cancer. And Panucha Valagusa has been the database manager since that project started. And I must say, I have seen a lot of breast cancer databases and I trust these data and much of that is due to the presence of Panucha Valagusa. So what you see here is that 100% at 100 of the patients are disease-free at time zero. By definition, there is a rapid fall off, and then it seems to form a plateau. It seems to flatten out about five years, and then it seems to start up again with another shallower relapse rate, and it goes on to 15 and more years. This was published in the New England Journal, 1995. Uh, these are data from Bernie Fisher. I was attending a, an ASCO conference while I was intensely studying the Milan database and someone flashed this figure and I could immediately see the same bimodal relapse pattern in Fisher's data as I saw in the, in the Milan data. Let me tell you what I see here. These are disease-free survival, patients treated with surgery only. All patients are 100% disease-free at time zero. And they're grouped by nodes positive. The curve on top is for zero nodes positive, and the one on the bottom is for more than 12 nodes positive. And I'll tell you what I see here, looking at that top curve with zero nodes, uh, there are relapses in the first three years, and then it seems to reach a plateau with few relapses. About 10% of the patients relapse in that first three-year period, and then few relapse from years three to five, six, five years. And then there's a shallow drop-off again from, from 60 months down to 96 or 100 months, and then it flattens out. Uh, for a zero node patients, simply removing the primary tumor, 80% of the patients are cured. They will not have a relapse. But of those 20% that relapse, 10% relapse in that first three year period, then there are a few relapses and then it starts up again with shallow relapses out to 10 years and more. Now going down to the more than 12 node population, you got the same thing going on, but the numbers are far uh, more dramatic. The relapses in that first three period, first three month period is the same as for the zero node population, but the quantity is much larger. It looks like about 85% of the patients relapse in that first three year period. Then there's a period with few relapses, and then it starts up again at about 60, 70 months and goes down to 100 months. It's really the same thing as zero node, but the numbers are far different. Whereas here, you get 10% of the relapses in the first three years for zero nodes, you get 85% relapses in the first three months of the more than 12 nodes. Something is going on here, and it looks very much like the Milan data. And uh, I happen to, uh, Fisher died at uh, age 100 a few years ago. I happen to know him fairly well. We were on first name basis and I totally trust their data. So we have two databases that I totally trust, the Milan database and the Fisher database saying essentially the same thing. This was not explainable with this continuous growth model that has guided early detection and therapy for many years. Uh, Dan McKelly and I decided to collaborate Sorry, there's something going on. Uh, Dan McKelly and I decided to collaborate. Uh, I have a background in experimental physics. I have a PhD in experimental physics, and I made a career change into cancer research in about 1982. I was working at Hewlett Packard, and a friend of mine's wife was diagnosed with cancer. 
and this friend, for some crazy reason, he wanted to set up a little study group to work with the physician treating his wife and seeing if we can come up with some help. I mean, it was a, we ended up meeting once a week, Tuesday night in the physician's office, uh, Jack Spear was a physician. And uh, we just hit it off. We, we had a good time and Spear was explaining cancer to us, giving us papers to read. And I must say, I got more interested in cancer research and in physics research. And I ended up making a career change over five years. So I have a background in experimental physics, which turns out to be a very good resource for doing this kind of work. At any rate, then McKelly and I decided to collaborate and this describes our collaboration. Uh, I was pretty, uh, pretty competent in the use of computer simulation to study cancer growth. So what we decided to do was that I was gonna take the Milan database, the Bonadonna Bellagusa day, and the growth model that Dan McKelly proposed, oops, uh, Dan McKelly, uh, he has an MD, PhD. He did a lot of work with animal models. And he said the simplest growth model for an animal, for a human or an animal model, would be a cancer cell that is malignant, but it's in a dormant state, possibly dormant. And it can stay that way for a variable period of time. And then it starts to divide and it gets to a, a point where it gets to be about a millimeter in size or a million cells and it uh, can't go any further until you get a, a blood supply from the host angiogenesis. And after that possible dormant state, it can grow again and become a detectable and lethal sized tumor. So my, my project was to take a Demi Kelly's model in the Milan database and try and figure out what those various relapse peaks represented. Okay, hey, uh, this is what I found, and I'll describe it to you. This is superimposed upon the premenopausal database from Milan, and the 10-month peak correspond to surgery-induced angiogenesis. They were avascular micrometastases uh, sitting in a dormant state, and something happened at surgery to induce them to go into angiogenesis, and they showed up as relapses in about 10 months. The 30-month peak corresponded to single dormant cancer cells that were in a dormant state, as I say, and that surgery somehow or other caused them to start dividing, and they showed up as relapses at 30 months. These are iatrogenic, these two relapses modes are iatrogenic. They are caused somehow or other by the surgery induced activity. These late relapses were not synchronized to surgery. So that's what I found from the computer simulation. And you're probably wondering how I could figure out that surgery can induce something. Well, I gotta show you one more figure here. This was uh, in 1989, I was visiting professor in Bill McGuire's laboratory at the University of Texas, San Antonio. McGuire is the person who first proposed that, uh, that uh, hormones, estrogen and progesterone could be prognostic factors or, or are prognostic factors in breast cancer. And this led to the use of tamoxifen, which was a major improvement in, in breast cancer. At any rate, uh, McGuire had a database that included hormone receptors, and he knew that I had done some work with prognostic factors in breast cancer using computer simulation, and he wanted me to see if I could add the hormone receptor values to my prior computer simulation and come up with what the prognostic report would, would be. Uh, it was a problem. I, I had a six month appointment with, with McGuire and a, the hospital. Pardon me. The, uh, the project was a total failure. Four months into the project, I got absolutely nowhere. 
It wasn't working out at all and couldn't find out why. I had to go to McGuire and, and complain and, and uh, an embarrassment that somehow or other it didn't work out. And I don't know why. So McGuire called in the person who developed his database and he found out in a few minutes that one of the columns I was given was mislabeled. The data, the data that I was told was date of relapse was actually the date that the patient last saw the oncologist. So uh, McGuire said, you can't finish the project in two months. Do whatever you want for the extra two months of your appointment. So what I did was I, I spent time in the library, the medical library at San Antonio. It was a beautiful facility. And I was interested in getting data on untreated cancer growth. This was at a time, this is 1989. This is at a time when physicians would watch and wait uh, for a patient who had an active cancer. They would not rush in and do surgery or start treating right away. They could do watchful waiting. I, I published these, paper, these data in Medical Hypotheses, 1990. This was one, one uh, of those data that I found extraordinarily interesting. This was a case report published by Smithers in Radiology, 1968. This was a case report of a 16-year-old boy who was diagnosed with an osteosarcoma. And what Smithers did is he did nothing for the first seven months except take images, x-ray images of the 16-year-old boy's lung. Uh, osteosarcoma traditionally relapses to the lung, so Smithers just wanted to see what was going on. So he took x-rays, four or five x-rays, four x-rays over the period of seven months and saw nothing until at one point at the seventh month, they saw, he saw this tumor start to grow and then he watched the tumor grow for another year, and then they removed it. What was really interesting to me was that when the tumor was just visible at this point at seven months, it happened to be at the time when they amputated the leg. This was really interesting. What does this mean? What was it saying? Is this a coincidence that the amputation occurred just when the, that uh, your lung metastasis uh, first appeared? Or did the amputation cause the relapse? It was an astounding situation. I couldn't decide at it. I spent hours staring at this figure, finally came to the conclusion that it is very unlikely that the amputation happened coincidentally at the same time that the uh, metastasis was first seen. I came to the conclusion that somehow or other, the amputation caused the metastasis to form. It does not say how often this happened. It could happen one in a hundred times, or it could happen 99 in a hundred times. You can't tell from these data, but it certainly looked to me like like the amputation of surgery coincided with the time of when that first uh, vision of the metastasis appeared. And it seemed to me that it probably caused it. Any rate, so let me get back to what I was doing. I was studying these, these data from Milan and this first peak was too sharp to be explained by any any computer simulation. I was able to do this, this later relapse peak. It was, it was shallow, easy to do with computer simulation that I've been doing for years and years. But this was far too sharp to be explained by the usual stochastic uh, uh, simulation. But if I use surgery-induced angiogenesis, or if I use surgery-induced tumor growth starting at the time of surgery, it could easily explain surgery-induced angiogenesis at 10 months and surgery-induced single cell activity at 30 months. So that's what I found. Uh, these early relapses at 10 months and 30 months can't be explained by the same 
mechanism that I used for the late relapses. Something had to happen at surgery to cause these early relapses, and that's what I found. So, like it or not, that's what the results were. So this was published in Medical Hypothesis 1990. If anybody wants a copy of this paper, it's available or contact me, I'll send you a copy. So just to come up with quantitative results of the computer simulation, that early dominant peak was composed of two previously unreported relapse modes that are surgery correlated. Something happens at the time of surgery to cause the starting of those uh, events. And 20% of premenopausal node positive patients undergo this relapse mode. Key hospital. Sorry. Uh, 20% of premenopausal node positive patients undergo that relapse mode. That's five to one node positive to node negative and two to one premenopausal compared to postmenopausal. And it turns out that most relapses are in that category. 50 to 80% of relapses in the Milan database are iatrogenic and present at that 30 month and 10 month peaks. And this increases, it increases with, uh, sorry, my phone is going on. It increases with uh, tumor size and nodes positive. And that late peak from 50 to 200 months is more or less the natural history of breast cancer. And the benefit of surgery to reduce metastasis first appears at five or six months. Okay, I've looked at a lot of other cancers. I, my eye is very well accustomed to see the biomodal relapse patterns. And I can look at data and I can see it, whereas if I had not had this experience, I would not be so cognizant of that. Every cancer I've looked at has it. These are case reports or large databases where I could clearly see a bimodal relapse pattern. It looks like that happens in all the cancers I've seen. I've looked at a lot of them. Pancreatic melanoma, lung cancer, prostate, on and on. Turns out I was looking up a paper in this uh, book, uh, Breast Cancer Controversies and Management, published in 1994. And uh, one of my friends, one of my colleagues, Michael Baum, had published a paper in there. So I was up in the library at Harvard looking at this book and ran across another chapter in that book that caught my interest, uh, Irving Ariel, Historical Review of Breast Cancer Treatment. Ur Ariel looked at comments from Celsus and Galen of 2000 years ago. These are Roman and Greek scientists and physicians. And these comments I've been translated through several languages, so I don't guarantee that the exact wording is proper, is correct, but this is what it is. First, Celsus, first there was the Cacoethes. Cacoethes are considered small but obvious tumors. This is a term that's not used today, but that's, that was used in prior years. First, there was a cacoethes and carcinoma without ulceration, then the fungating ulcer. We're talking about a staging configuration here. None can be removed, but the cacoethes, the rest are irritated by every method of cure. The more violent the operations, the more angry they grow. Well, I've heard surgeons talking about cancer being angry or physicians, cancer physicians. After excision, it recurs, bringing with it the cause of death, whereas at the same time, by using no extirpation, you can protract the life, notwithstanding the disorder to an extreme old age. It was extremely interesting. And then Gallen said something very similar. They have often cured this disease in early stages, but after it has grown to a notable size, no one has cured it with surgery. This was remarkable to me. I, it sounds like these guys, Celsus and Galen, had seen the same data that I had seen. It can't be, but that's what it looked like. And they were able to cure patients without benefit of patient, of, of uh, pain control 
or infection control. This was astounding to me. Uh, what's going on? Sorry about this. Okay, so I'm asking the question, can this explain some clinical observations in breast cancer? These effects that I'm talking about are so large, they should show up if you know what to look for. And I found four items that can be in that category, and we published papers describing all these four uh, situations. First of all, adjuvant chemotherapy really works well for premenopausal node positive patients. And that would make sense. According to the computer simulation, premenopausal node positive patients have very rapid growth right at the time of surgery. Uh, the tumors are sitting in an avascular micrometastasis state, and they start to grow rapidly right at the time of surgery. That's when Bonadonna found out was the best time to treat patients right after surgery. And paper was published in 2004. My usual colleagues of uh, Rashevsky, Bill Rashevsky, by the way, I was diagnosed with stage 3C colon cancer, and Bill Rashevsky was my medical oncologist. Uh, Panucha Valagusa and Dema Kelly, Bonadonna. Bonadonna was the uh, director of the uh, Milan National Cancer Institute, and Judah Folkman. I was on Folkman staff at Harvard Medical at the time. And Folkman, who has done 30 years in research in, uh, in angiogenesis, I believe this, and, and Bana had done 30 years of, of designing cancer therapies, and he also believed it. So Bonadonna and Folkman agreed that this could be an explanation for why adjuvant chemotherapy works particularly well for premenopausal node-positive patients. And another situation is that mammography works better for women age 50 to 59 than for age women age 40 to 49. And this caused a real controversy in the world of mammography. It was called the mammography wars. Any rate, uh, I looked into it and I thought this could be explained by what I described in the past few minutes. Uh, published a number of papers. This is one paper from 2005. About a week before this paper was to be published, I was at one of the Folkman lab meetings Friday morning at 9 a.m. and happened to be sitting next to a, uh, a writer, Amy Marcus. She was a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter from the Wall Street Journal. Folkman didn't like reporters in general, but I guess he had known Amy Marcus and he gave her a special invitation to attend one of the lab meetings. And Amy was just happened to be sitting next to me and she said, what are you working on? I said, well, next week we're publishing a paper explaining that we can, we can explain why mammography works better for women postmenopausal than postmenopausal. And the paper is gonna come out in a week. And it's, it's, the relation is that surgery seems to cause metastatic activity to form for premenopausal patients, but not for postmenopausal patients. And she was a premenopausal woman and she contacted her editor. She was also a premenopausal woman. So they decided that Amy Marcus should write a piece and publish it in the Wall Street Journal. So the day that paper came out in September of 2005, a, I think a 1200 word, uh, piece came out in the Wall Street Journal. And on that same day, Harvard issued a press release describing this whole situation. Well, this got a lot of attention, as you might imagine. One, I, I ignored the requests for interviews. I didn't want any part of that. We got a letter to the editor from Isaac Gukas. Isaac, Isaac uh, died of cancer a few years after this, but Isaac was a native of Nigeria, and he was practicing, he was a surgeon practicing uh, surgery in one of the 
hospitals decay. He said this could explain what happens in Nigeria. In Nigeria, women typically find a lump in their breast in their 40s, which is a lot younger than for uh, European Americans. And they know that if they go to a surgeon and the surgeon removes the tumor, then it provokes the cancer to come back and they will die in a few years. But if they did not remove the tumor, if they went to a, a, a herbalist and got some sort of a soothing ointment and used that to prevent the pain, they could live for a lot longer than if they had the tumor removed. And Isaac Uka said, this could explain what happens in Nigeria. Well, I ended up making three trips to Nigeria. I can confirm that what Isaac said was right. Isaac died, but I ended up spending, uh, being uh, carried around by uh, uh, Osaro Erhabor, another uh, native of Nigeria, who was a professor of lab science and uh, hematology in uh, Nigeria. Okay, so got really interested in Nigeria. There's something going on in Nigeria. And it turns out that a lot of, uh, of, those, of those communities, those countries that are different from the US, apparently uh, breast cancer in African women is breast cancer in American. Uh, black American uh, patients and in white American patients. Anyway, we got interested in that. Uh, let me go on to the next thing that we could identify. There's a racial disparity in outcome. In the US, there's about a 1.5 excess mortality for African Americans compared to European Americans, but that's only if they're younger than age 57. If they're over age 57, the African-Americans, if they're over age 57, they have an advantage compared to the European-Americans. So that means you can't explain the racial disparity as uh, unable to get proper quality of medical care. It's got to be biological. So my colleagues and I thought that was good news because it'd be much easier to solve a biological problem than a socioeconomic problem. Published, published a number of papers. I would recommend this Demi Kelly 2007 paper as one of the more important, one of the more important ones. Uh, and the fourth item here would be aggressiveness. I've often heard physicians talk about breast cancer in young women as aggressive. Well, I can see why it's aggressive, why it would seem aggressive to them. They remove a primary tumor, and within a year, you get a relapse, whereas it doesn't happen for European Americans. Well, what they call an aggressive cancer, I would say, would be clockwork relapse at 10 months after surgery. Okay, something happened at or at time of surgery to precipitate these early relapses over half of all breast cancer relapses. Surgery induces angiogenesis of dormant avascular micromets and starts growth of single dormant cancer cells. And this may be a general effect. Sure. Okay, skipping ahead to 2010, a paper was published by Patrice Forget. Uh, Patrice is, a, is an anesthesiologist. He was in Brussels. And this was at a teaching hospital and they have to expose the residents in anesthesiology to all the drugs used in anesthesiology. So what Forget and colleagues did was they did a retrospective study. They looked at the consecutive 200 or 125 or 200 patients that were treated by one surgeon given conventional uh, therapy after surgery. And they looked at the outcome of these patients grouped by what drug was given an anesthesia. And there was one NSAID that was available. There are three NSAIDs that are available by IV. Gatorlec was the only one they had at the hospital at that time. It turns out that Gatorlec 
was far superior to any of the other analgesics they used at surgery. Uh, there, and then Demichelli and I went to Brussels and we took a look at their data. We gave talks and they gave talks and Demichelli and updated their data. And uh, this is Demichelli that the Forger data was, were analyzed and they found out that there was a five-fold reduction in the relapses months nine to 18 for the Catorolac treated patients compared to the other patients, three versus 15 events. I guess there were uh, 325 patients uh, that were in this uh, group. At any rate, this was fascinating to us. Okay, at this point, we knew that some intervention at the time of surgery would be needed to cause those early relapses to stop, but what mechanism could explain the Forge data? And so we did some investigation. We looked for correlations among some very important large fields of science, of oncology, surgery, inflammation, Inflammation's going on because the IL-6 is elevated for about a week after surgery in serum. Angiogenesis uh, platelets and VEGF platelets actively sequester angioactive factors and they degranulate in the presence of inflammation. So you get an increase in VEGF of about 10% during that one week post-surgery. There are circulating tumor cells in cancer patients. The immune system is compromised after surgery, so that could be part of the problem. Uh, cancer dormancy, there, it's a well-known fact that cancer goes to the dormant states. And neutrophils, neutrophils are generated in large number as a response to the wounding. Neutrophils have the role of trying to repair wounds that have occurred uh, from some in infection, uh, from, from some damage. And also, if you get the bacteria, neutrophils are excellent for removing bacteria from the blood. Uh, perioperative can be considered a perfect storm of immunosuppression and inflammation in the presence of residual circulating tumor cells. And other, content, other statements were from Balkwell and Montevani. Inflammation is not the spark that causes the genetic damage, but it's the fuel that feeds the flame. Igawa et al. Nature Science Reports 2013 found out that capillary permeability increases dramatically from inflammation. Uh, particles 30 to 70 kilodaltons can go through the capillary permeability, capillary walls in the absence of inflammation, but it could go up to 2,000 kilodalton particles can pass it through the walls in the presence of inflammation. Okay, there are, we came up with five mechanisms that could explain what's going on. Uh, first of all, this chapter four in that Springer Nature book was written by Hiller, Shire, and Rydell. After reading that chapter, I would be surprised if surgery didn't cause cancer to be uh, spread from surgery. At any rate, neutrophils respond to inflammatory signals and they form these nets, neutrophil extracellular traps. They expel some DNA from the body of the neutrophil. And these are like butterfly nets and they traveling through the capillaries, they can capture uh, bacteria and, and uh, destroy them. And they can also capture circulating cancer cells. And neutrophils have the ability to extravasate. So they can take these cancer cells and take them into, into tissue uh, in that period of time. So that could be one mechanism how inflammation can cause uh, a metastasis to form. Uh, paper is this Najma, Cools, Latique, Artique. Uh, that would, it also talks about neutrophil cellular traps. Second mechanism, uh, I mentioned that Bob Weinberg uh, uh, wrote the forward to that Springer book. 
out of his laboratory. How much time do I have left, by the way? Am I okay? I'll continue on. Uh, Crail, et al. Crail was part of Weinberg's laboratory and they published a paper in Science Transitional Translational Medicine 2018 and MIT issued a press release. They developed an animal model where you can inject cancer cells into this mouse and these cancer cells would go into dormant states, but only if the immune system was intact. If the immune system was not intact, they did not go into dormant states. And they found out that it, with this model, they found out that surgery of any type could cause growth of these tumor cells at secondary locations. And they can do an experiment. They could see if an NSAID could prevent this. And sure enough, they could prevent this process from going on with an NSAID, a perioperative NSAID. So that's a, a reasonable mechanism. Third mechanism, this was chapter eight in that Springer Nature book. Marie Louise Bonalike parents, a, a Danish group. They were looking at zebrafish models. This is a zebrafish is a semi-transparent fish. They could color code neutrophils and they could watch them. So they are these neutrophils, after they wound the fish, neutrophils are directed to sites of wounding, but then they are diverted to pre-neoplastic cells that then start to divide. This could be another mechanism. Fourth mechanism, as I mentioned before, platelets actively sequester angioactive factors, and then they, they degranulate in the presence of inflammation. So VEGF is scattered into the blood, and you have platelets decrease by 10% in that post-surgery week, and VEGF increases by about 10%. So that could cause surgery-induced angiogenesis. Uh, fifth mechanism, this was published by a Harvard group. Uh, this is a high-level group. I happen to know three of these uh, 10 or so authors, 10, 15 authors. I know the first author, Deepak Penigrahi. I know uh, uh, Mark Kieran. And I know the leader, uh, Vikas Sukatmi. Vikas was a co-author of one of the papers I wrote, and he was very helpful, a very sharp guy. I, I would, I totally uh, support his recommendation. They said that preoperative stimulation of, and resolution of inflammation blockade eradicates micrometastases. The first sentence in that paper, cancer treatment is double-edged sword as surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation can induce dormancy escape and metastatic outgrowth by impairing uh, resolution of inflammation. So inflammation shows up in a lot of places. This is the fifth of the five mechanisms we came up with. Okay, after all that publicity, there was a lot of attention on the internet. And I happened to capture three uh, items here. Uh, Emotional, official, and scientific. The emotional one was from a cancer patient, a PhD level cancer patient. Yikes, can surgery spread cancer? I mean, I'm a cancer survivor and I would have been equally astounded. Uh, this was official, this was from NIH, cancer.gov. The chance that surgery will cause cancer to spread to other parties, parts of the body is extremely low. Well, I don't think that's accurate. And then uh, Crowell that Crowell paper was, was reviewed by Komaroff in the New England Journal in 2018. Clinical lore says that resection of a primary tumor can cause previously inapparent metastatic deposits to flare. Well, clinical lore, I'm not sure what that means either, but it sounds like the physicians knew that somehow or other they find that primary surgery can cause uh, an inapparent metastatic deposit to flare. Okay, there's a lot more I could say on this, but I'm gonna skip it. You can use your imagination. Conclusions of talking about an unsolved 2000 year old problem in oncology. 
We have the early lapses, which are the majority of relapses, are surges of angiogenesis and single cell activa activation. These events are triggered by primary surgery, causing systemic inflammation for about a week. Systemic inflammation causes dormant cancer cells to exit dormancy and avascular micrometastases to exit dormancy. They result in relapses by a number of mechanisms. I showed you five of them. There may be more. Second one is uh, these data suggest that transient systemic inflammation is the precipitating factor resulting in angiogenesis and single cell growth from dormancy. The 4J data, retrospective data suggests perioperative events at Ketorolac reduces early relapses fivefold. This still needs to be confirmed. We have not yet done a clinical trial. This may reduce cancer mortality, breast cancer mortality by 25, 50% at low cost and toxicity. Uh, low cost, it's a $2 drug, uh, toxicity. I had shoulder surgery uh, last year in March, and I had, I requested uh, uh, Toradol uh, as the uh, analgesic, and I can say it was very low in toxicity. I had almost no pain at all. Uh, breast cancer runs its course over a decade, but most of the events that lead to relapse seem to occur in that post-surgery week. And this suggests metastatic progression is amplified 100-fold during that post-primary week. And judging from that Fisher graph, it looks like 10% of the zero-node patients undergo surgery-induced relapse. And 85% of the N of the and greater than 12 patients have surgery induced relapse. This could explain what the value of mammography is. If you can prevent surgery induced uh, tumor growth, that can make a big difference. I mean, just a tumor from a zero node patient, you can cure 80% of the patients. Uh, there was another retrospective study published in the NCI Journal of National Cancer and Thermokalia et al. It was followed by, an, it was accompanied by an editorial by Ben Eliyahu at Golan. And the number eight, the, the, what we recommend is that the surgeon and anesthesiologist need to do whatever they can to control inflammation during and after surgery. Uh, during surgery, some physicians are, some surgeons are reluctant to use an NSAID before surgery because they're afraid of bleeding uh, after the uh, event. So they, in, in many, many hospitals, they use, they use, uh, they give the patient uh, Ketorolac right after surgery, the patient is sitting on the table, laying on the table, and they give her IV Ketorolac. Uh, one of my colleagues is director of uh, breast cancer surgery at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, one of the Harvard hospitals. And Ketorolac is given to all breast cancer patients just after surgery. And uh, we've seen a number of papers. Uh, there's a clinical trial underway in Japan for a perioperative NSAID for lung cancer. And we've seen a number of papers on retrospective studies for a variety of cancers. And this is one that's for uh, esophageal cancer. And I saw another paper that was published within the past week saying it's, it's quite now ex well accepted that neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio before surgery is a good prognostic indicator. NLR, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio, is a good measure of pre-surgical inflammation, systemic inflammation. And we're talking about a crisis as a parent. Okay, these are my colleagues. Uh, in that upper, upper left column, that dark picture, this was taken at a, at a restaurant in, in, in uh, New Jersey, Iron Boundary of New Jersey. 
uh, sitting down on the left, Rick, Ro Rick Rogers, Pat Wood. Uh, Pat Wood was married to Bill Ryshevsky. Uh, Pat Wood died of cancer within a couple of years ago. Bill Ryshevsky was my medical oncologist. I'm standing behind Pat. And then to the to our right side of Bill Ryshevsky is Romano Demichelli. Above Romano is Pinucci Valagusa and Gianna Bonadonna. To the right of Bonadonna is Patrice Forget, who is now in Scotland. And below Patrice is Vikas Sakatni, who is Dean of Medicine at Emory University in, in US. And to his and to our right from uh, Vikas is my good friend, uh, Osaro Erhabor, uh, picture in the center. I am on the left. And then Romano Demichelli, Jay Ant Vieta, who Jay Ant is a surgeon at University College London. And that's the late Isaac Gukas. And the lower left is Ted James. He is the Director, he is the leader of uh, breast cancer research, breast cancer surgery at Beth Israel. He's one of our co-authors. <clears throat> and the lower in the center and the lower picture there with three people. That's Michael Baum, Isaac Gukas, and myself. I was dressed more casually because I was bike riding through London at the time. Isaac Gukas and Michael Baum. At this this meeting in the Royal Medical Society. Isaac was talking about a time in Nigeria when he was practicing uh, oncology there, and there was a televised debate between he and an herbalist on what's the best way of treating cancer. Could you imagine that? And Michael Baum is a retired surgeon from UK, a very, very well-known uh, surgeon. And to the lower right is Judah Folkman. I was on Folkman staff at the time. I think that's everyone. Oh, sorry. This is a uh, chapter six was written by my friends from Nigeria. And these are some of my friends. I'm somewhere in, in that second, that first row standing to the immediate right of that tall gentleman with the uh, gray jacket on. And uh, we published several papers in 2020. Breast cancer in the black swan. Everything I've said, just about everything I've said is covered in that paper. It's available on PubMed and published another paper in December of 2020. Uh, I'll tell you more about that in a second. Uh, it may be possible to prevent the late relapses in addition to the early relapses. And this is the result of a paper published by Delecus de Michele et al. They did, they looked at the reconstru uh, reconstruction, delayed breast reconstruction after mastectomy. One country in the country it was, but they looked at patients who had delayed reconstruction, delayed for a variable length of time, out to three years in some cases. And they looked at the relapses after reconstruction for those patients. Okay, th these two links at the bottom, one described uh, my, my experience with, uh, I was uh, treated for stage three colon cancer 25 years ago, and I was the first one to use metronomic chemotherapy. That's described in that ProPublica report. And then that IIT, edu, that's my alma mater. And that describes how I made a transition from uh, physics research to oncology research. This is, that, this is from that paper from Delecus Demichelli. These are relapses after surgery with, with time zero set to the time of original breast cancer surgery. They looked at the relapses and there was a bimodal relapse pattern. First three years, there were relapses. And then after that, there was a second hump of relapses. <clears throat> but when they set time zero equal to the time of reconstruction, independent of when the surgery, the primary surgery was done, you also saw a bimodal relapse pattern. Okay, there are two things that this tells you. 
First of all, it's not cancer surgery that causes these effects. It's any surgery. If you have a, a patient who is cancer free, but maybe is uh, survived. and they are totally removed of surgery. There's no, there's no cancer left in their body, except maybe circulating cancer cells going through their capillaries. And if these patients have reconstruction, they can have a relapse. It also says that someone who, have, uh, who has a, a health-related surgery, someone might have a like I had a shoulder surgery, that could be something that could have caused inflammation. And if I had, I mean, I'm a 25 year survivor of colon cancer. So that's well past the time when I was at risk of relapse. But if it was five years after the time, I could have been a candidate for having a relapse from that shoulder surgery. At any rate, people who have planned surgery for cosmetic or for health reasons, should have Ketorolac before surgery to prevent relapse. Thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Well, that was an exhaustive presentation. Uh, yeah, any question from the floor? Any participant? Anyone asking, anyone interested to know about anything about inflammation related to tumors? Okay, I don't see any questions. Thank you, Dr. Michael. You're welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure. So we move on to our uh, last speaker, uh, Mr. Ram Duvedi. Uh, He's uh, going to now tell us more about digital pathology. So the floor is yours, the stage is yours, sir. Please, yeah, uh, full screen, sir. Can you see yes. my screen now? Yes, yes, you are very much visible and audible both. You can start. So thank you, thank you for this opportunity and uh... I know this is the last presentation of the day and a lot of us would have been really tired of uh, hearing a number of ideas. And so I just try to keep it slightly lighter. And uh, before I move, uh, just a little disclaimer that uh, most of the presentation that you have heard today are from the experts of the field who might be researchers or doctors, or I'm from the industry. And I represent, uh, I come from, But today I'm not representing my company. This is uh, in my personal capacity. And the purpose of this presentation is that uh, as a product manager, we have a digital pathology platform, which is available in the on-premise as well as on the cloud. And as a product manager, I hear a lot of concerns about the cloud or what can be a better way of selecting and how do I determine whether I should go for the cloud or the on-prem. So I thought this will be a nice uh, summary of my experiences interacting with the customers and also some thoughts on how they can choose their uh, digital platform uh, because every organization is different. So here are my views uh, in my own capacity on how to evaluate the right digital pl pathology platform when you are determining between the cloud and the on-prem. So before I go further, I, I, I just wanted to start on a lighter note and I thought I was being funny when I, that what is the biggest proponent of digital pathology in 2021? Uh, I showed it to my son and he said, come on, this is dad's joke. So I know this may be a bad joke now, but still, I mean, nevertheless. Uh, but this is the truth. We have seen a big traction in digital pathology adoption and a lot of hospitals and pathologies realized that how digital pathology can be solved for them when they couldn't go to pathologies, they were locked in the homes and they could still diagnose slides sitting from their homes. So we have seen a lot of interest in digital pathology and, uh, but let's come back to, to digital pathology platform topic and quickly jump to, to the next screen. 
So when I say how to determine digital pathology solution for you, basically it boils down to what we call the total cost of ownership. And total cost of ownership should be calculated over a period of time, not while buying the solution. So the way we have divided it is into five parts. This will be easier to discuss if we talk on these five individual components. First one is what is the cost of hardware, infrastructure and communication related expenses when we are choosing between the two solutions. Second one is the software. Third one, now you have a hardware and a software and you want to implement the solution. Hospitals have all the expertise for the implementation. So there's definitely a cost to be involved. Then from uh, maybe medium to long-term uh, perspective, there is maintenance. Summation of all these. But let's talk about how these costs differ when we talk about on cloud and the on-premise solution. So first one is the hardware. When you have a cloud solution, most of the cloud solution are sold as software as a service. What it means is that your provider is taking care of everything. You really don't have to worry about anything. You just have a device, means a computer, and you have a network. Maybe for security purposes, you might have VPN, especially when you are connecting to LISs or LIMPs. So that's an ad additional piece, but otherwise, except for the networking, which is mostly already available in the hospitals and the device that probably you already have a computer, there is no other cost to cloud solution as far as the hardware is concerned. While you, when you look at the on-premise solution, the first two sections here in the on-premise are exactly the same, what I talked about on the cloud. But let's say you are choosing a physical server. Now you have to buy the hardware. If you are going for the virtual machines, we assume that you already have part of a server or you, you get your infrastructure from what they call IAS, in infrastructure as a service. You borrow that, uh, you rent that from a third party. So either way, I mean, it's a physical or virtual. There is a cost associated for a server on which your application is hosted. Same is true for algorithms. When I'm saying algorithm, I'm talking about uh, algorithms for the automatic analysis of your scanned images. And there has to be a server for algorithms and same thing. Again, it can be a virtual machine, it can be a, a physical server, and both of them have their own cost. IMS, which is image management software, this is, this, this, this is your repository. This is your uh, database. When you scan images, IMS hosts all these images and the digital pathology platform pulls that data and then does the analysis. So think of a hospital or a pathology that has a multi-site uh, business. So every site has to have an IMS and there can be costs associated with that. So that is an additional cost. Now, along with that, you may have an external storage or an archival system. And storage can be either you, are, you, you are have your own storage for the long-term archival or you have what they call the secondary storage for the data backup. But all this, I mean, if you see, both have hardware components, but the hardware component for on-prem is much bigger than what it, it is in the cloud. Talk about the software. On the cloud, as I said, most of the services are offered as a software as a service. So you have just a subscription, you pay for the subscription. If you need algorithms, you pay for the algorithm subscription. And you, if you have LIS, maybe you have to pay for the middleware cost to connect your solution to the, to the LIS. And that's it. While when you are in the on-premise, along with all these, you may have a software to manage your archival, how you pull in, uh, store the data, pull in from there, how you configure that. So, so some kind of software for that. There is a cost associated with the database, with the operating system. If you have antivirus and things like that, that's additional cost. These lists are not exhaustive, but just to give an idea that how the costs differ. Again, just like hardware, on-premise means a lot more cost and a lot more things to take care of in comparison to the cloud solution. 
The third one is implementation. Now, when you are on the cloud, one is definitely when you are implementing the solution because you don't have to implement anything. It's already on the cloud. You just need a connectivity and you can start. Maybe an extra effort is required for the LIS integration. Or when you are implementing the solution for the first time in year one, there can be a data migration cost. Coming to the on-prem, these two are valid for the on-prem solution too. But then along with that, now you are implementing, so there can be development cost. You have to configure or customize certain parts as per your requirement. Integration costs that go with that. If you do not have the resources and you have to hire from outside, there is a consulting fees, I would say, for the man manpower. Archival solutions, all these costs add up. So this is a third component of that total cost of ownership where we see that there are a lot more components for the on-prem when compared to the cloud. Going to the next one, management and maintenance. As I said, you should calculate your cost over a period of time, maybe three years or five years is the right time period that I recommend. Now, in that time, I'm just uh, seeking your attention for the cloud section. You may have to upgrade your hardware. When I'm saying hardware here, it just means maybe your computer or a software, which is like any way you, you upgrade your computer from your organization. So I really don't think that this is a big cost. And there is a cost associated with the downtime. I, I think I will discuss this downtime when I talk about the on-premise. Now coming to the on-prem, these are the same cost, but now you are managing it. You have to, there has to be a cost for this hardware and software administration. So you need to have an IT resource to do that. And for the time when, because you are doing it by yourself, if your system is down, we should also include the downtime cost because we are maintaining by ourselves. When it is a cloud solution, it is, it, it is a, the prerogative of the provider to provide you uninterrupted services. So management and maintenance uh, I think again, with cloud, you have a lot less hassles than you have on the on-prem. And last, but uh, not the least, the support. I think when you have the biggest component here comes in the training. And for the training, you may have a staff, you may have to call out people if you do not have them in house and then expenses like travel. But this is, this is I think a smaller component compared to the first four that we discussed. Now, taking all these components together, this is what we recommend our customers to think about and calculate their cost, something like this, over a period of three or five years, as I said. Please don't pay too much focus to, to the factors I have written on or, or the dollar figures that I have put there. This is just for illustration. What it means is because maybe in the first year, a solution is cheaper because you have already an old, old server. But in year three, you have to replace that. So only cost will go up. So what I recommend is that how this cost is structured for on-prem and cloud plays out for your organization, let's say over a period of five years. So we can do something like this. I mean, include all the factors that are applicable on these five pillars, do your estimation on the cost every year that, okay, in year three, I'm going to upgrade my software. Maybe my Oracle database is due for uh, upgrade in year four and things like that. That will give you an idea that how your cost is going to play out in five years time. And if you plot that figure, again, this is for illustration, these figures are not uh, real figures, that you will see that maybe in this case, on-premise was cheaper when we started because maybe they already had a server that uh, they could use. So their physical server cost was not that much and subscription cost for cloud was higher in year one. But maybe three years down the line, you have to do the upgrade for the entire infrastructure, and that is how the costs catch up. So we should do that over a period of, again, as I said, three or five years and see how a particular case is for in your case. There is no right or wrong solution here. And I can tell you that being in the industry, uh, because the cloud solutions are relatively newer, so there is a lack of knowledge. And as a product manager, I really feel my duty to educate so that people can have an informed decision on how to make uh, a decision on choosing the right platform. And especially for the cloud, because uh, success of a cloud solution depends on the adoption. And unless people have questions around these solutions and they do not understand all the components, 
they are paranoid. They are skeptical about adopting the cloud solution. So this, this was regarding uh, probably from the quantitative perspective. There are a few other things that I would like to talk. Maybe let's jump to the qualitative stuff. And that also kind of summarizes uh, what we are talking about. So first thing is think about the initial capital expenditure. These are the bigger. So when you are on the cloud, as we talked, there is a very low initial expenditure on infra equipment and IT. And this component is pretty high on for the on-prem. Second thing from the operational perspective, operations is you already have a solution, now you have to maintain it. So you think about licensing, storage, archival, how do you maintain? Let's say there is a patch released by your provider, you have to apply that patches. There is a patch for other softwares, you have to, you have to upgrade those softwares. You do not have in-house resources, so you have to go write the contracts and hire the IT resources to do it for you. There is a training component. A lot of these things actually are a lot lighter when you are in the cloud. Deployment, scalability, and support. I mean, no points for guessing here that cloud is a lot faster as far as the deployment is concerned because, uh, and the best part that I see with the cloud is that the scalability. If you expect that your staff or your requirement or your pathologist number is going to increase in future, you need a scalable solution. A hardware, let's say a, a physical server that serves 10 pathologists today, but three years down the line, you are expecting 50 pathologists. Now you just cannot support that with the given hardware. You have to redo the whole thing. Most of the cases you have to buy those either new hardware that can support 50 pathologists or you hire some additional pieces and then concatenate them for the higher scalability. While with the cloud, resources are their flexible resources. When I say flexible, I'm using a common term that uh, storage, computing, all these resources can be added as per the requirement automatically. So scalability is a lot easier with the cloud. Data security and privacy. I think this is a very important part and this is probably, I'll probably spend slightly more time on that because People are skeptical about the data. Hey, my data is on the cloud. Do I really have to worry? US has laws like HIPAA. So PHI data security is a big thing. Europe has GDPR. And everybody's like so concerned about the data privacy. Now, prima facie looks like that your data, once it's out of your premises, probably may not be as safe as you think, but uh, I have another take on that one. Just think of it. I have heard so many hospital systems being hacked and then hackers asked for Bitcoin or whatever to get the system back on track. Have you ever heard of an AWS site uh, or a data getting hacked or, or Microsoft Azure or Google Cloud? I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but my point is the, the, these are built on the professional platforms where the security measures are a lot better than most of the hospitals or pathologies can provide for their on-premises infrastructure. So just think about it. And we as a solution manufacturer, digital pathology solution manufacturer, we can assure you that data privacy and security is such a big concern for us that we hire experts from outside. We do audit of our architecture, think about data in, in, in motion, data, in rest and everything. It's like end-to-end -end, uh, assessment of data privacy and security. So there are chances of any breach from our site, our means on the software cloud site, uh, on, the, on the cloud itself. This is a lot more secure system than what most people believe in. I mean, I'm just trying to try, maybe advocating this thing too much. I'm not trying to sell. I'm just telling you that uh, there should not be an unfounded concern about data privacy just because you have a cloud solution. A lot of these are our organizations in high tech and all. Think of Apple. Apple is an epitome of privacy. They developed three solutions just to select one and discard two in the end. And in their product design is being on the product lifecycle management system, PLM. That is where the bomb sits. And the bomb they have is agile bomb, which is on the cloud. 
Now, if they can put their iPhone or uh, uh, iPad bomb on the cloud, just think of it. I mean, how much of a concern can that be? So I can go on and on, but just my point is that data security and privacy is a big concern, I know, but this should not be a gating factor in deciding that if I go for a cloud solution, maybe my data is getting compromised. Data access and analysis. Most of the cloud solutions come with some kind of analysis, analytics capability. They can provide you some kind of uh, uh, reporting capability. And if you really go a bit farther and some solutions can even provide you a dashboard capability because these business intelligence and analytics system are a part of the engine on the cloud. While for on the on-prem, if you really have to tab, keep a tab on, uh, on the cost involved or the resources, the way they have been used and those kind of metrics that you follow through as an administrator or maybe as a CEO or whatever, uh, this is much easier to understand. Your, uh, on, for the on-prem, you have to do it by your own. Cloud can provide you some basic uh, analytics capability and reporting capability. And even if you want to build something of your own that is much cheaper and faster. And last but not the least, user access. I mean, this is like you no know, brownies for that, that you can access cloud system from anywhere. Not that you cannot do it for the on-prem, but on-prem uh, access, uh, logging into your own servers remotely with the VPN and all, it can be cumbersome. Cloud, if you're on internet and you have a computer, you have a secured connection password and you can, you can just go for it. So these are the things that, th these are the things I hear even from the ground, talking to customers, talking to our affiliates and talking to the market. And I feel that uh, this is a good opportunity to, to educate uh, people who are from this industry and they are interested in knowing about the solution. Uh, in a nutshell, this picture summarizes my whole discussion. If you look at the first iceberg, the component that is above the water is much larger and the component that is below there looks smaller. What it means is that for a cloud solution, upfront the subscription fees can be higher. It may look higher because they are taking care of everything that you have to worry about. And you have to only spend your efforts on a small component. But if you see on the right-hand side, your upfront cost of the software license looks a lot lower, but there are a lot more things to take care of when you are considering an on-prem solution. And of course, then bug stops you if something goes wrong uh, and you have to take care of that. So just uh, to, but again, as I said, there is no right or wrong. You have to see that how it works for a particular case. Now, this is my last slide. And these are a few things, don't take them like a, uh, ultimate statement, but these are some of the observations I have had talking to the field. These are like general guidelines. One, the first one is if the data is too large or the throughput is large, often the on-prem may be a better solution. What it means is, think of it like if you are, if one pathologist is doing 40, 50, 60 cases a day, and one case has uh, three, four, five slides, each slide is like two, three, four GB data, you are talking about hundreds of GB of data every day just by one pathologist. And if you have to store these data, and especially for the long term, then cloud can be an expensive solution. Now, not that cloud does not have an archival system. Uh, like we are on the AWS. So for us, the storage is on S3 and archival is on uh, Glacier. But the problem with uh, most of these cheaper our solution on the cloud is the retrieval time. I mean, some of the, those cheaper solutions can take hours before you can retrieve your data. So think of a patient who has come to your hospital after two years and you want to pull out some files from what happened two years back and you have not requested the retrieval in advance. There is no way you can get these files and review them. So you have to do it in advance. So if, as I said, the data is too large, or throughput is large, often maybe on-prem can be a more economic solution. Second one, data has to be archived for a very long time. I think it's again, extension of the first point. Uh, and some countries have some regulatory restrictions too. For example, I know that Japan may have uh, 
some regulatory requirements to store your data up to 10 years. Now for that kind of data uh, archival, again, maybe with a large volume, probably on-prem may be a better factor to consider. Third one is a data residency requirement. Now, this is again coming from the regulatory uh, and we are talking about the cloud solution here. A lot of countries have this restriction that if you hold any data on our citizens, the data has to be on our own soil. So for example, uh, if you have your server, your instance, cloud instance in Germany, for example, you can serve a number of EU countries, but there are some countries that may still restrict you. For example, you cannot have a China data or a South Korea data or a Japan data on a Germany server. So in those cases, you have to really be uh, sure, especially if your operations are spread or uh, even if you are a provider, you have to think about if I have two, three, four instances to serve a particular market size, there will be countries that will not be able to serve just because of the data residency requirements. And data residency is just, just not restricted to the countries. It may vary even from state to state. Canada is a good example. Every state in Canada has a different law. There are some states that allow you to have data on, on let's say from Europe and other states do not. So just be uh, check with your uh, compliance and regulatory that uh, before you select your solution. And if there is a doubt, I think again, go for the on-prem. Next one is large number of sites. As I said, if you have large number of sites, probably the accessing them through a cloud solution may be a better solution, assuming other factors to be constant because you have to have your IMSs on every, every site and you have to do that connectivity with the central application. So if you have a large number of sites or a dispersed uh, user base uh, across the sites and, and then uh, cloud can actually be a good solution. And last but not the least, third party algorithms. We hear from a lot of uh, users that uh, they have their preferred algorithms to do the image analysis. And uh, most of these, uh, third party algorithm providers have their cloud platform that is connected to the digital pathology platform uh, that you can use. And I have seen that uh, cloud provides a better integration facility for that. And then you don't have to really worry about it, right? Your provider is doing that. So if you check with your provider and they provide you integration with third party algorithms, having a cloud solution probably will provide you access to a lot more algorithms than probably the proprietary algorithms that the provider has to offer you. So that was another thing that uh, you have to consider if you are interested in the third party algorithms for your solution. So that's all I had for today. Uh, I just try, just to summarize, I tried to just tell you how you should assess your solution from cloud and on-prem perspective. Probably the message is that there is no single solution and you have to do it over a period of time, just do it for your own case and consider all the factors that are involved in the analysis and there's some general guidelines that may have come handy when you start your assessment. So having said that, uh, I would welcome any questions you might have. Uh, thanks, Mr. Ram, for that uh, education on uh, digital pathology and the use of cloud. Uh, anyone having any questions to Mr. Ram? Well, I don't see any questions. Uh, so we thank you, Dr. Ram, for your presentation. Uh, now we come to the end of the 10th Emirates Pathology and Digital Pathology Conference, the UCG group of conferences. Uh, that was, it was a privilege and a pleasure to be a part of such a platform. The, as we all know that certification, the certificates will be provided on January 14th and uh, UCG is uh, organizing more conferences coming up at the 10th World Breast Pathology and Breast Cancer Conference on March 30 and 31st of this 2022 online. 
And another one following is the 11th Emirates Pathology and Digital Pathology Conference on May 9th and 10th, 2022 online. So I hope we'll meet again uh, with new research and innovation in the field of pathology. It's been an honor to be among such accomplished and individuals and to be able to present my perspective before you all. Thank you and good evening, good day.